preface of the ascent of mount st elias alaska this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil schempf the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi translated by linda white mazzini villari in the acute and subtle criticism of modern alpinism with which mr mummery concludes the narrative of his own expeditions he says that the true alpinist is the man who attempts new ascents this opinion is undoubtedly shared by those climbers who turn eagerly to the few alpine peaks forgotten or neglected by earlier explorers and are conquering them in such rapid succession that soon no virgin summit will be left in that range but in fact the conquest of the alps was virtually accomplished many years ago the giant peaks were already won and ambitious climbers including several of those who had taken part in the great battle then left home to seek new perils and fresh victories farther afield thus began a series of alpine expeditions to remote and inhospitable regions little known or totally unexplored regions where technical experience of mountain work had to be supplemented by a wide and varied knowledge and power of resource in order to successfully cope with the obstacles and dangers of exploration accordingly the great mountain explorations of recent times have been evolved from traditional mountaineering and more directly from the conquest of the alps to this day the alps remain the best teachers of the art theirs is the only school where it may be learnt and practised the experience gained there has made it possible to establish in every detail a technique of climbing and the comprehensive knowledge thus acquired of difficulties and dangers and of the best means of overcoming them has emboldened the alpinist to attempt the conquest of the mightiest ranges of the world his royal highness the duke of the abruzzi has joined the ranks of this small band of explorers by making the expedition described in the present work the region dominated by mount st elias offers such marked characteristics and unusual conditions of life and activity that a thorough knowledge of these is required in order to grasp the real nature of the expedition if the winning of st elias only meant the ascent of the terminal cone made in one day from the russell coal it might be compared with many of the easier climbs in our own alps the reply given by one of our guides on his return exactly defines it just like the brighthorn only much higher nor strictly considered would the altitude of the mountain eighteen thousand feet render its ascent an exceptional undertaking seeing that summits ranging to over twenty three thousand feet above the sea have already been conquered but when we take into account the entire route traversed by the expedition from the landing place on the west coast of yakutat bay to the top of the peak the true nature of the enterprise becomes apparent the exceptional difficulty consists precisely in having to cross a zone of ice and snow of far greater extent than any to be found in other mountain groups the alaska coast ranges are in the identical condition that prevailed in the alps during the ice age their glaciers descend to the sea while their snow line is as low as twenty five hundred feet above the sea level hence the ascent of st elias differs fundamentally from any of the great climbs on record mr j c russell who was the chief explorer of the region traversed by his royal highness's caravan has published some interesting remarks on the nature of the work he maintains that an approximate idea may be formed of the obstacles to be overcome in various ascents by comparing the height and distance of the summit beyond the farthest point where fuel can be found now since the limit of vegetation descends as we approach the poles the proportionate difficulty of a given ascent might be calculated according to the latitude of the mountain with due regard of course to its height considering some of the highest peaks of the american continent from this point of view mr russell observes that on chimborazo in the equatorial andes the last fire is lighted above fourteen thousand feet above the sea and only fifty nine hundred feet have to be climbed to reach the summit nineteen thousand five hundred feet the great volcanoes of mexico rise to an altitude of about seventeen thousand feet above the sea while the limit of forest vegetation is over thirteen thousand feet on mount whitney fourteen thousand feet the highest peak of the sierra nevada trees are found up to the level of nearly eleven thousand feet 
the snow zone in all these instances is about five thousand feet in height and can be climbed either in one day or two or three at the most therefore there is no need to carry up fuel cooking stoves or specially prepared provisions the requisite supply of blankets and warm clothes is greatly reduced and the expedition can easily replenish its stores in alaska the conditions are entirely different the snow line instead of rising as in the tropics to eighteen thousand feet drops near mount logan and st elias to less than three thousand feet above the sea level nearly fourteen thousand feet must be climbed above the snow line to reach the summit and it must be also remembered that those peaks are at a distance of fifty to sixty miles from the forest thus the narrative of an expedition to mount st elias has to chronicle whole weeks spent on vast glaciers traversing more than one hundred miles of ice and snow conveying either on sledges or men's backs such heavy and complicated baggage as tents blankets fuel provisions oil and spirit stoves clothing and instruments all this too in a region where bad weather is almost perpetual on the lower glaciers the chilly rain seldom ceases while higher up the heavy snowfall is so frequently renewed that it has no time to harden and makes walking difficult and extremely laborious owing to these exceptional conditions i have considered it necessary to give full details of our preparations and equipment and have devoted a special appendix to it i have also dealt minutely and perhaps tediously with the particulars of our daily life on the ice this part of our journey was a monotonous march without stirring or interesting episodes through dense fogs and interminable snowstorms we had hours too of intense enjoyment on the rare days of fine weather when this strange region was revealed to our sight in all its vast grandeur the whole was so utterly unlike the familiar scenery of our alps that i fear i shall have failed to give the reader even an approximate conception of what we beheld fortunately signor sella's illustrations will indicate far better than my inadequate words the rich and diversified outlines of the scene though even they cannot attempt to render the marvellous effects of light and colour his royal highness's expedition was exclusively alpinistic its sole object was to reach the summit of mount st elias and all else was naturally subordinated to that aim we were compelled to give up everything that might have hindered our march while to avoid increasing the already considerable weight of indispensable stores all superfluities were left behind the mountaineering season in alaska lasts little more than two months in september snowstorms continue almost without cease and climbing becomes impossible our expedition took fifty-seven days from the coast to the summit and back again without wasting one day or even one hour hence no topographical survey nor other scientific investigation could be made only an uninterrupted series of meteorological observations was taken these are given in one of the appendices while others contain details of the few zoological specimens collected on the snow surface of the malaspina glacier and of the minerals of the region his royal highness's expedition has proved the truth of a prediction made in eighteen eighty seven by an englishman lieutenant h w seton carr royal navy this officer was one of the earliest explorers of the mount st elias region and in giving a report of his travels to the royal geographical society he stated that if the mountain was to be ascended at all it would only be accomplished by experienced alpinists in the course of the ensuing discussion mr freshfield insisted that the art of climbing above the level of perpetual snow was as well established as that of navigation and that no one inexperienced in it could any more successfully attack snow mountains than a landsman could navigate the sea in fact there is a technique of mountaineering that has to be specially acquired no one who has seen guides at work on high mountains can doubt the truth of this dictum but it is often denied by those who are ignorant of the subject in many quarters it was a matter of great surprise that his royal highness should take the trouble to export italian guides to so distant a country and it was asked of what possible use they could be among mountains unknown to them mr russell himself who is not an alpinist although he has spent several months among the glaciers of mount st elias once stated that alpine guides would be totally useless there and his fellow explorer mr m b kerr has repeated the assertion in reality 
the same technique needed upon the glaciers of the alps is equally adequate for other mountains all being subject to the same physical laws and sharing the same essential characteristics even upon alpine glaciers there are no permanent tracks in many instances a fresh route has to be found every year and may be changed perhaps several times in a single season owing to varied conditions the best evidence in favor of guides is the remarkable exploring work that has been already accomplished with their help scarcely a single important mountain expedition in any part of the world has been performed without their skilled assistance they were with messrs d freshfield cawford grove m de decky clinton dent w f donkin a f mummery j c cocken v and e sella and many other alpinists in the caucasus they were in the equatorial andes with e whimper in the himalayas with w w graham m w conway and others with e a fitzgerald in new zealand and the chilean andes and with m w conway in spitzbergen and bolivia the idea occurred to his royal highness of marking his appreciation of the guide's services on this alaskan expedition by founding a permanent institution for their benefit the whole profit on the sale of the italian edition of this work together with all royalties and rights on foreign editions will be dedicated to an insurance fund for italian guides their lives are exposed to continual hardship and risk requiring great self-denial and the clearest sense of personal responsibility while their families are in constant danger of losing their breadwinners by unforeseen accidents they may now count in all such contingencies upon receiving prompt and effective help thus thanks to his royal highness's fund the terrible consequences of alpine disaster will be in some measure alleviated i am charged with the grateful task of offering the thanks of his royal highness and his expedition to all who promoted the success of the enterprise by their kind help and advice and i trust i may be forgiven should i have inadvertently omitted any of their names from the following pages a special debt of gratitude is due to professor j c russell for the permission to reproduce in this book his own sketch map of the mount st elias region i would also record our warm thanks to professor c amory and his colleagues dr g keichbaumer and professor p parvesi and to signor v novarese who kindly examined our specimens and drew up the reports appended to the present volume when his royal highness the duke of the abruzzi did me the honor of asking me to record the expedition i was encouraged to undertake the task by the certainty of being able to depend on the assistance of his royal highness and of my fellow travellers the narrative may be said to comprise the experiences of the whole party my task has consisted in arranging and collating the diaries kept by his royal highness and my colleagues together with my own journal these consist of notes and impressions scribbled at odd moments during the expedition and it has been my aim to preserve as far as possible all the freshness and stamp of actuality infused into them by the circumstances under which they were written during the course of the work his royal highness and my companions have continually given me valuable advice and help without which my own mountaineering experience being less advanced i should have lacked many of the elements required for the right understanding and interpretation of much of what we have seen and done filippo de filippi march eighteen ninety nine end of preface chapter one of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf from turin to seattle it was the seventeenth of may and past two o'clock p m about a hundred persons were gathered on the platform of the porta nuova station alongside the french express relatives friends and colleagues all waiting to see us off and wish success to our long and difficult enterprise then his royal highness the duke of the abruzzi arrived escorted by his royal highness the count of turin a few more affectionate farewells and we were off the duke's party consisted of lieutenant cavalieri umberto cagni of the royal navy officer in waiting to his royal highness cavalieri francesco gonella president of the turin section of the italian alpine club cavalieri vittorio sella and myself it was a sultry afternoon of almost midsummer heat we talked little gazed dreamily at the panorama of green fields and the chain of the alps surrounded by dark storm clouds 
and silently reviewed the last days of feverish bustle and the active labor of preparation that had filled so many months how the time had flown the delight and surprise with which we had received the prince's first announcement of his plans and the honor of being privileged to join the expedition still tingled through us only six months before his royal highness was cruising round the world on the cristoforo colombo but the long sea voyage had not made him forget the vast horizons he had seen the war of the elements waged in the mountain world the only other portion of nature's realm that can rival the ocean in grandeur and force in wild fury and peaceful calm it was at darjeeling in bengal the thirtieth of january eighteen ninety five while gazing at the majestic peak of kinchinjuga twenty eight thousand feet above the sea that an early ambition of the prince took a definite shape his voyage once accomplished he determined to revisit india and attempt the ascent of some giant of the himalaya range seven months later mr a f mummery one of the most intrepid of contemporary alpinists who had ascended the matterhorn with his royal highness by the smut ridge in eighteen ninety four lost his life while attempting to scale the peak of nanga parbat twenty six thousand feet above the sea on the borders of kashmir and chitral affectionate regret for his unfortunate friend and a hope of subduing the fatal peak moved his royal highness to choose the same mountain for attack the cristoforo colombo anchored off venice in the end of december eighteen ninety six after a cruise of two years and two months and his royal highness immediately began to organize the expedition he had planned for the following summer meanwhile however the plague had broken out on the west coast of india followed by severe famine in the punjab the very region his royal highness's caravan must cross on the way to kashmir it was no longer a mere question of bad roads and mountaineering difficulties we were faced by an obstacle no peaceful expedition could hope to surmount i e that of wild border tribes maddened by hunger we anxiously followed the course of events and it was soon clear that the prince's indian campaign must be deferred but his royal highness was determined to undertake some serious expedition in the course of the summer and owing to the uncertainty of conditions in india decided to make a complete change in his plans and attempt mount st elias in south alaska near the confines of the arctic regions and bordering on the coast of the pacific ocean situated at the northern end of an imposing range the peak of st elias eighteen thousand feet high and visible from the sea at two hundred miles distance had attracted the notice of the first discoverers of the alaska coast a century and a half ago but the mountain itself and its precincts remained unexplored until very recent times the first attempt to reach its summit was only made in eighteen eighty six and was followed by three other expeditions during the next five years all were equally abortive but all reaped a rich harvest of information regarding the peculiar characteristics of a region where glacial phenomena are developed on a grander scale than in any other part of the world excepting the polar zone the last attempt to conquer the peak had been made in eighteen ninety one his royal highness's new plan was settled early in february eighteen ninety seven and the long and complicated preparations were immediately begun it was necessary to make an accurate study of the equipment required for a campaign during which we should be completely isolated for two months at least and being far from any possible base of supplies unable to repair any blunder or omission which even if apparently slight might be enough to doom us to failure we knew that we should have to camp out on the ice for several weeks in an extremely damp climate where rain and snow often fall without ceasing for many days in succession and where nothing combustible could possibly be found the whole of our camp material our stores of clothing and food had to be selected with a view to the conditions in which we should have to live mr israel c russell of michigan who had twice carefully explored the st elias region professor fay of boston dr paolo de vici and professor davidson of san francisco all gave us valuable assistance by supplying much practical information and many biographical details by the end of april everything was arranged his royal highness had chosen four italian guides from the val d'Aosta, giuseppe pedigax and lorenzo crew of courmayar antonio maquignaz and andrea palissier of val tournancia and in addition to these erminio bota of biela who had been sella's porter and photographic assistants in the caucasus 
A few days before our start we heard from America that Mr. Henry S. Bryant of Philadelphia was preparing an expedition for the same purpose as our own. We left Turin with about sixty cases containing all the stores and equipment procured in Italy, our personal luggage, photographic appliances, and part of the camp and sanitary material. Four days in London sufficed to get together all the other things ordered in advance, such as tents, ropes, waterproofs, etc. Our stock of food was to be laid in at San Francisco. We started for Liverpool at midday on the 22nd May. By 4 o'clock p.m. we were all on board the big Cunard liner Lucania, and half an hour later steamed away from the crowded pier and speedily lost sight of the line of white handkerchiefs waving us farewell. Behind the pier stretched the gray mass of the city, bristling with chimneys and smokestacks under the thin veil of mist. The voyage lasted six days, and with the usual monotony of a rapid crossing. There were few passengers, for spring is the moment for the American exodus to Europe, and the steamers perform their westward course half empty until the autumn brings crowds homeward bound. Our guides showed an indifference to their surroundings, only to be compared with that of Arabs. Hurried away from their quiet valleys into the tumult of London, and thence on board, none of the strange new sights they saw roused them from their apathy. Of course, they were sick during the first hours at sea, but speedily recovering, spent whole days in the second-class smoking room playing endless games of cards. On the 28th of May, at 10.30 p.m., the Lucania anchored at the quarantine station outside the port of New York. Early next morning we steamed into harbor and were instantly attacked by the first American reporters, who swarmed on board with the health and customs officers. Meanwhile, the Lucania glided slowly up the great channel, through a crowd of steamers, tugs, barges, and sailing vessels, past the pleasant homes of Jersey, all bowered in greenery, past the gigantic elevators of New York Harbor, and after skirting the base of the colossal Statue of Liberty, touched the Cunard Pier at eight o'clock. It was no light task to find, disentangle, and remove our sixty-six cases, struggling the while with a horde of porters, freight agents, and fellow travelers all busied as frantically as ourselves in recovering their luggage. The same day at 3 p.m., our guide started for San Francisco with part of the baggage. Professor Fay of Boston, who had come to meet His Royal Highness, and kindly offered every assistance to our expedition, gave us the most efficient help we learned from him that Mr. Bryant had a fortnight start on us in Alaska. We only spent one night in New York, and the next morning, 30th May, were off to Chicago and San Francisco by the Pennsylvania Company's fast mail train. The express whizzes through towns and villages at full speed, merely clanging a bell as a signal to clear the line. Day and night one hears this characteristic warning in traversing inhabited places or entering stations. At first the country is flat, scantily wooded and chiefly arable land, but soon it becomes hilly with many pleasant homesteads surrounded by trees, and before long we are in a mountainous district with wide valleys and forest-clad slopes. Passing unawares from one state to another, we reached Chicago early in the morning of the 31st. Here a few hours halt gave us time to visit the famous stockyards, and to view the great military parade celebrating the anniversary of the War of Succession. Leaving in the evening, we awoke next day in the smiling Omaha region on the banks of the Missouri, which flows majestically between rich meadows and groves enlivened by numerous herds and flocks. Soon the train begins to climb the first foothills of the Rockies. The grass becomes thinner, then disappears and is replaced by an undulating waste of yellowish sand, dotted with patches of low prickly scrub. The train mounts at an easy gradient to a series of terraces whose precipitous cliffs overhanging the plain are furrowed with rain channels. Here and there on the vast yellow plain below one sees patches of grass near wells, with a few browsing cattle and herdsmen's huts. The scanty villages scattered over the ways consist of miserable wooden shanties, hastily run up for the use of nomad cowboys, condemned to be perpetually on the move to fresh pastures. Towards evening we see the first buttresses of the Rockies, and one or two snow peaks cutting the line of the horizon. Just for a few hours then, and the next morning we felt chilly, and a little sleet was falling on the summit of the pass, at 8,240 feet above the sea. But the other side of the range we are again in the heat. 
we skirt the northern shore of the salt lake across an arid grassless waste so uniform in tint that one cannot distinguish the limit between sand and water the lake is a desert expanse the wasatch hills shrink to nothingness at the feet of the precipitous rockies the day is dull and dreary but towards evening when the waste is flooded with a rosy glow and shadowy blue peaks are piled against the horizon the landscape is full of poetic charm after thirty-six hours in this desert there comes a sudden change of scene the line begins to reascend and soon climbs the picturesque chain of the sierra nevada here and there the snow stretches down to the railway which now climbs to seventy two hundred feet above the sea broad valleys and ridges are clothed with dense forests of pine unfortunately the snow sheds protecting the road from avalanches too often cut us off from the view a few dazzling streaks of sunshine pierce through cracks in the timbers and then the volume of smoke in the surrounding gloom is studded with sparkles of light on the pacific side the descent is very steep and the line sometimes makes abrupt turns at the edge of precipices above unknown depths gold mining camps have cleared great strips of forest and left hollows of yellow sedimentary soil still hastening downwards we traverse the fertile sacramento valley a paradise of fruit trees olives and vines with a sea of ripening oats waving in the wind at port costa the whole train is ferried across the arm of the sea that runs up to california by the golden gate another hour's travel brings us to oakland where a steamer takes us across the bay to san francisco it was now nine p m third june and the great amphitheatre of the city glittered with innumerable lamps accentuating the geometrical lines of the streets here in san francisco more preparations filled our time it was necessary to order in supplies of food during the railway journey his royal highness had made his plans and arranged every detail with us soon our rooms were filled with samples of biscuits tinned meats preserved soups and vegetables condensed milk chocolate etc etc with the restricted commissariat before us everything had to be tasted in order to choose what would be less likely to pall then our purchases completed his royal highness worked with us a whole day and late into the night making up fifty rations each ration containing one day's supply of everything required to provision ten persons i e ourselves and the guides next these fifty rations were packed in as many tin cases hermetically closed and fifty small bags were filled with tin provisions requiring no extra protection from damp by midnight june eighth we brought our work to an end everything was in order and the whole equipment now weighed about two thousand seven hundred pounds san francisco is a charming city with clean spacious streets full of light and air it has fewer oppressively enormous buildings than chicago or new york being an agricultural center it is very quiet and exempt from the feverish turmoil of the industrial eastern states the higher parts of the city commanding views of the ocean and the beautiful bay contain hundreds of villas and cottages nearly all built of wood and as this material readily lends itself to decorative freaks fancy has run riot in the queerest carvings and adornments of every shape and size here too as in chicago the foreigner is surprised by the total absence of carriages nowadays in america the horse has become almost exclusively an article of luxury since for practical purposes electric or other mechanical traction covers the ground quicker and at far less cost in san francisco mr m b kerr who had acted as topographer to the first russell expedition to st elias presented his royal highness with an outline map of the region together with much interesting information regarding its glaciers dr p de Vece, professor davidson mr mcallister secretary to the geographical society and the secretary of the alaska commercial company all did their utmost to assist our expedition by arrangement with the alaskan commercial company one of their steamers altered its course in order to afford us quick passage across the pacific from sitka to yakutat where there is no regular line of navigation the further we went the more impatient we felt to reach the field of action and gladly resumed our journey on the evening of the ninth june our route followed the long sacramento valley between the coast range and the sierra nevada sometimes in the depths of narrow gullies sometimes on the crest of some mountain spur dense masses of pine fir and cedar covered all the ridges about us chain beyond chain a perfect tangle of mountains we passed mineral springs with spouting geysers twenty to thirty feet high and at the head of the valley 
come in sight of the volcanic mount shasta a smooth snow-clad cone rising to an altitude of fourteen thousand three hundred and fifty feet the boundary between the sierra nevada and cascade range shasta vale is a spacious treeless pasture land of about twenty five hundred to twenty six hundred feet above the sea but as soon as we enter the state of oregon the woods close round us again in all the wild luxuriance of a virgin forest there are coniferae of every size and variety oaks masses of thick-leaved plants innumerable varieties of foliage of every shade of green the railway rapidly climbs the mountain in the boldest curves and as we rush along giddy crests we look straight down into deep ravines furrowed by the line we have travelled in the moonlight the forest becomes fantastic our track is hedged in between dense walls of greenery the night breeze is charged with resinous odors and whiffs of strange fragrance from unfamiliar shrubs at every turn our train seems to be cleaving its own road through the wilderness as the engines are fed with wood the funnels send out spears of flame and showers of sparks flashing light for a moment on the nearer trunks here and there wide glades open before us bristling with the skeletons of charred trees victims of forest fires stretching their mutilated blackened limbs in the moonlight a campfire here and there by some lonely hut only increases the sinister gloom of the woods behind it whenever the train has to cross a gully spanned by one of those slender bridges on wooden stilts that even by daylight seem so insecure it appears to be flying through space unsupported on the morning of the eleventh of june we entered washington state crossing the huge columbia river on a ferry boat the busy stream crowded with steamers and serpent-like rafts run between low wooded hills being just now in flood it spread over the valley to the edge of the railway bank passing through the forest that runs down to the coast we reach seattle at six o'clock p m this town at the head of elliott bay the inlet of one of the numerous intricate channels twisting southwards from vancouver into puget sound is hardly more than the skeleton of a great city it was laid out in eighteen eighty nine after the greater part of the old settlement had been destroyed by fire and was expected to outdo san francisco in size and prosperity so far the prediction has not been fulfilled stately mansions are flanked by wretched hovels and the vacant building lots leave ugly blanks in the spacious streets five days before our arrival the yacht aggie chartered by the prince had sailed from seattle harbor with ten american porters on board these were picked men engaged for the expedition and under the command of a mr ingram who had been recommended to his royal highness by professors russell and fay ingram had taken charge of the camp material and of two months supplies for himself and the men the aggie was to wait for us at sitka after forty hours in seattle the morning of june thirteenth found us on board the small steamboat city of topeka bound for sitka the capital of alaska end of chapter one chapter two of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf from seattle to juneau the alexander archipelago and alaska the word alaska occurs for the first time in the chart of captain cook's first voyage seventeen seventy eight it is derived from the aboriginal word alakshak signifying the great continent and the country was discovered by vitus bering in seventeen forty one soon afterwards its shores were widely explored by numerous expeditions both russian and spanish the latter moved by the hope of discovering the famous northwest passage the former by greed of conquest remaining subject to russia down to eighteen sixty seven alaska was then sold to the united states for seven million dollars it covers an area six and a half times larger than great britain five hundred and seventy seven thousand three hundred and ninety square miles with a coastline of twenty six thousand miles it runs westward into a peninsula which together with the chain of the aleutian isles divides the bering sea from the pacific southward it is prolonged into a narrow tongue of land skirting british columbia for three hundred miles the aleutian islands are famed for fur seals of the highest market value which abound there 
accordingly the american government has found it necessary to do as the russians did and regulate the seal fisheries by very stringent laws and international conventions for the due preservation at the northwestern extremity of the american continent of the precious amphibiae which have been almost exterminated elsewhere off the west coast of alaska there are great banks yielding cod and salmon and immense shoals of herring the region also carries on a flourishing fur trade with the indians of the interior the mineral wealth of alaska is very great deposits of gold silver platinum iron and coal promise future prosperity to the land according to the census of 1890 this vast region then contained barely thirty two thousand fifty two inhabitants composed of four thousand two hundred ninety eight whites twenty three thousand five hundred and thirty one indians and four thousand two hundred and twenty three mongols and half-breeds the indians are divided into four leading tribes with different languages and customs and although no indication of their origin is found in their myths and traditions experts now maintain that their ethnographical characteristics prove them to be descended from the aborigines of the central parts of the continent the four principal groups subdivided into many lesser tribes are the eskimo or inuit inhabiting the coasts of the bering sea and the polar ocean the aluti of the alaska peninsula and aleutian isles the athabascan or tine of the interior and the tlingit or tlingit whose villages lie on the southern coast of alaska and in the islands of the alexander archipelago these last are forty five hundred in number and owing to the prolonged intercourse with white men have changed their customs more than the others for a stretch of six hundred geographical miles from cape flattery to cape spencer along british columbia and the southern arm of alaska the western shores of north america are fringed with innumerable islands of all sizes from vancouver island two hundred and fifty miles in length to small rocks barely emerging from the surface of quiet channels mount olympus to the south and mount la perouse to the north respectively dominate the straits of juan de fuca and cross sound the two outer gates of the archipelago both to the north and south channels running inland beyond the limits marked by the two mountains form puget sound in washington state and lynn canal and glacier bay in alaska the part of the archipelago little more than one-third belonging to alaska is known as the alexander archipelago the political frontier of alaska starting from the southern end of prince of wales island passes through the center of portland channel to the fifty-sixth parallel and then follows the crest of the mountain chain on a line with the coast wherever the chain is within thirty-four and a half miles from the sea as far as the one hundred and forty-first meridian at the point however where the coast range intersects the one hundred and forty-first meridian greenwich this meridian marks the frontier as far north as the polar sea the right angle thus formed where the frontier ceasing to run along the coastline turns abruptly and follows the hundred and forty-first meridian is occupied by no less colossal landmark than mount st elias the greater part of the interior of alaska is entirely unexplored the rainfall is scanty and the climate arctic the ground at a foot beneath the surface remains frozen throughout the year during the seven months of winter daylight only lasts four hours and the temperature drops to fifty nine degrees fahrenheit below zero there are no transition seasons and the fine summer months are comparatively warm sixty to seventy degrees fahrenheit with the sun above the horizon for twenty hours daily towards the polar ocean and bering straits there are vast tundras as in northern siberia the rest of the soil being boggy with scattered brushwood or patches of dwarf trees near the rivers footnote tundras are the vast treeless plains of the arctic region carpeted with moss and lichen End footnote. the mountains only reach an altitude of four thousand to five thousand feet and have no glaciers the whole country is intersected by a close network of rivers and lakes connected by so many branches that it is declared possible to traverse alaska almost entirely by boat from one to the other sea one giant river the yukon bigger than the mississippi itself rises in canada runs two thousand miles through alaska and falls into the bering sea the climatic and geographical peculiarities of the coast zone of southern alaska are completely opposed to those of the interior 
the great mountain ranges are clad with dense forest growth and the warm current kuro saiwo from japanese waters makes the climate very mild near the coast the mean temperature of the sea is fifty degrees fahrenheit winter begins in december and in may the snow vanishes from the lowlands at sitka the medium winter temperature is thirty two point five degrees fahrenheit and there is a variation of barely twenty five degrees fahrenheit between the summer medium and the winter the atmosphere is nearly always surcharged with moisture and the hot south winds laden with watery mists breaking against these lofty coast ranges causes tremendous falls of rain and snow at sitka the average yearly rainfall is about one hundred inches and throughout the region there are not more than seventy really fine days in the year this accounts for the huge size of the glaciers along the coast some of which positively pour into the sea only the south coast and to be precise only the portion covered by the alexander archipelago possesses regular maritime communication with the united states the service is carried on by two postal steamers the queen and the city of topeka which thread the intricate island channels by the so-called inland passage between seattle or tacoma and sitka we embarked early on the morning of the thirteenth of june on the smaller boat city of topeka which after the lucania seemed the reverse of sumptuous but the grand scenery of the voyage was ample compensation for the lack of comfort the boat had to put back to tacoma to complete her lading so that the whole of our first day was spent in puget sound here the shores van diked in countless bays are mossed with green pine to the water's edge while towering in the background the distant snow peaks of the cascade range cluster round their monarch mount rainier fourteen thousand four hundred feet high we had about seventy fellow passengers mostly business men a few young ladies returning home to alaska from schools in california or washington state and a sprinkling of tourists in the second class with our guides were some miners bound for the upcountry gold diggings the stores of poultry fruit and vegetables on deck together with the cargo of meat and other provisions below gave a poor idea of the food resources of alaska in fact the summer there is too short for the growth of cereals which can only ripen in certain spots and even potatoes are not raised every year vegetables have been cultivated here and there with some success lately thanks to infinite pains and patience cattle breeding has great difficulties to contend with as the animals suffer seriously from their prolonged winter confinement the reindeer introduced a few years ago seem to be the only beasts that really thrive in alaska by the afternoon we were off seattle and late in the evening we were near the mouth of admiralty inlet in the juan de fuca straits and steering for victoria the capital of columbia on vancouver island once through the juan de fuca straits we were in columbian waters between vancouver and the mainland first in the wide gulf of georgia amid an amphitheater of peaks for the most part still covered with snow and then through the tortuous channels of discovery and johnstone pass enclosed by high cliffs against which the water breaks in seething floods and where the course seems barred at every turn by precipitous walls of rock emerging into queen charlotte sound the steamer threads her way through a labyrinth of islets and reefs barely projecting above the surface at some distance from the low shores after rounding the northern end of vancouver the boundless ocean opens out and our small vessel pitches heavily among the rollers but soon we enter another smooth channel overshadowed by great cliffs the entire coast with all its islands rocks gentle slopes sheer cliffs and dark gorges is so overgrown by dense forests of firs that from a distance the whole seems one mass of velvety green the prevailing growth throughout the forests of the archipelago is the sitka fir abies sitkensis this tree supplies the natives with building materials household utensils canoes and sledges while its branches serve for torches during the long winter nights less numerous are the white larch the pine pinus contorta and certain varieties of fir the yellow cedar cupressus nutcanensis a much prized wood was nearly exterminated under the russian rule the forests are populated by deer roebucks bears both brown and black wolves foxes sheep and mountain goats stags are occasionally caught while swimming some channel to escape the wolves now and then an indian village on the margin of the forest 
light canoes or some tiny boat with a triangular sail plying close to the shore lend a wild charm of remoteness to the scene as we go farther north the days grow longer the air is more misty especially in the morning and early afternoon the cold diffused light spreads a general monotony and the leaden sky is reflected in a colorless sea entering alaskan waters the steamer touches mary island a small outpost of the alexander archipelago and after calling at a few indian villages to land stores we reach fort wrangell on the island of that name and the first alaskan town of any importance importance however is a relative term the township counts a few hundred inhabitants chiefly thlinket indians whose huts are ranged along the beach near the better sort of two-storied dwellings of the whites the little town is commanded by a government house where the authorities reside behind the indian cabins are the tombs of certain shaman or wizards guarded by masts some eighty to one hundred feet high bearing roughly carved symbols in the shape of animals on their summits in front of some of the houses similar poles are erected these are totems or ancestral pillars the equivalents of family crests among the indians before a man's house on his canoe or his garments one finds the totem of the tribe or family to which he belongs and it is even worked into personal ornaments of carved horn or ivory sometimes showing a certain artistic sense the thlinket are shamanists or fetishists they believe all natural phenomena to contain spirits good or evil the mightiest of these spirits is yale symbolized by the raven next knuch by the wolf and tsek by the whale many of the thlinket are now converts to christianity although it is hard to decide whether their comprehension penetrates beyond external rites to a genuine religious conception many of them are clothed like white men some can speak english and a few have learnt to read and write but outwardly at least they show few signs of civilization they are less ferocious than a century ago and have almost given up the practice of tattooing and of wearing rings in the lips or nose but their appearance and mode of life are pretty much the same as when they were described by vancouver in seventeen ninety four they are revoltingly dirty inside and out their dwellings are intolerable owing to the stench of accumulated filth on the mainland near fort wrangell is the mouth of the stikine the chief river of southern alaska springing from glacial torrents its milky current makes a distinct white streak in the blue ocean to a considerable distance out at sea both in 1862 and 1875 the discovery of auriferous deposits in the upper river basin awakened great hopes for the future of fort wrangell but the placers yielded so little ore that they were soon abandoned fort wrangell is the gate of the northern seas and beyond it we are soon in the midst of truly arctic scenery the passage of wrangell straits is difficult navigation during the first few hours owing to the numerous reefs just above the surface and the force of the tidal currents but the channels widen later on outlines of snow mountains and of rocky peaks are faintly distinguished apparently at a great distance and the greenish white seracs of the first glaciers are visible below the sullen gray mists next we enter prince frederick sound resembling a vast clear placid lake far away great snowy ranges rise above the water and the sea is dotted with numerous rocks and islands suddenly the first iceberg is signaled and soon our steamer is in the midst of white floating masses which drift slowly and noiselessly with the current rocked by the long waves in the vessel's wake beneath a sky heavy with purple clouds projecting vast shadows on the face of the water the pure white icebergs seem to radiate a brilliancy of their own in the cold diffused light of the colorless atmosphere around them dark green fur-clad islets emerge in the midst of this polar scene and all about us is an indescribable stir of life a crying and calling of birds a coming and going of living things bald-headed eagles perch motionless on the firs flights of gulls circle round the ship the very icebergs afford a resting place to the flights of wild duck which fringe every ledge and take wing in clouds at the approach of the steamer the glistening back of a whale suddenly emerges from the smooth green sea only to disappear again in a swirl of spray schools of porpoises disport themselves in the wake of our vessel as she glides through masses of jellyfish and great waving weeds the next port we touch at is juno founded in 1880 by a prospector who was tempted to settle there with a few comrades 
on the strength of certain nuggets picked up by indians near the spot although the youngest born of alaska towns juno has quickly become the most populous in eighteen ninety it already counted one thousand two hundred and fifty three inhabitants and is rapidly increasing as usual the houses are of wood and the streets paved with planks save in the higher part of the city still in course of construction where tree stumps as yet fill the gaps among the houses juno has electric light public baths hotels theatres three churches catholic greek and protestant one hospital and a local newspaper its prosperity is derived from the neighboring gold mines at treadwell and from being the starting point and the base of supplies for diggers bound inland to the yukon basin small gold camps are scattered all over alaska and prospectors have been exploring the country in every direction for a good many years since eighteen eighty five however the chief mining center is the upper yukon basin where gold washing and digging have been gradually extended to all the tributaries of the main river it was in one of these lateral valleys the klondike that the fabulous gold deposits which have startled the world were first discovered a month after our arrival in eighteen ninety the yield in this district was fifty thousand dollars in eighteen ninety one seventy thousand and in eighteen ninety six the population had risen to one thousand seven hundred souls and the yield to one million four hundred thousand dollars the district which promises the largest yield covers an area of seven hundred square miles the miners chiefly americans have founded a settlement known as dawson city which is situated in british territory being to the south of the one hundred and forty first meridian as is indeed the greater portion of the gold-bearing district this town is nearly six hundred and seventy six miles from juneau the two routes most frequented are by the passes of chilkoot and chilkat coals of the coast range at the extremity of lynn canal north of juneau by these passes the route descends either to the white river or to the lewis both tributaries of the yukon and the journey is continued on boats and rafts dawson city can also be reached by going up the yukon from its mouth in bering sea but this is a much longer route the severe climate of the interior the distance of dawson city from the coast and the enormous difficulties of transport render the victualling of the numerous immigrants a very difficult problem besides gold washing can only be carried on for about three months of the year as the intense cold of the long dark arctic winter makes all work impossible end of chapter two Chapter Three of the Ascent of Mount Saint Elias, Alaska, by Filippo de Filippi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. From Juno to Yakutat, the Muir Glacier, Sitka, and the Coast Range. The night after leaving Juno was the most fantastic of the voyage. As the sun went down, the whole horizon, bounded by vast snowy ranges, became marvelously clear, and was gradually tinged with most delicate sunset hues at ten p m it was still broad day then until midnight the light waned little by little the rosy glow on snow-fields and summits became paler the orange blue and carmine streaks of the sea gradually melted into fainter and more exquisite tints but in the west a band of tawny crimson still hung throwing strange reflections on the mountains beneath the rest of the sky was a pale blue growing fainter and colder towards the horizon against this all the mountains stood out in their minutest details with the crude white of their snow-fields and curious delicate indentation of their crests no light proceeded from the dull yellow moon the stars were few and faint at one thirty a m the new day began to dawn while the colors gradually faded away from the west our vessel glided on silently furtively as it were in the solemn stillness of this enchanted world after rounding the headland dividing the lynn canal from glacier bay we began to meet icebergs a few and scattered at first but soon many in number fragments of the glaciers that fall into the bay a little way ahead but we were in the realm of marvels of sudden changes of scene the air being saturated with moisture speedily condenses at the least lowering of temperature whenever the wind veers or the sun goes behind a cloud a sheet of gray fog lies low on the horizon gradually spreading until the whole sea is shrouded by a thin white veil that is luminous but not transparent 
then our engines have to be stopped to avoid collisions with icebergs the latter are not alarming in appearance but as the mass of ice seen above the water is but a small fraction of the total bulk the shock of collision might be serious they emerge suddenly out of the fog and drifting with the current vanish as suddenly as they come all at once the sun reappeared a pale disk in a huge halo of vapor and in a few seconds as by magic the fog cleared and the light and color returned the gray sea changed to amethystine blue thousands of wild duck startled by the proximity of the steamer rose in long clamorous flights from icebergs and water but in ten minutes we were once more wrapped in fog and for hours these changes of scene went on only varied by the amusement of seeing fragments of the bergs fished up to replenish our stock of ice at last the sun risen high above the horizon finally disperses the fog so that our vessel is able to make the bay at the foot of the majestic muir glacier now the whole atmosphere is brilliantly bright and clear the blue surface of the sea scarcely a shade deeper than the sky is slightly ruffled and intersected with streaks of shining water traced by the currents and dotted with innumerable small icebergs while here and there some gigantic block preserves still the irregularly geometrical form peculiar to seracs footnote mr wright the geologist measured some icebergs in glacier bay of five hundred feet in length and with a bulk of forty million cubic feet End footnote. some stand high out of the water others form huge floating slabs now and again a combination of many smaller bergs welded together assume a quaint and unusual shape among the white blocks with their delicate flower-like frostwork we note a few polished masses of sea-green hue these are bergs which have turned upside down thus exposing the portion originally submerged this bay is bounded by two large glacier beds to the left rises the range dominated by mounts la perouse Crillon, and fairweather which rival the grandest of known peaks in the boldness of their outline the nearer peaks lower and less isolated remain almost unnoticed before these majestic summits the whole chain covers a promontory of from thirty to forty miles in width between glacier bay and the pacific ocean four glaciers flow down into the bay divided from the muir glacier by a small rocky spur that shoots out into the sea and splits the gulf in two to the right of the fairweather chain and at the head of the inlet the muir glacier forms an enormous plateau ending abruptly at the water's edge in a sheer wall of ice one mile in length and two hundred and fifty feet high crowned by countless pinnacles and spires its base is undermined by the force of the waves and worn into numerous gullies and caverns every few minutes there is a cannonade of ice blocks falling from this cliff which as they strike the water throw up clouds of spray into the air from this vast front of ice broken and seamed as it is by innumerable crevasses the glacier stretches inland almost level to a huge amphitheatre fifty or sixty miles in diameter where it is fed by nine greater and seventeen lesser ice streams flowing down from summits which have no special beauty of outline the muir glacier was first explored in eighteen seventy nine by the geologist whose name it bears in eighteen eighty six mr h f wright with two companions spent a month in the bay to study its rate of motion his observations have established some surprising facts regarding the motion of the glacier during the month of august an average of forty feet flows into the bay i e seventy feet in the centre and ten feet at the sides footnote the rate of descent in glaciers is determined by the same laws as that of rivers in either case the current is swifter in the centre than at the sides swifter also nearer the surface than deeper beneath End footnote as the front of the muir glacier has a section surface of five million square feet it discharges daily into the sea more than two hundred million cubic feet of ice only in greenland has anything approaching this velocity been noted the glaciers of the alps move at a much slower rate the maximum speed as shown by repeated observations of the hugi agassiz forbes and tyndall being in the case of the Aletsch glacier nineteen inches of the grindelwald twenty two inches and of the chamonix mer de glace thirty inches daily this notable difference seems all the more remarkable as the muir glacier comes down a gradient of barely one hundred feet to the mile 
whereas the easiest gradients of the alpine glaciers are of about two hundred and fifty feet to the mile accordingly another explanation is required to account for the difference and considering the muir glacier's enormous superiority in bulk over those of the alps we are forced to conclude that a glacier's rate of movement depends far less on the inclination of the bed than on the volume of the ice current itself see right there are many infallible signs that the muir glacier is shrinking and at so rapid a rate that its cliff lip has receded more than a thousand yards between the years eighteen eighty six and eighteen ninety footnote readers unacquainted with glacial phenomena may find a discrepancy between our statement that the front of the muir glacier has shrunk back and the rapid movement in advance verified by right yet this discrepancy is only apparent the bulk of the glacier is owed to two causes which act in a contrary way the quantity of fallen snow and the melting of the ice by solar heat the first cause always overrules the second in the upper portion of the glacier inasmuch as the yearly snowfall there is greater than the amount melted by the sun and it is precisely the overplus that drops to the bottom of the ravine in the shape of ice now three conditions may ensue when the quantity of ice formed above exceeds the yearly amount liquefied below the limit of perpetual snow the glacier increases in bulk and its terminal front is pushed forward when on the other hand the quantity of fresh ice balances the quantity melted the bulk of the glacier is unchanged although its downward motion persists but when less ice comes down from the upper snow fields than the amount melted below the glacier's bulk is necessarily diminished this diminution is more marked in the terminal front than elsewhere and consequently the snout seems to have receded but this apparently retrograde movement does not interfere with the glacier's descent for this continues without ceasing only the advancing mass is no longer sufficient to entirely replace the quantity of ice converted into water End footnote. going back to earlier times we have a valuable document dating from seventeen ninety four in the description of glacier bay bequeathed to us by vancouver in the history of his voyage round the world according to his account the muir glacier then occupied nearly the whole of the bay now taken up by the sea later on when wright thoroughly explored the bay he obtained undeniable proofs of the enormous extent of the glacier at an earlier period certain rocky islets near the opening of the bay at fifteen miles distance from the glacier's present front show undoubted signs of having been formerly covered by glacier ice while on the cliffs round the bay at thirty seven hundred feet above the sea striated rocks attest the action of the glacier that once filled the valley up to that height the city of topeka dropped anchor among the icebergs a short distance from the glacier's frontal wall and the passengers were landed where a path traced in the narrow and easy moraine afforded easy access to the frozen plateau here we were struck by the vastness of the glacier bed but the view is far more imposing from the sea than from the dirty ice close to the bare gravelly ridges of the moraine among the crevasses we noticed a signal pole fixed on a pedestal and the foremost members of the party hastened to seize it and move it a good distance higher up convinced that they had mounted farther than any previous explorer but they forgot that during the fortnight's interval since the last steamer put in the glacier movement must have carried the pole down about a thousand feet on returning to the shore we found a dozen indians men women and children collected there with some lynx skins and baskets of colored seaweed for sale they formed a typical group squatting on the earth wrapped in brick-red blankets barefoot and bareheaded with their long smooth black hair yellow faces high cheekbones prominent jaws slanting eyes flat noses and straight thin-lipped mouths the men had a few bristles on lip and chin the women's faces were smeared with a dark shining paste composed of grease turpentine and lampblack to protect their complexions from sunburn hard by on the sandy beach were the three canoes in which these indians had crossed the bay and the carcass of a young seal they had killed on the way their light graceful canoes are made of hollowed trunks and they manage to give them the proper curves by filling them with water raised to the boiling point by red-hot stones on leaving the muir glacier our course lay due south towards sitka after the day of clear weather came a very prolonged twilight fading in endless graduation of tones over the bay dotted with the blue and white points of the icebergs and on the lofty summits girdling the coast 
the sinking sun crowned the fairweather range with a halo of splendor before finally sinking into the sea of molten gold on the horizon and leaving behind it only the colorless diffused light of the northern night so fantastic and strange the air was perfectly still the sea without a ripple while here and there we marked the columns of water thrown up by the whales at two thirty p m on june twentieth our seven days voyage ended in the port of sitka which at that moment had a very lively aspect there were five government ships on coast survey and revenue service the yacht aggie chartered by the prince had been at anchor for four days and rocked gracefully beside the stumpy bertha the steamer of the alaska commercial company which was to transport us as far as yakutat taking the aggie in tow sitka stands on the island of baranoff at the far end of a bay open to the ocean and sprinkled with rocks and small islets the city is built on a delta of pasture land with a picturesque background of steep rocky heights it has twelve hundred inhabitants is the present seat of government and the center of the alaska coast district footnote the united states have only had a regular government in alaska since the year eighteen eighty four sitka and fort wrangell are alternately its seat End footnote. salmon fisheries and tanneries constitute its trading resources the cool climate and the charming situation also attract a good many visitors to sitka during the summer facing the town on the little island that guards the bay on the north the extinct volcano of mount edgecombe rises to about eight thousand feet above the sea the indians have made this mountain the theme of a very interesting legend given as follows by mr c e s wood in his article on the flankets a long time ago the earth sank beneath the water and the water rose and covered the highest places so that no man could live it rained so hard that it was as if the sea fell from the sky all was black and it became so dark that no man knew another then a few people ran here and there and made a raft of cedar logs but nothing could stand against the white waves and the raft was broken in two on one part floated the ancestors of the Clinkets, on the other the parents of all other nations the waters tore them apart and they never saw each other again now their children are all different and do not understand one another in the black tempest chethel was torn from his sister a on ankan the woman who supports the earth and chethel symbolized in the osprey called aloud to her you will never see me again but you will hear my voice forever then he became an enormous bird and flew to the southwest till no eye could follow him a on ankan climbed above the waters and reached the summit of edgecombe the mountain opened and received her into the bosom of the earth that hole the crater is where she went down ever since that time she has held the earth above the water the earth is shaped like the back of a turtle and rests on a pillar evil spirits that wish to destroy mankind seek to overthrow her and drive her away the terrible battles are long and fierce in the lower darkness often the pillar rocks and sways in the struggle and the earth trembles and seems like to fall but agish on akan is good and strong so the earth is safe chethel lives in the bird kunakateth his nest is on the top of the mountain in a hole through which his sister disappeared he carries whales in his claws to this eyrie and there devours them he swoops from his hiding place and rides on the edge of the coming storm the roaring of the tempest is his voice calling to his sister he claps his wings in peals of thunder and its rumbling is the rustling of his pinions the lightning is the flashing of his eyes with the aggie had arrived our ten american porters powerful young fellows picked out for the expedition by e s ingram familiarly known as the major they worked hard jointly with our guides all the afternoon of the twentieth june transferring our stores from the steamer to the yacht which already held the americans equipment by seven p m the task was done and at two a m twenty first june we made our start his royal highness and our party on the bertha the guides and porters on the yacht in tow the bertha was an old boat of about fifteen hundred tons short broad beamed and so very high out of the water that the slightest gale of wind would set her pitching and rolling outrageously the only passengers in addition to our party were two ladies making this northern voyage in search of health we were obliged not to steam more than five miles an hour on account of the light yacht we had in tow as every jerk of the cable dragged her bows under water dull hazy weather prevented us from enjoying the spectacle of the grand range of summits rising from the coast to heights of some fifteen thousand feet and more 
the alexander archipelago ends at cape spencer and from this point the coastline trends northwest bare and straight for about three hundred miles the only important inlet is the bay of yakutat small vessels can also find shelter in latuya bay at the foot of the fairweather chain but the rest of the shore lies open exposed to the full fury of the ocean and so violent a surf that landing is always very dangerous and often impossible this coast is commanded by the loftiest rampart that ever nature set along a shore no less gigantic a sea wall than the range which comprises la perouse eleven thousand three hundred feet krillin fifteen thousand nine hundred and fairweather fifteen thousand five hundred north of the latter summit the chain becomes lower running still parallel with the coast and has no peaks higher than from five thousand to eight thousand feet as far as yakutat bay here it again rises rapidly to mount vancouver twelve thousand one hundred feet mount cook thirteen thousand seven hundred and fifty mount augusta thirteen thousand nine hundred and reaches its culminating point at mount st elias eighteen thousand feet above the sea the whole of this range is merely a part of the vast mountain system extending along the western coasts of the two americas and of which the partially submerged northern end forms the volcanic range one thousand geographical miles in length of the aleutian islands the crowning peaks of this northern group from la perouse to st elias rise at a little distance from the sea from an altitude of twenty five hundred feet and upwards they are covered with eternal snow and thousands of glaciers flow down their slopes to the north and south many of which reach the sea or very near it footnote in europe glaciers come down to the sea at the sixty seventh degree of latitude von buch in alaska at the fifty seventh parallel russell and in south america nearer still to the equator at forty six degrees fifty minutes latitude south darwin End footnote these glaciers are of greater dimensions than any others in the northern hemisphere excepting those of greenland the presence of so vast an ice world in a region with the comparatively mild climate of southern alaska is owing to the fact that no very low temperature is required for the formation of extensive glaciers but only a very damp climate together with the general meteorological conditions fitted to precipitate watery vapor into snow Lyle throughout this region of ice all glaciers are shrinking their diminution probably began one hundred or one hundred and fifty years ago and proceeds very gradually at the rate of two feet a year in every glacier very slight variations in the annual amount of fallen snow when repeated many years in succession suffice to produce a notable increase or decrease in the bulk of a glacier accordingly it has been impossible so far to ascertain the climatic changes that produce this retrograde motion of the alaskan glaciers and all the more impossible because regular and well combined observations have only recently been undertaken on the twenty second june we had a calmer sea but the horizon was quite as clouded as on the previous day we were now in the fair weather waters renowned for the great number of whales formerly captured there between eighteen forty six and eighteen fifty one mount fairweather owes its name to the whalers for they had observed that when this peak was free from cloud they could confidently reckon upon several days of fine weather we reached the entrance of yakutat bay about nine o'clock p m and having rounded ocean cape the bertha and the aggie came into port mulgrave and dropped anchor about ten o'clock off the little indian village of yakutat on sighting our vessels the natives waving pine torches swarmed to the beach with savage yells to which the barking of innumerable dogs made an ear-splitting accompaniment the rev carl j hendrickson a swedish missionary established near the indian village soon paid us a visit on board and willingly agreed to take regular observations with a mercurial barometer we left in his care during the whole time employed in our ascent to mount st elias rev hendrickson had spent eight years in this out-of-the-way corner of the world leading a life of self-sacrifice and abnegation and wholly devoted to the moral and physical improvement of this primitive tribe a schoolmistress shares his labors the entire wealth of the mission consists in two cows a few fowls and a small garden plot yielding a scanty crop of vegetables about every third year meat is a rare luxury only to be had when the indians are lucky in the chase the teacher told me that the indians are not hostile though indifferent to the school and that several of the children show quickness in learning the village population is somewhat over three hundred 
like all thlinkets they spend most of their life on the water either engaged in salmon fishing or hunting seal and otter thanks to the missionaries active benevolence the settlement numbers about fifty well-built houses mostly of two stories at two o'clock the next morning we again put to sea bound for the western coast of the bay covered by the malaspina glacier where we were to land the real starting point of our undertaking was now at length before us end of chapter three chapter four of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the history of mount st elias those who went first and opened the way are not less entitled to credit than those who came afterwards and reaped the fruit of their predecessors labors d freshfield most geographers apply the name of st elias alps to the whole mountain system bounded by st elias to the north and la perouse to the south for a long stretch of about a hundred and eighty geographical miles these alps run parallel with the pacific coast and separated from the sea by a narrow strip almost entirely covered by the mighty glaciers flowing down from the range yakutat bay thrusting inland by the narrow and tortuous fjord known as disenchantment bay divides the mountains into two groups consisting of the fairweather chain to the south and of the cook and st elias chains to the north yakutat bay is twenty miles wide at the entrance and retains the same width for some distance inland until narrowed by an abrupt curve of its eastern coast as far as the opening of disenchantment bay which is barely three miles wide the greater part of the eastern coast guarded by a string of low wooded islands and with many natural creeks forms a high plateau rising from two thousand to three thousand feet above the sea and covered with forests this plateau is dominated by a low mountain range with numerous snow fields and glaciers joining fairweather to the south and running round the head of the bay until it is finally merged in the cook range beyond the west coast of the gulf forms the eastern flank of a great tableland bounded on the south by the pacific with an almost unbroken shoreline exposed to the full fury of the ocean surf the malaspina glacier spreads over this plateau at an average height of fifteen hundred feet above the sea rising gradually to the feet of the mighty chains behind and extending for a distance as yet unknown to the west of mount st elias the mighty glaciers which flow down the southern flank of the range to feed the malaspina will be mentioned farther on the entire region to the north of the st elias and cook chains is still unexplored c willard hayes who has crossed overland from the yukon basin to that of the copper river is the only traveller who has given any information about the great glaciers which flow to the north on the twentieth july seventeen forty one vitus bering a russian navigator discovered the south coast of alaska and anchored his vessel the st peter off the island of kayak a hundred and eighty miles north of yakutat southeast of his moorings he saw a great mountain rising from the sea and covered with snow from summit to base in honor of the patron saint of the day this peak was named saint elias it is possible that the name was not chosen entirely on that account mr freshfield has observed that the prophet elias seems to be the special patron of mountains wherever the eastern forms of christianity have prevailed many mountains in greece bear the same name and are crowned with chapels dedicated to the saint while the altars of zeus on olympus have been replaced by monasteries likewise dedicated to saint elias in the caucasus there is still a tradition that when the primitive tribes were driven up into the mountains by the circassians the vision of the outraged saint was frequently seen on the highest peaks and that they carried offerings to him of milk butter and beer some writers derive the saint's connection with mountains from the important part in the transfiguration assigned to elias by the greek church whereas it is asserted by others that owing to similarity of name elias succeeded to altars originally dedicated to helios the sun mr freshfield suggests that another explanation might be found in the survival of the belief attributed to the prophet's sons who sent an expedition composed of fifty strong men in search of elias thinking that peradventure the spirit of the lord hath cast him upon some mountain 
Mount St. Elias brought no good fortune to its discoverers. For three months the St. Peter lay in Alaskan waters, buffeted by storms, and was then wrecked by a hurricane on the coast of the Commander Islands. Bering died there with most of his crew. The few survivors wintered on the islands, afterwards succeeded in reaching the coast of Kamchatka, and finally got back to Russia. The first measurement of St. Elias was made in 1786 by Monsieur d'Aguilet, astronomer to the expedition round the world undertaken by La Perouse, with his two ships, La Boussole and L'Astrolabe. By his calculation, the height was 12,672 feet. The summit rose above the clouds. Between the long chain of snow peaks and the sea lay a great plateau which, according to La Perouse's description, looked completely bare of vegetation and composed of black calcined looking rock contrasted strangely with the snow-covered mountains the gulf of yakutat named bay de monte by la perouse was rechristened admiralty bay by g dixon who entering it in seventeen eighty seven was the first explorer of its shores and anchored his vessel at port mulgrave where an indian village already existed with some seventy inhabitants a few years later in seventeen ninety two Spain dispatched two ships, commanded by the Italian captain, Don Alejandro Malaspina, to seek the famous northwest passage between the two oceans. On entering Yakutat Bay, Malaspina discovered that it was prolonged inland by an arm in which he hoped to find the beginning of the desired channel. But the boats sent to explore it found the way barred by a cliff of ice at a short distance from the mouth. They named the inlet Puerto del Desengaño, disenchantment bay and the island in it hanky their observations fixed the height of st elias at sixty five thousand seventy six varas seventeen thousand eight hundred and fifty one feet its position at sixty degrees seventeen minutes thirty five seconds latitude north and one hundred and forty degrees fifty two minutes seventeen seconds longitude west greenwich on malaspina's return to spain he fell into disgrace and was imprisoned so that his discoveries remained unrecognized for many years another famous navigator mentioned in the history of alaska is g vancouver who in the year seventeen ninety four explored yakutat bay and the neighboring coasts with his vessels the discovery and the chatham he gave the name of point manby to the headland bounding the western entrance to the bay the plateau he described as bare ground strewn with stone rising in a gentle and even slope to the spurs of the lofty mountains dominated by st elias he also noted that east of yakutat bay in a creek towards the pacific icy bay the coast seemed to consist of a vertical wall of ice no other account of st elias and its precincts is to be found until eighteen fifty two the date of tebenkoff's report chiefly founded on the information obtained from russian traders here the height of st elias is stated to be seventeen thousand feet its position sixty one degrees two minutes six seconds latitude north and one hundred and forty degrees four minutes longitude west at thirty miles from the sea tebenkoff states that in eighteen thirty nine smoke was seen issuing from a crater on the southeast flank of the mountain and that an eruption of fire and ashes took place in eighteen forty seven contemporaneously with an earthquake experienced at sitka the lowlands at the base of st elias are described as tundras covered with forests and pastures and it is added that through fissures in the sandy soil you could see a substratum of ice subsequently these fables of fictitious eruptions being collected and repeated though with every reserve as to their authenticity by w h dahl created the belief so long prevalent that mount st elias was a volcano this theory was apparently corroborated by the curious shape of the southern crest of the mountain which is so curved as to form a great amphitheater resembling a real crater successive explorations have proved that the st elias group shows no trace of volcanic action but a curious phenomenon observed by topham may perhaps explain why certain navigators thought they saw mount st elias in eruption from the sea down one of the very steep gullies about three hundred feet deep scoring the inner side of the so-called crater there were perpetual falls of stones and detritus and these avalanches sent up lofty columns of dust which caught by the wind simulated whirls of smoke 
even topham on seeing this effect at a distance believed at first that it proceeded from a volcano mr russell likewise noted that great clouds of dust were sent up by the falls of shale detritus on the south face of mount augusta on other occasions similar causes have led to the same mistake in seventeen forty one a commissioner was sent from turin to inspect a new volcano said to have broken out in the savoy alps which proved to be simply a landslip from the rocher de fiz near servoz da sassou a similar landslip in the present century led to a rumor that the extinct volcano of mount ararat had burst into life again when mr freshfield was on mont blanc in eighteen sixty seven he saw a cloud of dust caused by a landslip near the little st bernard pass fifteen miles from the spot where he stood this phenomenon lasted for several weeks and no spectator at a distance could possibly recognize its real nature and cause the next expedition to alaska was that dispatched in eighteen seventy four by the united states survey directed by w h dahl and m baker which gleaned a rich harvest of geographical and geological data and much new information on the glacial phenomena of the region it was this expedition which first ascertained the real nature of the plateau interposed between the mountain chains and the sea i e that it consisted of a huge glacier and named it the malaspina then too the cook vancouver and malaspina peaks were identified and christened the height of st elias was calculated at nineteen thousand six hundred feet with a probable miscalculation of four hundred feet more or less and the position was fixed as sixty degrees twenty minutes forty five seconds latitude north and one hundred and forty one degrees zero minutes twelve seconds longitude west by this time mount st elias had won a definite place on the maps of alaska and it is astonishing that the exceptional characteristics of the country with such lofty mountains and glaciers of such unusual extent should not have immediately tempted more explorers to attack those virgin peaks and penetrate to the heart of the new region difficulty of access must have been the chief cause of this delay there is no commercial motive to attract vessels to this zone of forests and ice fields where a small native population finds the barest subsistence and where communications with other parts of the continent are few and irregular in the spring of eighteen seventy seven mr c e s wood being determined to attempt an excursion to st elias found no means of proceeding beyond sitka save by indian canoe this conveyed him to cape spencer at the northern extremity of the archipelago but as the indians were afraid to risk their little craft on the open sea along an absolutely harborless coast his journey was suspended the first real expedition for the purpose of making the ascent of st elias only dates from eighteen eighty six and was organized by the new york times it consisted of messieurs f schwatka w libby and an englishman lieutenant h w seton carr they made the passage to yakutat in the pinta of the u s navy on july seventeenth they sailed from the bay in indian canoes followed the pacific coast the mouth of the yahtse river south of st elias and at no little risk effected a landing through the surf they brought two white porters and four indians keeping to the eastern side of the extensive delta of mud stones and sand intersected by numberless branches of the yahtse they reached the point where the river issues by a great tunnel out of the glacier and climbed to the edge of the frozen plateau which is covered with a thick stratum of moraine detritus the ice tunnel through which the river runs is about eight miles long and ends at the foot of certain heights which the explorers name the shea hills the course of the tunnel is indicated by a depression in the surface overhead caused by the junction of lateral moraines of the two glaciers which flow down to the coast on either side of the otzi the glaciers themselves actually join overhead forming the ice roof of the tunnel the expedition gave the name of guyot to the glacier on the west side of the otzi and agassiz to that on the east the latter however is really the western extremity of the malaspina glacier at the feet of the shea hills in the deep hollow dividing them from the guyot and agassiz glaciers two swift torrents rush down and uniting their waters at the south end of the range form a lake to which the explorers gave the name of cayetani in honor of don honorato cayetani duke of Sermoneta, at that time president of the italian geographical society footnote 
in the account given by h w seton carr and in the map of this region prepared subsequently by h w topham by some mistake the word castani has been erroneously substituted for cayetani a well-known name in italy End footnote. the river yahtse issues from this lake only to plunge into the tunnel just described whenever this subglacial passage becomes choked with ice blocks and moraine material lake cayetani overflows and then a good portion of the river makes its way towards the sea over the surface of the glacier once the passage cleared the whole river again disappears beneath the ice while the lake shrinks and sometimes disappears altogether the caravan first marched to the western end of the shea range then having dwindled to three men i e schwatka setonkar and one of the white porters it crossed the tyndall glacier which flows straight down the southwest flank of st elias and gaining the chain of hills bounding the mountain to the west began to ascend their slope Schwatka came to a halt at about 5,800 feet. Seton Carr proceeded alone and reached the top of the ridge at about 7,200 feet, but cloudy weather and the lateness of the hour compelled him to retreat. The enterprise was plainly impossible with the means at their disposal, and it was decided to return to the coast, 16 miles away. On the 30th of July, after some abortive attempts, the little band succeeded in putting out to sea, but were obliged to leave their baggage behind. This expedition had taken fourteen days, and had been favored by exceptionally dry weather. The results obtained by it consisted of a sketch map of the region, and the first stock of reliable observations on the nature of the country, and the difficulties to be overcome in exploring it. Two years later, the attempt was repeated by the English Alpinists, Messrs. W. H. and E. Topham, and G. Broke, together with Mr. W. Williams of New York sailing from sitka on the third of july eighteen eighty eight in a small schooner they reached yakutat in seven days proceeding thence in indian canoes they landed on the thirteenth near the mouth of the yahtse about fifty-five miles east of port mulgrave the very point where schwatka had disembarked the surf was not very high at the time and the landing was made without trouble but fifteen hours later it would have been impossible the explorers with their party consisting of four white porters and six indians followed the same course taken by schwatka as far as the shea hills then bearing eastward they climbed a glacier that girdles the base of the southeast wall of st elias at a level of fifteen hundred to two thousand feet and pours into the malaspina with an ice cascade a thousand feet high this glacier they named after libby a string of low hills connecting the shea range with the southern face of st elias separates it to the west from the tyndall glacier discovered by schwatka but the explorers soon perceived that it was impossible to make the ascent of the precipitous southeast flank which rose to over sixteen thousand feet and was rendered unapproachable by masses of snow and ice which fell constantly in formidable avalanches sweeping the rock wall from top to bottom accordingly they went back to lake cayetani and followed the course taken by schwatka as far as the western side of the tyndall glacier carr's hills which seton carr had reached here broke was obliged to halt having broken his snow spectacles the others recrossed the glacier and camped at the foot of the south bastion of st elias exactly beneath the point where the ridge curves round and forms the amphitheatre which was mistaken for a crater after one failure they managed to win the crest of the ridge it was covered with thick snow over which they proceeded cutting steps in the steeper places about two o'clock p m they reached the northern side of the amphitheatre where the ridge ceases to bend and runs almost straight up to the summit their aneroid and boiling point thermometer registered a height of eleven thousand four hundred and sixty feet here the ridge rose in a very steep cliff fifteen hundred feet high and almost entirely coated with blue ice which would have required several hours of step cutting beyond at about seven thousand feet above this cliff soared the summit capped with snow and bordered by a huge cornice it was hopeless to think of winning the peak that day and very reluctantly the explorers returned to their camp the point of the ridge which they had reached and which when seen from below appeared to be a separate peak dominating the amphitheatre to the north was named by them hayden's peak the walls of this amphitheatre are almost vertical composed of stratified rock 
striated and furrowed by the continual falls of stones and detritus produced by the process of disintegration the bottom of the hollow is filled by a glacier which flows out through an opening to the east the whole extent of the southwest face of st elias was visible from the ridge and seemed no less inaccessible than the southeast face no rocks showed any trace of volcanic action the expedition employed five days in regaining the coast and reached yakutat the tenth of august after nearly a month's absence the time had come for scientific societies to reinforce private enterprise in the work of exploration with the larger funds at their disposal they could afford to either assist or even to actually fit out expeditions on their own account for the purpose of surveying the country and studying its interesting natural phenomena in eighteen ninety the united states national geographical society and the geological survey united to send an expedition to the st elias region under the direction of professor j c russell a well-known writer on glacial geology and one of the explorers of the yukon basin mr m b kerr was to accompany him as topographer to the expedition professor russell made the best use of the lessons learnt from the experiences of former explorers his expedition was organized at seattle supplies for three months were packed in hermetically sealed tins to prevent them from being spoiled by the excessive dampness of the climate during the long journey over snow and ice the light equipment including tents waterproofs blankets special petroleum stoves and a good stock of fuel would have enabled the expedition to spend many days at a high level above the line of vegetation it had been found that the indians accompanying former expeditions while very useful in the lowlands were totally unfitted for mountain work accordingly professor russell enlisted six american porters at seattle led by j h christie finally the expedition was supplied with the necessary instruments for topographical survey the party started from seattle on the sixteenth of june and reached port mulgrave on the twenty seventh making the passage from sitka to yakutat on the u s a pinta early on the twenty eighth they put to sea in canoes skirting the east side of the bay between the islands and the shore crossed the mouth of disenchantment bay on the first of july and landed at the northwest corner of yakutat bay at the base of the eastern spurs of the cook chain although so far from the mouth of the bay they found the beach lined by white breakers luckily not formidable enough to prevent landing in ordinary weather numerous iceberg fragments of the glaciers which thrust their snouts into the waters of disenchantment bay are caught by the waves and currents and driven in upon the beach at the head of yakutat bay in great storms the waves rushing into the bay lift the floating masses and toss them far up on the shore the clashing of the blocks of ice as they collide joined with the howling of the wind and the roar of the sea creates an appalling tumult after leaving their first camp russell took a westerly course and scaled the successive southern spurs of the cook chain and crossed the snouts of many confluents of the malaspina glacier which flow down between these spurs here the ice was almost concealed under a stratum of moraine consisting of detritus pebbles together with boulders of every size many small lakes occur in these frontal moraines and streams of water which issue from ice caves and run in the open for some distance before disappearing into other tunnels russell named these glaciers going from east to west the black galliano atrevida lucia hayden and marvine in the center of the frontal moraine of the latter a jutting spur forms an island covered with firs which shelter a luxuriant vegetation gay with myriads of flowers russell christened this blossom island and fixed a base camp there with a store of food to be carried up later as required by detachments of porters from the shore to Blossom Island was a thirty-one days' march. The porters had to make many journeys from one camping place to another to carry forward all the equipment. Meanwhile, Russell and Kerr had been occupied in geological investigations and topographical surveys, which often led them far out of their definite track. Everywhere, Russell discovered the evidence of the shrinkage of the glaciers ledges in the rock walls of the various valleys indicating the height formerly reached by the ice beds some seven hundred to eight hundred feet above their actual level marvine glacier at the foot of which stands blossom island flows direct from the south face of mount cook and is bounded to the west by a long spur that projects far into the malaspina bearing from northeast to southwest 
this spur is cleft midway by a deep ravine the southern half thus quite separated forms as it were a distinct chain about eight miles long russell named this the hitchcock range and the cleft pinnacle pass on account of some sharp peaks which dominate it to the north the pass is barely two hundred to three hundred feet wide and is four thousand feet above the sea two glaciers flow down from it one an affluent of the marvine steep and much crevassed running east the other flowing westward at a gentler angle and falling into a huge ice stream of far larger dimensions than the rest of the malaspina affluents to which russell gave the name of seward glacier the vanguard of the expedition crossed pinnacle pass on the fifth august after a night's halt on the marvine glacier where they had been in serious danger from a fall of stones caused by a violent rainstorm bad weather and the necessity of awaiting the arrival of stores from the lower camps confined russell and kerr several days to the neighborhood of the pass they gave the name of mount logan to a mighty peak north of the augusta chain and two peaks rising on the northern branch of the cook range were called mount owen and mount irving between august the thirteenth and sixteenth russell effected a passage from the seward to the agassiz glaciers by following a depression in the spur samovar hills dividing one from the other the two snow domes which crown this col won for it the name of dome pass four thousand three hundred feet here the explorers saw before them an open valley filled by a glacier that flows into the agassiz in a great cascade of seracs after crossing this they looked straight up to mount st elias with no intervening obstacles to impede the view and the route to the summit seemed clearly traced the valley they had entered was formed by two ridges of the mountain and was shut in at the end by a wall which led to a spacious col between the cone of st elias on the south and a lower summit to the north to the latter and to the glacier filling the valley russell gave the name of newton the divide was connected with a peak of mount st elias by a long ridge which seemed to offer a comparatively easy passage but the newton glacier furrowed with numerous wide crevasses and formidable cascade-like seracs was prepared to oppose a fierce resistance to the desired conquest on reaching the second cascade after several hours struggle through the labyrinth of ice blocks and among enormous crevasses barring the way in every direction they were compelled to take a very perilous route skirting the south wall of the valley where avalanches of snow and ice fall down from the slopes above with great frequency halfway up the glacier a spur projecting some distance across the valley presented an apparently insurmountable obstacle after repeated attempts they contrived to hitch a rope over the crag of a vertical cliff and were thus enabled to climb to the second newton plateau and haul up their packs one more ice-fall alone separated them from the terminal wall mounting to the coal when bad weather joined with the difficulties of the glacier in checking the progress of the little band during the whole of august twenty second and twenty third it snowed incessantly so that russell and kerr who had started from the highest camp to attack the peak were obliged to descend to the foot of the cliff rope cliff to which they had fixed their cord when the weather cleared on the twenty fifth they resumed the attack while the two men who had come up with them went down to fetch supplies from a lower camp after several hours march russell and kerr discovered that they had very little petroleum left this was a serious blow at a level where without fuel water was not to be obtained fire was needed also to enable them to warm themselves with hot tea or coffee and bake their raw flour in this emergency Russell decided to push on alone as far as the point whence the snowstorm had driven them, and to wait there while Kerr dashed down to catch up with the porters and get the petroleum from them. As evening fell, Russell halted, tired out, rigged up his tent, and went to sleep. During the night it began to snow again, and continued for two days. The flakes fell thickly and continuously until the tent was half buried, the sides bending in beneath the heavy weight russell had no longer room to lie within and was forced to hollow out a chamber in the snow having no petroleum he contrived to make a feeble fire by means of a rag dipped in melted bacon for six days he remained alone in the waste of snow then as the weather had cleared and none of his comrades appeared he went down the mountain to seek them leaving his tent behind after a few hours he met the porters coming up guided by kerr the blinding snowfall had detained the latter at rope cliff during three whole days 
with neither shelter nor fuel and for the last thirty hours no food save raw flour the men only joined him on the twenty ninth of august there was nothing for it but to bow to fate in spite of russell's tenacious and often rash courage there was no longer any hope of conquering the peak the weather being almost continuously bad the newly fallen snow remained so soft that getting through it was very slow and exhausting work waterproofs were an insufficient protection from the damp and both clothes and blankets had been soaked through for days the transport of supplies was also becoming very difficult besides the glare of snow had affected the eyes of most of the party and in spite of their smoked spectacles they could hardly endure the light the return journey began on the first of september kerr who was broken down by the days and nights he had spent without shelter in the snow went straight back to the coast russell however made one more excursion up the seward glacier to the northwest spur of mount owen and another from blossom island some miles distance on the malaspina for the purpose of studying its glacial phenomena the rain was almost incessant during his whole descent he reached the shore on the fifteenth of september on the twenty third he embarked in the corwin sent expressly to convey the expedition back to the united states the interest roused by russell's scientific report on the region he had inspected was so great that the geographical society and the geological survey decided to dispatch him thither again in the following year in order that he might collect additional scientific data extend his field of exploration and renew the attack on mount st elias accordingly on the fourth of june eighteen ninety one russell and six white porters put into yakutat on the u s a bear this time he resolved to follow the example of messrs schwatka and topham by landing at a point of the coast near mount st elias by the mouth of the yahtse river but while disembarking a heavy disaster occurred either the surf was stronger than usual or the bears boats were less fitted for landing than light indian canoes be it as it may the first two boats were capsized by the breakers and six of the party drowned one of mr russell's porters was among the victims on the following day the attempt was renewed and this time with success russell went ashore on the eighth of june by the tenth all the baggage had been carried to the edge of the malaspina moraine this was covered by so dense a forest that they were forced to work with hatchets for a whole day to cut a passage by the twentieth of june everything had been conveyed across the moraine to the brink of the bare ice during the work of transport russell spent several days on the shea hills studying their geological formation and building a sledge to facilitate the porterage of stores over the snow then pushing on to the extreme southwest corner of the samovar hills july twelfth he reascended the agassiz glacier to the foot of the ice cascade which terminates the newton glacier this he had reached the preceding year in coming down from the dome pass he was familiar with the route beyond this point up the newton valley and aware of the difficulties to be encountered climbing all the ice cascades in succession and crossing the intervening plateaus he came to the foot of the last cascade where he had on the previous occasion passed those six days of solitary confinement in danger of being buried under the snow this last difficulty also overcome he reached the upper amphitheatre of the glacier on the twentieth of july and planted his upper camp there at the height of a little over eight thousand feet it had taken him eight days to attain this level from the foot of the agassiz glacier and almost six weeks from the coast he and his two porters stayed twelve days at this camp with almost continual bad weather so that he had only one opportunity on the twenty fourth of august of attempting the ascent starting with his men at two o'clock a m twenty fourth august he made for the head of the valley where it is barred by an ice wall rising to the divide between mount st elias and mount newton this ascent was so steep that steps had to be cut nearly the whole way up while great transversal crevasses added much to the difficulty of the climb at some parts of the ascent they had to pass under overhanging masses of ice threatening them with avalanches finally at midday the party landed safely on the col after a short rest they attacked the broad ridge that runs thence straight up to the summit of mount st elias but soon they grew tired it was rather late in the afternoon and the peak still soared high above them although they had already climbed a great distance from the camp to be overtaken by nightfall without any shelter at such an altitude would have involved too serious a risk the more so as slight vapors beginning to cloud the hitherto perfectly clear sky threatened a change in the weather 
so with the deepest reluctance russell was obliged to give up all hope of completing the ascent that day it was four o'clock p m and the expedition had reached the height of fourteen thousand five hundred feet night had already fallen when they got down to their tent in a very wearied condition the presage of evil weather was fulfilled on the following day russell had planned to carry the tent and the supplies to the divide being convinced of the impossibility of covering in one day with the force at his disposal and without intervals of rest the distance from the base plateau to the top the weather having slightly improved on the twenty eighth the party started off again laden with supplies in order to establish their station on the coal but newly fallen snow had formed a heavy layer on the steep sides of the amphitheatre and this was now breaking into innumerable avalanches which swept down to the valley with irresistible force there was danger on all sides from the precipices of mount st elias and mount newton and even from the coal to which the party was ascending russell felt that it would be too great a risk to proceed and so returned to the camp where dense snowfalls during the ensuing days finally destroyed every hope of success on the first of august retreat was decided upon the only digression from the downward route was a short excursion made to the libby glacier and the cliffs connecting the shea hills with the southern front of mount st elias by the tenth the expedition had reached the shore of icy bay where it had landed two months earlier russell stayed there a week for the purpose of measuring by triangulation the heights of the chief summits of the group the altitude of mount st elias was calculated at eighteen thousand one hundred feet with a possible error of one hundred feet more or less the expedition resumed its march on the nineteenth of august along the pacific coast in the direction of yakutat bay sometimes over the pebbly beach at other times through dense undergrowth in the woods often fording torrents where the icy water was more than waist-high and occasionally marching in the open over the moraine that covers the whole front of the malaspina glacier reaching cape manby on the twenty seventh the explorers turned off from the pacific coast to follow the west shore of yakutat bay and at last on the first of september reached the head of the gulf which had been the starting point of their expedition in the preceding year here russell found an indian canoe with a deposit of food supplied by the missionary of yakutat rev hendrickson he was thus enabled to make a thorough exploration of disenchantment bay into which no previous traveller had penetrated to any great distance he discovered that it winds a long way inland among the mountains forming two sharp angles in turning from west to east and from north to south three great glaciers flow down into it the dalton hubbard and nunatak glaciers in malaspina's time seventeen ninety two these glaciers entirely choked the east arm of the bay and extended to the island of hankey to the south the bay lengthens into a fjord penetrating into a large valley also formerly filled with ice from a glacier that flowed southwards and which probably formed a great ice sheet similar to malaspina glacier on the plateau overhanging the east coast of yakutat bay on the fifteenth of september russell re-entered the village of yakutat and on the first of october he steamed out of the bay on the u s a pinta and reached seattle on the twenty first after nearly five months absence in this brief summary of the two expeditions which have so largely contributed to the world's knowledge regarding the mount st elias region i have scarcely touched upon mr russell's geological discoveries or his observations on glacial phenomena they are to be found in full in published reports of the geographical society and the geological survey in describing the course taken by his royal highness's expedition i shall have frequent occasion to refer to those works meanwhile the foregoing historical sketch will suffice i think to furnish a general idea of the character of the region to which we were bound and the nature of the task we were about to accomplish under the guidance of our chief his royal highness the duke of the abruzzi End of chapter four Chapter Five of the Ascent of Mount Saint Elias, Alaska, by Filippo de Filippi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Malaspina Glacier. At two o'clock a.m. on the twenty-third June, the Bertha steamed from Port Mulgrave with the schooner Aggie in tow. Warned by the experiences of our predecessors as to the difficulty of landing on the Pacific coast and more especially by the catastrophe that had saddened russell's second expedition at the start 
together with the uncertainty as to the state of sea and surf on the southern shore his royal highness decided to disembark on the west coast of yakutat bay in spite of its being several miles farther from st elias than the landing place on the pacific footnote his royal highness had hoped at first to be able to land on the southern shore of the plateau at a point where the force of the breakers was broken by a sheltering sandbank marked on the chart of the u s coast survey northwest coast of america sheet number two as lying off the coast opposite the mouth of a small creek due east of icy cape but we ascertained at yakutat that no such sandbank existed and that the coast is unsheltered throughout its length End footnote we were to land a few miles north of cape manby by the mouth of the glacial torrent osar near the mouth of the bay from that point his royal highness hoped to find a tolerably easy track up to the malaspina plateau and thence to cross the great glacier rapidly conveying all the camp material and a sufficient supply of food on the four sledges comprised in our equipment previous explorers had always tried to land as near as possible to the spurs of the mountain in order to avoid camping on the open glacier and continue to make use of the fuel ready to hand on the thickly wooded lower slopes as long as possible but what with prolonged marches over the loose sharp-edged stones of the moraine and considerable waste of time and strength involved in going to and fro to carry up heavy loads of supplies they had paid a heavy price for these advantages mr h s bryant of philadelphia with a party of seven men had landed ten days before us at the same point for which we were bound also with the purpose of attempting the ascent to mount st elias at yakutat we had taken on board one of the indians who had crossed the bay with mr bryant thinking he might be of use in identifying the landing place we were barely one hour from port when the bertha was stopped in the middle of the bay by a thick fog so we passed the whole morning fuming at the delay finally about two o'clock p m the air cleared a little and allowed us a glimpse of the malaspina coastline a few miles off straight before us lay a low beach white with breakers and backed by the dark rampart of the malaspina moraine some three hundred feet in height and flecked with snow farther inland under a thick bank of fog we could distinguish the lower portion of the cook chain with great glaciers tributaries of the malaspina filling all its ravines very gradually we approached the shore searching for a landing place the indian who was to have acted as pilot remained stupidly inert and gave no sign of recognizing the coast at three thirty lieutenant cogney went off in a boat to examine the beach and presently returned with bad news at six hundred feet from the shore he touched bottom with his oars while a line of dangerous surf cut him off from land meanwhile we had ascertained that the current caused by the high tide had driven us into the bay during the early morning and that we must now steer south to make point manby so we steamed on sounding continually scattered trees now appeared on the low coast stretching between the base of the moraine and the sea and soon increased to dense forests near point manby at five o'clock we finally discern the mouth of the osar framed by thick pine forests cogni again puts off in the boat and presently signals that he has found a landing here we obtain our first glimpse of mount st elias distant shadowy and magnified to proportions so gigantic by the mist that we look up at it with astonishment mingled with awe the boats immediately put out from the schooner and with these and a large boat kindly lent us with her crew by the captain of the bertha our cases of stores are rapidly landed the first crew ashore stand waist deep in water ready to haul up each boat as it rides in on the crest of the surf and so the landing is accomplished without accident and all the baggage arrives safe and dry his royal highness leaves the schooner about eight p m and comes on shore by the last boat the bertha now left us for disenchantment bay whence mr hendrickson who came on board at yakutat had promised to send us some indian hunters to help in carrying our stores to the frozen plateau the aggie meantime sailed for port mulgrave where she was to remain in harbor during our absence with orders to return to our landing place by the tenth of august in case of further instructions being needed his royal highness had requested mr hendrickson to send a few indians every five days to the mouth of the osar from the end of july onward 
in two hours time the whole of our equipment is piled in the lee of a grass-grown sand hill some fifty feet in height out of reach of the tide and sheltered from sudden gusts of wind we pitched our first camp on a little spit of sand by a tributary of the osar all the stores and munitions are heaped about us in utmost disorder cases of provisions photographic machines medicine chests knapsack frames snowshoes sledge runners cooking stoves bags of clothing ropes hatchets and a hundred miscellaneous articles while our soup is being prepared over a gypsy fire we strive to reduce the general chaos to some kind of order stow away under mackintosh everything that needs protection from rain and so on and then about midnight seek rest in our tents early the next morning june twenty fourth his royal highness left camp attended by gonela and the guide pedagax to prospect a route to the moraine meanwhile we set to work rearranging the whole of our equipment pitching a tent in a sheltered part of the forest we pack it with the reserve stores which are to be left behind part of the photographic scientific and medical apparatus some weapons and a store of provisions in case bad weather should retard our embarkation on returning from the mountains accordingly all the cases had to be opened their contents sorted divided and registered next the first loads had to be packed ready for the porters to carry to the foot of the moraine by whatever track his royal highness should decide to take we were assisted in this work by the american porters whom we had hardly seen before as they had travelled with our guides on board the aggie their major ingram a tall lean man about forty years of age of robust constitution and great force of character who was in charge of them proved of the utmost service to the expedition indeed his active and intelligent efforts together with the hearty cooperation of his chosen band had no small share in its success these ten sturdy fellows formed a queer group such as could scarcely have been got together in any other country four of them were university students four were sailors one of whom was a swede another an italian one gold digger and one poet german by birth who had earned his bread by teaching classics and then become a sailor their names were c l andrews alexander bino f fiorini carl e morford ralph e nichols alan ostroff v schmidt w steele and c w thornton his royal highness returned to camp about one o'clock p m and the guides and porters immediately set off with the first loads while we finished our arrangements amid violent explosions of wrath against the swarms of voracious mosquitoes which had tormented us incessantly from the moment we landed all sorts of ointments were tried in vain neither nets nor veils could save us from their stings the pertinacious insects penetrated our clothes up our sleeves down our necks and completely exhausted our patience no wonder that writers on alaska describe them as the scourges of the land instances are given of travellers being killed by them poisoned by thousands of stings worn out by frantic struggles with the invincible foe of deer leaping into rivers to escape the mosquito torture petroff while it is asserted that bears have been known to scratch themselves to death maddened with pain even the indians suffer from the stings although they get some protection by smearing themselves all over with rancid oil a surveying signal is set up on the sand hill behind the camp just opposite across the little torrent running near our tents stands a wooden hut used as a refuge by indian hunters the edge of the forest is only a few yards from our encampment beyond a slip of pasture where strawberries and dwarf raspberries are in bloom half concealed by tall grasses and weeds a heavy blanket of fog hangs over us all day but fortunately there is no rain cogni has arranged his meteorological instruments between two tents and has begun a series of observations while sela has pitched his dark tent in order to change his photographic plates evening closes in very slowly the porters back from their first trip are singing songs round the fire in the soft twilight that lasts far into the night the deep stillness about us is only broken by the sharp cry of a stray gull or sea fowl the temperature is mild almost always about forty seven to fifty degrees fahrenheit early next morning four indian porters arrived sent by hendrickson and with their help a good part of the camp material was carried up to the base of the moraine during the day 
crossing the tributary of the osar on a trunk bridge made by our men we follow the right bank of the river sometimes tramping through the sand and small shingle of its wide bed sometimes skirting the edge of the forest among huge fallen trees thick brush rich beds of fern under the firs and over an elastic carpet of pine needles and moss starred with bright colored flowers the osar is one of many streams issuing from the malaspina channel seaming the belt of land between the glacier and the sea depositing great masses of glacial detritus by the way and sometimes burying in their delta whole tracts of forest most of the larger streams come down from the south flank of the plateau and pour into the pacific so great a volume of muddy water that the sea is discolored for several miles distance from the shore and at more than a mile out the surface of the ocean consists of fresh water the biggest of these rivers is the yahtse whose delta has now completely filled up a bay that existed in malaspina's and vancouver's time icy bay and of which the record is preserved in a legend of the akatat indians these rivers issue from the glacier either in a single body of water or in several branches some gushing out at the base of the bastion formed by the moraine others from the ice wall itself at different heights dashing down from ice caves in grand cascades occasionally after running through a long series of underground passages from the upper valleys to the coast these torrents are forced to the surface at such high pressure that they shoot upwards like colossal fountains with huge columns of spray whatever their origin they generally divide into numerous branches between the moraine and the sea and after intersecting the forest in every direction unite in one or more great streams before reaching the sea fortunately for us the osar comes down from the moraine almost undivided and so we are spared the trouble of fording icy floods often a very difficult passage from the strength and depth of the current foreseeing obstacles of this nature we were provided with india rubber trousers coming up above the waist and joined to high waterproof wading boots but these were only brought into use on the preliminary march by his royal highness and his party in crossing the river to explore the left bank where they found traces of bryant's first camp it is difficult to give an adequate idea of the luxuriant vegetation covering the narrow strip of land between the beach and the moraine the forest begins at a few yards from the sea edged by groves of undersized trees such as alder ash small firs dwarf poplars and a few willows the rank grass all about is a perfect carpet of flowers interspersed with flourishing plots of strawberries and raspberries rubus arcticus but just beyond the fringe of scattered greenery we come to the real forest here the branches of mighty firs draped with moss and lichen meet overhead in so thickly tangled a canopy that hardly one ray of sunlight pierces through it underneath the air is that of a damp hothouse and all the intervening space is filled with innumerable varieties of shrubs ferns six to eight feet high a splenium fungi and myriads of flowers jeweling the soft spongy layer of mosses and lichens that carpets the whole forest floor it is too early in the season for fruits and berries everything is in full blossom currant and gooseberry bushes and a tall plant like celery archangelica with towering white flowers of which the indians eat the leaves and here and there the humble whortleberry vaccidium macrocarpum as yet without berries the devil's club panax horridum is a formidable prickly plant whose wide flat leaves are thickly set with thorns and whose stems crawl on the ground for a bit and then shoot up to a height of ten to fifteen feet it is easy to stumble over these creepers and get painfully scratched by the fall low branches and prostrate trunks make the forest impenetrable except by slow hard labor with the axe hawks ravens magpies flights of wild geese ducks gulls and small birds add a note of cheerfulness and complete the picture of luxuriant life our march followed the curves of the osar in a northwesterly direction the ascent from the beach to the moraine about three miles distance is very slight hardly rising a hundred and fifty feet on the river sand and at the foot of the moraine we found many large bear tracks but we are too numerous and noisy to have a chance of surprising this big game there are at least two varieties here the brown and the silver bear also known as the st elias bear the latter is of enormous size mr russell saw two as big as polar bears 
with footmarks nine to seventeen inches in width and a length of stride no less than sixty-four inches at the point where we emerged from the forest it ends abruptly some thirty feet from the moraine but in many places particularly on the south flank of the plateau it has gradually pushed up into it invading wide areas with firs and alders which find nourishment in the layer of soil detritus and moraine debris covering the ice which is sometimes more than a thousand feet in depth our second camp is pitched on the bank of a small torrent one of the sources of the osar running through the boundary of forest and moraine footnote we found many trout in the waters of this torrent End footnote. here the landscape offers contrasts scarcely to be seen elsewhere the forest stretched before us in masses of sombre verdure while behind us the moraine a vision of barrenness and desolation sloped upwards with its undulating wastes of stones mud and sand seen by innumerable watercourses which have worn their way down the bed of ice over this all our stores and materials must be carried up to the edge of the open glacier which showed its white fringe of snow at a distance of about four miles and some three hundred feet above the camp this stage proved longer and more fatiguing than the first march and as it was impossible to cover the whole distance twice in the day we arranged to go daily once to the glacier once back to camp and once to a halfway point where we left our loads to be carried up the rest of the way the following morning his royal highness and the whole caravan started from camp every morning leaving only one or two persons behind to attend to the camp and prepare our food the loads were proportioned to our strength ranging from twenty to fifty pounds in weight for ourselves from forty five to fifty five pounds for the guides and porters the loads were strapped on light wooden frames which distributed the weight evenly on the shoulders and back leaving the chest and breathing free and on which packages of any shape can be easily fitted and balanced the indians although undersized carried heavier weights than our men could manage i e from sixty to sixty eight pounds without a word of complaint they did not use the frames but preferred to fasten the loads on their backs by means of two straps coming over the shoulders and crossing over the chest a system that compelled them to walk in a stooping posture they were shod with moccasins of undressed sealskin with the fur inside unfitted for tramping over this waste of sharp-edged stones which bruised our own feet in spite of our heavy boots the moraine began just behind the camp and sloped gently up to the frozen plateau forming wide hollows and high ridges at a right angle to the line of the glacier the layers of stones and detritus are very unequally distributed at some points they are so thin that the ice beneath shows through at others they cover it thickly with boulders and splinters of rock in jumbled heaps big stones three feet and more in diameter are generally found lying at the base of steep ridges others being poised on the top ready to fall with the melting of the ice they rest upon in the wide hollows between the ridges the surface of the moraine is very uneven there are numerous small lakes almost circular either without any outlet or else traversed by torrents and varying in size from mere pools to stretches of water exceeding three hundred feet in diameter some lie on the surface of the moraine others at different depths beneath and these latter occupy funnel-shaped cavities with banks sixty to seventy feet high the water is dark and turbid owing to the sand mud and stones continually falling from the slopes above torrents loaded with sediment pour from ice tunnels churning the pebbles beneath in their downward rush sometimes disappearing again in the depths of some fissure before finally bursting forth from the moraine the slopes are perpetually if slowly modified by the melting of the ice and the glacier's rate of motion the torrents often change their course forming new channels while their old beds may be traced by the rounded pebbles which contrast with the sharp cornered stones peculiar to the moraine new lakes are formed and old ones emptied by the creation of fresh outlets or the opening of new crevasses in the ice beneath leaving the fine sand of the bed exposed to view thus the entire surface of the moraine is continually shifting and changing moving and turning over the masses of stone breaking them into ever smaller fragments and finally crushing them into fine sand and mud during the hot hours of the day when the ice melts most rapidly you hear the continual crash of falling stones 
and the whizzing sound of detritus sliding on icy slopes mingled with the murmur of torrents the dash of cascades and the muffled reports caused by the cracking of the ice in our first marches over the moraine we often went through the surface to our knees or higher in the dense mud which in places covers whole tracts of ice or again forms actual mud torrents which are not to be detected at once as they are of the same colour as the moraine and are studded with big boulders which float on the viscid surface every part of this stony desert presents the same characteristics its general aspect indeed is so uniform that it is not easy to follow the same track twice only after repeated journeys over the moraine were we able to recognize this or that big rock and use it as a landmark we were following the general line of the great ridges in a northwesterly direction between their extremities and the glacier itself lay a depression beyond which a final slope of moraine led up to the frozen plateau to this we climbed by a gully filled with snow and deposited our loads on a small platform of ice covered by a thin layer of stones close to the edge of the snow overlapping the glacier the whole front of the malaspina along the pacific coast and yakutat bay about eighty miles in extent is girdled by a belt of moraine four to six miles wide and everywhere of the same general character as that which we have described nevertheless the southern edge of the glacier does not finish in an easy slope as on the edge facing the bay but ends suddenly in a steep cliff some one hundred and fifty to three hundred feet high during these first days of hard labor we were favored by the weather for although the early mornings were usually so foggy as to shut off the view in every direction the afternoon hours were warm and sunny our evenings in camp were enchanting after the long day's toil up and down the moraine including the indian porters we form a party of twenty-five and our camp is very lively our ten tents are pitched near together in groups of three or four and all our different tasks are carried on outside them there is a cross-fire of shouts and orders to the men regular strokes of the axe resound from the neighboring forest where a guide is cutting wood now and then accompanied by the melancholy cry of a small bird the zonotrichia coronata palace which has three distinct notes with a curious rhythm some of the men are attending to the fires others cooking hanging out the wash mending clothes or putting things in order while a few lie stretched on the ground enjoying a quiet chat our four indians small thick-set men are so exactly alike that they seem turned out of the same mould the development of arms and chests is exaggerated in comparison with the rest of the body owing to the constant work at the oars entailed by their life on the water they either sit together in a separate group patching their moccasins or loaf round the camp with contented smiling faces peeping inquisitively into the tents and speaking incomprehensible words to us in their guttural tongue full of l's and k's one of them however knows a little english and acts as an interpreter to the rest their language has lost nearly all its special characteristics owing to frequent contact with french and russian travellers sailors trappers and whalers these indians speak a jargon known as chinook now common to all the aborigines of the region and long used as the language of commerce on the coast of british columbia oregon and washington state the constant substitution of l for r and p for c gives the dialect a certain infantile stamp one honourable trait of the indians character is honesty they steal nothing not even food and this verdict is confirmed by every one who has employed them all expeditions such as our own have had to leave stores of provisions tents etc in spots easily to be discovered by the indians yet these caches are always found undisturbed and with no single article missing by the evening of the twenty ninth june the whole of our baggage had been carried up to the edge of the plateau about five hundred feet above sea level six days work had been required for this portage from the shore the weather was cloudy and the misty atmosphere seemed to increase the vastness of the dead white level stretching away to the horizon in front of us the temperature was almost down to thirty two degrees we cleared a patch of ground of its biggest boulders pitched our tents on the layer of detritus covering the ice and as it was impossible to plant the poles in the hard ice we made the ropes fast round the biggest rocks at hand this was our first camp without a fire our soup was cooked by the petroleum stoves the indians now left us 
his royal highness had commissioned them to fetch another ten days supply of food from the depot left on the shore in order that the caravans told off to supply our successive camps might be spared the necessity of going down to the sea we were at the east side of the plateau on the part of the main glacier discovered in eighteen seventy four by the hydrographic expedition under messrs dahl and baker and to which they had given the name of malaspina later on russell embraced both the agassiz and guillot glaciers discovered by the schwatka expedition under this name the latter names he previously applied exclusively to tributaries from the st elias and cook chains according to mr russell's view the malaspina belongs to a class of glaciers designated by him piedmont glaciers to be distinguished from the alpine type consisting of affluents flowing down into valleys delineated in this fashion the malaspina is divided into three wide lobes which are merely the widened snouts of the great glaciers which flow down to the plateau from the mountains the eastern division chiefly fed by the seward glacier has a general movement from west to east and at one point pushes down to the pacific ocean the edge of its frontal moraine dipping into the sea for an extent of four miles along the coast the central portion is chiefly fed by the agassiz glacier it flows southwest and is bounded throughout its course by forest and moraine lastly the western lobe formed by the spreading of the tyndall and guillot glaciers runs southwards thrusting out into the ocean a sheer cliff of ice three hundred feet in height known as icy cape huge fragments of ice are almost perpetually breaking off and falling into the sea with thunderous reports which are heard twenty miles away two great moraines start from the extremity of the samovar hills and run into the frontal moraine between the lobes of the malaspina this frozen plateau is of such enormous extent that figures almost fail to give an exact idea of its dimensions it stretches from yakutat bay for more than seventy miles to the east measures from twenty to twenty-five miles in width and its surface extends over more than fifteen hundred square miles mr russell has proved that the plateau on which the glacier rests owes its formation to two causes first to the enormous quantity of sediment deposited by the water beneath the glacier and at its front secondly to the gradual rise and elevation of the whole of this region shared by the coast in this way the size of the plateau is continually on the increase so that the bay which still existed to the east of icy cape a hundred years ago is now reduced to an insignificant cove various indications led mr russell to conclude that the malaspina glacier is gradually shrinking he infers this from the immobility of the margins which are overgrown with vegetation and from the presence of large tracts of long abandoned moraine deposits in the thick forest the uniform distribution of these deposits over the soil proves that the process of shrinkage has been very slow and gradual besides the east rim of the glacier towards yakutat bay gets thinner and thinner as it nears the edge in a gentle slope covered with a uniform layer of moraine characteristics quite opposed to those observed in the fronts of growing glaciers mr russell records the disappearance of two capes formerly existing on the pacific coast cape ryu and cape sitkagi formed by the advance of the glacier into the ocean this change however may have been partly brought about by the growth of the plateau and the disappearance of certain inlets of the coast which has consequently become rectilinear there has been a recent advance of the glacier at two points near the shea hills and in the vicinity of point mamby where the ice has travelled about fifteen hundred feet into the forest and uprooted a great many trees these forward movements may have been produced by variations of declivity caused by upheaval of the soil which may have altered the conditions of the glacier's downward flow possibly at other points the same reason may have caused the edge of the glacier to remain stationary or even to shrink the glacier before us was apparently quite level covered by a thick stratum of snow and with no visible crevasses russell on the contrary in eighteen ninety one had found the edge of the glacier already bare of snow and the moraines uncovered to a great extent as early as the twentieth of june putting together the sledges and testing their capabilities proved very tedious work we possessed four sledges measuring five and seven feet in length they had two vertical wooden iron-shod runners united by crossbars 
the ends of which were fitted into the upper edge of the runners and secured in place by several turns of rope passing through holes in runner and crossbar two small wooden rods fixed obliquely at both ends of the sledge between the center of the outer bars and the runners kept the whole framework tight these strong and very heavy sledges were more adapted for traveling upon bare ice than upon snow where the narrow runners only about one inch wide sank deep and caused great increase of friction this defect was partly remedied by widening the runners by means of slips of wood fixed to their sides another fault discovered on the very first trial of these sledges heavily loaded was that the runners bent outwards from the slackening of the ropes binding them to the crossbars accordingly all the fastenings had to be altered and tightened by wedges firmly driven in at the crossing points of the ropes this device enabled us to load each sledge with an average weight of about seven hundred and fifty pounds therefore the whole material carried forward from the moraine amounted to three thousand pounds weight the loads comprised five tenths of green waterproof linen cloth all furnished with floor pieces stitched to the flaps the three larger tents were seven by seven feet and of the pattern suggested by whimper the two smaller ones six and a quarter by four feet on that of mummery we spread a piece of oilcloth under each tent his royal highness occupied one of the mummery tents and the rest of us two of the whimpers while the third was allotted to the guides with eiderdown sleeping bags covered with stout canvas and placed on light folding iron bedsteads standing a span high from the ground we were able to defy the cold at night the guides had from the beginning preferred to reject the luxury of bedsteads and were quite satisfied with their sleeping bags the scanty space between the beds in each tent was carpeted with a thick rug to prevent our nailed boots from piercing the oilcloth the whole camp equipment including our bags of clothing waterproofs woolens and extra shoes for the whole party weighed nine hundred and ninety six pounds our kitchen apparatus consisted of two norwegian petroleum stoves primus lamps with a double lining of aluminum to protect the flame from the wind and support the pots and pans which were of the same metal all the utensils fitted one into the other so as to take little room and be easy to pack we also had two small spirit stoves which could be kept alight on the march in order to melt snow for our broth or tea all the kitchen apparatus and utensils included weighed sixty four pounds the photographic baggage comprising two camera obscuras sensitive plates black tent etc meteorological instruments medicines and other accessories such as ropes aluminum flasks knapsack frames and snowshoes formed together a weight of two hundred and thirty five pounds we started from the moraine provided with sixteen rations of food each of which packed in a hermetically sealed tin and a canvas bag was fifty two pounds in weight and contained one day's supply of everything required for the maintenance of ten persons viz ourselves and the guides the supplies for our american porters had been laid in by major ingram at seattle they were provided with three white linen tents of the same size as ours but without flooring the men had mackintosh sheets to spread over the snow and thick woolen blankets to keep out the cold their food was also packed in rations somewhat similar to ours their whole equipment camp material and provisions included weighed one thousand pounds at one o'clock a m on july first the signal was given for our final start from the moraine but it was almost three o'clock before we had broken up the camp finished loading the sledges and seen them fairly started on the immense waste of ice it was a beautiful clear night and half an hour later although the sun had not yet risen there was enough light to distinguish every detail of the view to the right great bulwarks of the cook chain run down bounding wide valleys filled with glaciers above these soar the majestic summit of mount cook covered with snow from head to foot only here and there on some almost sheer cliff a patch of black rock serves to accentuate the form of the huge pile whose irregularities are not discernible in the scattered shadowless light the summit of the mountain forms a long crest capped by three lofty white domes of which the central one rises to an altitude of thirteen thousand seven hundred and fifty feet and by a few lesser peaks at the feet of these lies the mouth of the marvine glacier flanked to the right by the isolated promontory of blossom island 
beyond this towards the southwest the east side of the hitchcock chain stretches before us a mass of sharp ridges and peaks from which three great glaciers and several of lesser bulk flow down to the malaspina farther on the line of bastions seems to be interrupted for a considerable distance and a faint white line indicates the ice fall by which the seward glacier pours into the malaspina from its great basin between the hitchcock and samovar chains above the cascade rise two other imposing peaks the augusta thirteen thousand nine hundred feet and the malaspina of slightly inferior elevation the projecting spur of the samovar hills partly hides the mouth of the agassiz glacier and far above towers the isolated pyramid of mount st elias to the left of it is the sharp lower peak of mount huxley eleven thousand nine hundred twenty one feet with a low range of hills at its base dropping westwards in the direction of the shea and robinson hills to the right of mount st elias stands the clumsy dome of mount newton thirteen thousand eight hundred eleven feet united to mount augusta by a long deeply notched ridge the east face of mount st elias directly before us is divided into two walls turning northeast and southeast by a short buttress falling steeply towards the samovar hills our march was directed towards a point about twenty-one miles off where the sharp ridge at the end of the hitchcock chain comes down to the malaspina his royal highness intended to take to the seward glacier from that point as far as the foot of pinnacle pass and thence the track followed by mr russell in eighteen ninety over dome pass agassiz and up the newton glacier in order to attempt mount st elias from the northeast ridge connecting it with mount newton and the augusta range judging by the accounts of previous explorers this route seemed to offer the best chance of success and by following it russell had approached much nearer to success than any other assailant of the peak all explorers agreed in describing the southern flanks of st elias as extremely steep and swept by so many avalanches as to appear inaccessible the ice plateaus at their feet are barely more than two to three thousand feet above the sea and it is doubtful whether the state of the mountain would allow camps being pitched at a higher level yet without such camps it would be impossible to overcome the fifteen thousand feet up to the summit but on the northeastern flank there is the upper plateau of the newton glacier at eight thousand feet and the remaining height of ten thousand may be divided by making a camp on the coal then too mr russell had reported that this flank was neither excessively steep nor apparently blocked by any impassable obstacle that in short its only serious drawback would be the uncertain weather common to the whole region after three hours march once out of sight of the moraine nothing but snow was visible in front behind and to the left stretched the vast white level only bounded by mountains on the right the prospect is very grand but not at all picturesque it lacks foreground shows no contrast of color and the outlines are blunted by the thick snow mantle covering every ridge and peak while the sun already high above the horizon casts no shadows to break the uniformity of the view and throw it into relief we are dazzled by the reflection of the snow and have all put on our spectacles dragging sledges is tiring work for although the snow is in fairly good condition they sink too deep into it accordingly the men are often obliged to lift the prows in order to get them over the heaps of cake snow in front four men are harnessed two by two to each sledge the pair nearest the sledge have to keep it in the right track and as far as possible in the tracks of the sledge ahead where the beaten snow presents a harder surface in dividing the labor the men naturally fall into groups according to their occupations and tastes thus we have one team of guides one of students a sailor team and a mixed team composed of major ingram bota and the two americans the guides go capitally being accustomed to snow they pull together in step the americans will little by little grow used to the novel task we follow behind helping to push the sledges and set them straight when required at first we march twenty minutes and then rest for five but our halts grow longer and more frequent as our fatigue increases the surface of the glacier is undulating and lies in long wide furrows of monotonous stainless white the general inclination is very gentle but by no means unfelt by the teams and whenever we come to a steeper bit the sledges are sent on one by one with eight men attached 
little ponds or puddles of slush lie at the bottom of almost every hollow and at some points our path is cut by torrents of crystal clear water dashing over ice beds between sheer walls of snow fortunately we encounter few of these torrents and as they are not wide we get the sledges safely over them on improvised bridges of alpenstocks and axes the layer of snow on the glacier is of different depths from a span to a yard and a half but the ice is nowhere uncovered and no stones are seen as the day advances the snow gets rapidly worse and the work of dragging the sledges becomes so heavy that prudence compels us to stop in order to avoid over fatiguing the men on the first day it was eight o'clock a m and we had taken about five hours to cover six miles so we pitched our camp on the ice and after a hasty meal sought refuge from the glaring light which was burning our faces inside the tents where the soft greenish reflection filtered through the flaps rested our eyes after the pitiless reverberation without foreseeing that miss might come on the next day his royal highness with one of our party set off in the afternoon to map out a track over the snow in the direction of the hitchcock range as the sun declined and its rays became more slanting the landscape was transformed spreading shadows on all sides revealed the noble lines of cliff and valley while ample rounded flutings of whitened crests and wide soft undulations of snow-filled ravines contrasted with precipitous rock walls and the steep hard sharply notched ridges where here and there the mountain rock pierced through the monotonous milk-white shroud covering the land at midday blends with the sky towards evening in a delicate harmony of tints that pleases the eye and gives almost an impression of reviving life to this world of perpetual ice on the extreme edge of the horizon where glacier and sky seem to meet you discern a tremulous movement as of a distant sea with a bluish vapor floating over it this is really an optical effect proceeding from the radiation of the earth then the whole glacier is flooded with a rosy glow rather darker than that on the mountains in the west the great yellow disk of the sun sheds streams of yellow rays over the level and all the snow waste seems on fire the mild weather we were enjoying was too unusual to last in this region and by midnight the hour fixed for our awakening it was raining in torrents when the rain ceased about three a m we struck camp wrapped about by so dense a mist that in half an hour we were dripping wet by five a m we were on the march and surprised to find the snow pretty firm for the first hour and a half we followed the track marked out by his royal highness on the preceding day but it soon became necessary to steer by the compass we presently arranged our train so as to proceed in a perfectly straight line a caravan of three persons roped together took the lead for in that thick fog and with so much snow on the glacier hiding possible crevasses it might have been unsafe for the vanguard to move over unknown ground without the rope the prince took the hindmost place on the rope and steered by the compass keeping the line of march north by northwest about one hundred and fifty feet in the rear of the first party and therefore hardly able to see it through the mist came a second group of us charged with the duty of avoiding any slight deviation from the straight line produced in correcting the course the sledges followed last this long procession and the indistinct forms of the men drawing the sledges made a fantastic picture as of a polar expedition earth air and mist are all confused in the infinite desolation surrounding us on all sides the pale diffused light prevents our seeing clearly through our spectacles yet we cannot take them off without being painfully dazzled by the reflection of the snow the sledges go better than yesterday their loads are more equally distributed and the men are learning how to walk on snow the glacier has no undulations here and its surface is almost even with so slight an upward inclination that we scarcely notice the ascent after marching four hours we halt near a torrent in the rain to snatch a hasty breakfast and then go on till nearly one o'clock p m in a little over six hours we had done seven miles all round the camp the snow was darkened by myriads of small black worms which swarm to the surface on misty days but disappear when the sun comes out mixed with these are innumerable tiny insects which are hopping about in the liveliest manner but bury themselves under the icicles whenever a hand is extended towards them they are isotoma baselsi packard or near variety here and there a fly lost in the mist or driven by the wind lies frozen on the snow and becomes the prey of the spiders lurking in wait in every little hollow of the surface 
humble as they are these manifestations of life show a marvellous adaptability to conditions apparently incompatible with their existence the next morning a slight lifting of the weather enabled us to ascertain that we were much nearer to our goal and had taken the right direction starting at five thirty a m we were soon enveloped in mist again during the first hour or so we marched in a straight line but were then compelled to frequently diverge from it in order to turn broad conical depressions that at first sight through the mist we took for wide crevasses it was only on our return in clear weather that we ascertained their true nature and size before long the rain came down again and the soaked snow clung heavily to our shoes and caked on the sledge runners greatly increasing every one's fatigue nevertheless we made good progress with a ten minutes rest after twenty minutes march and rejoicing in the hope of reaching the hitchcock range that day the drizzle continued in the afternoon but the mist lifted enough to allow us a confused glimpse of the eastern extremity of the ice fall terminating the seward glacier and the spur of the hitchcock to which we were bound at three o'clock we could discern a dark line of detritus at the base of the hills formed by strips of naked moraine and half an hour later we were in the snow-filled hollow between the glacier and the chain the passage of the malaspina was accomplished all about us isolated moraine heaps protruded from the snow and underfoot was such a deep bed of slush mixed with sharp stones that we sank in knee-deep and there was no possibility of pitching our tents on it the hitchcock hills are very steep on this side covered with grass and low scrub excepting where the slopes are seamed by slides of crumbled earth and grit a covey of white partridge rose from the thicket at our approach but perched on neighboring bushes as though moved to more curiosity than alarm this last stage had covered about eight miles the men were exhausted and the rain had soaked us all the guides and porters being unprovided with bedsteads planted their tents on a narrow grassy ledge of the hills a short distance above the glacier but ours were pitched on the snow our camp stood under the southeast wall of the hitchcock range a few hundred yards from the seward cascade and one thousand seven hundred three feet above the sea this is the highest elevation of the east lobe of the malaspina glacier which descends from this point to the pacific ocean and yakutat bay the following day fourth july was the anniversary of the declaration of independence of the united states his royal highness allowed the americans a holiday for its celebration and we saw their national flag flying over their camp up the mountain side in the nomadic life we were leading it seemed quite natural to baptize every halting place and every stage of our journey with names commemorating some incident of travel or local characteristic accordingly our quarters by the spur of the hitchcock chain bore the designation of independence camp end of chapter five chapter six of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Phil Schempf. Seward Glacier, Dome Pass, and Agassiz Glacier. Our journey across the Malaspina Plateau had brought us to the very foot of the mountains, and we were now to push our way through them by the Seward Glacier, which pierces the chains like a wide high road, dividing the groups of Mount Cook and Mount St. Elias. The Seward is the greatest known glacier of the Alpine type, and of much vaster proportions than the giant ice streams of the Himalayas which until lately were supposed to be unrivalled it is more than forty miles in length from three to six miles in breadth and flows majestically down at a very slight inclination except here and there where the level of its bed makes a sudden dip and the ice is split into a chaos of huge irregular blocks the seward takes its origin from a wide basin about five thousand feet above the sea lying between the logan and augusta chains and bounded to the east by the Irving Range, and the vast semicircle of mountains dividing the latter from Mount Owen. It flows from this basin in a southerly direction, first walled in by the Corwin Cliffs and the northern branch of the Cook Chain, lower down by Mounts Augusta and Cook, then between the Samovar and Hitchcock Hills, and finally expands into the eastern lobe of the Malaspina Glacier, of which it is the principal tributary. 
the valley through which the seward flows presents three narrow gorges dividing one from another three vast amphitheatres of mountains each enclosing a nearly level plain of ice thus the glacier forms three plateaus rising in succession like steps and connected by ice falls in the gorges the first ice fall is at the brink of the upper basin at the northern extremity of the corwin cliffs the second occurs where the two boundary bulwarks of the pinnacle pass i e the northern bastion of the cook group and the southern wall of the hitchcock chain project into the valley below this point the glacier which now becomes divided into countless blocks by a labyrinth of broad crevasses presently spreads out between the samovar and hitchcock hills until the southern ends of these ranges converge thus forming the third gorge through which the ice pushes down to the malaspina in the final cascade hence the first difficulty before us was to conquer this terminal ice fall of the seward on the fourth of july the day after we encamped under the hitchcock cliffs while the americans higher up were celebrating the anniversary of independence in this remote district of their fatherland gonella and sela set off with two guides to explore the route fortunately the rain had ceased although the sky was still clouded we who remained in camp found plenty of work in spreading out clothes to dry after the last two days soaking and arranging various things which had been neglected during our forced marches the hitchcock hills end in an abrupt spur some four hundred and fifty feet high and this being separated by a depression from the principal chain has almost the air of an independent height gonella and sela made straight for a deep ravine which ran up to this gorge hoping to find a short cut through it to the seward valley but they encountered an unexpected obstacle in the shape of a small lake some three hundred feet wide and covered with floating ice just at the bottom of the coward between the edge of the malaspina and the hills analogous in formation to the lakes already described at the sides and southern end of the shea range all these tarns are created in the same way wherever the edge of a glacier without the protection of a thick layer of moraine touches the rock a depression is produced on the surface by the radiation of heat from the rocks and soil that accelerates the melting of the ice the glacier naturally drains into the cavity thus formed giving rise to a little torrent which hastens the melting of the ice over which it runs where a steep spur projects into the ice field as the hitchcock and shea hills project into the malaspina the drainage channels of the two faces converge and often unite at the extremity forming a lake which again generally discharges into an ice tunnel the exploring party tried to reach the mountain side by skirting this lake and finally reached it after no little trouble and risk of accidents from the numerous water holes in the marginal ice they then reached the coir and mounting by it to the depression in the ridge soon found themselves at the edge of the seward on the plateau above the terminal ice fall they then followed the glacier downwards in the direction of the ice fall and climbed the isolated point at the extremity of the hitchcock hills hoping to discover some easier and safer route than the one they had just traversed so that the whole caravan with the loads might reach the plateau without risk this hope was realized for in the angle between the ice fall and the extremity of the mountain they descried a steep gully filled with snow running up for about three hundred feet and which notwithstanding a steep gradient could be converted into a safe track even for portage by cutting a zigzag course with the axe on the morning of the fifth july the guides went on ahead to do this work while we broke up the camp and now for the first time our caravan was divided five americans were sent back with a sledge to fetch eight days rations from the stores left on the moraine in the three other sledges we carried all our things to the foot of the gully making our way round the hitchcock spur among the sharp-edged boulders and stones of the left seward moraine this seward moraine is composed of a strip of detritus about fifteen hundred feet in breadth running down several miles into the malaspina glacier but now early in july it was still almost entirely covered with snow save for a small space near the hills the porters slowly climbed the narrow wedge of snow beside the ice fall on the track cut by the guides they soon got used to the steepness but refrained from imitating the guides in their glissades down the slope to bring up fresh loads caution was advisable for the scattered stones and open crevasses at the foot of the gully would have rendered a fall dangerous by half past eleven o'clock all the baggage was stacked on the seward plateau above the terminal ice fall footnote this track was never used again either by the porters with fresh relays or by ourselves on the descent some days after we had climbed it 
the lake at the foot of the hitchcock became empty and thus the caravans were able to cross its bed and mount straight to the hollow above without skirting the mountain spur lake cayetani and the shea hills lakes are subject to similar changes they naturally overflow when the tunnels into which they discharge are blocked by masses of ice or detritus and drain off when the tunnels are free End footnote. on the plateau we were in the midst of novel scenery entirely different from that of the malaspina instead of the vast monotonous plain stretching to the horizon unbroken by a single detail of line or color we now had before us a mass of ice some five miles wide thrown up as by some violent convulsion of nature into myriads of great blocks piled in the wildest confusion like an ocean suddenly congealed during a storm though lacking the symmetry of waves we were on a snowdrift heaped in a bend of the hitchcock range flanking the glacier a mile or so beyond this point a cliff of the hitchcock approached the glacier so closely as to almost come in contact with the seracs we had no choice as to the route our only course lay over the snow round the base of the cliff it was clearly impossible to take to the glacier since it was seamed with crevasses in every direction equally impossible would it have been to cross to the other side we must skirt the left margin hugging the base of the hitchcock's western flank until we reach some point where a crossing can be effected fortunately the numerous neves and glacier from the mountain had massed together at its base forming an almost uninterrupted dike along the brink of the seward following this route we were able to convey the loads by sledge for considerable distances but at many points it was necessary to carry everything on our backs in order to climb steep drifts or cross rocky spurs which barred the road from this face of the hitchcock range project two main spurs each ending in a bifurcation and closing a small neve in its curve the recess between the two great promontories forms a circular basin filled with level ice which we name the hitchcock glacier it is dominated to the north by two sharp twin peaks one of bare rock the other snow-clad whose northern flanks fall sheer to pinnacle glacier these are the two highest peaks of the hitchcock group it was easy enough to get round the first spur through the snow at its base without unloading the sledges more than twice we next crossed the hitchcock glacier still skirting the jagged seracs of the seward as far as the foot of the second great spur this is much loftier than the first and juts out to the very edge of the seward it forms the southern wall of the pinnacle glacier which uniting with the seward lower down shoots over the ridge of this wall in an ice fall at one time traversing obliquely the steep bank of sliding soil at another moment passing through the snow-filled gullies or climbing the ridges at their sides we finally surmounted the second buttress and at midday on the eighth of july camp was pitched at two thousand nine hundred seventy nine feet above the sea in the extreme southwest corner of the glacier that comes down from pinnacle pass it had taken four days to reach this point from the malaspina we had established a camp at the foot of the first buttress and another close to the second on the hitchcock glacier excepting for a few hours the weather had been almost constantly fine the sun even when partially veiled by mist was excessively hot upon the glacier and the light so dazzling that our eyes suffered in spite of smoked spectacles his royal highness always left camp with a small party several hours in advance of the rest of the caravan in order to prospect the way ahead and daily pushed on to the farthest possible point the loaded sledges followed slowly in the rear and by evening we were all together in camp the day we reached pinnacle glacier his royal highness pushed on to explore the route over the seward and following it almost to the mouth of the valley running down from dome pass only returned to camp very late in the afternoon he had ascertained that we must continue to skirt the edge of the seward for two or three miles before finding a practicable way across only the guides were with us now ingram and his five remaining porters had gone down with a sledge to meet the first party coming back from the malaspina moraine the latter were to join us farther up with fresh supplies while ingram's party took its turn in going down to the depot on the moraine from this time on we only saw the porters occasionally and for brief periods they were so prompt in following out his royal highness's plans and executed his orders with so much punctuality in spite of unforeseen obstacles from bad weather and changed condition of the mountain 
that we were never once delayed by having to wait for them our camp was pitched on a tongue of the pinnacle glacier that runs southward and crosses the end of a spur of the hitchcock hills to unite with the seward in an ice fall all the rest of the glacier is one great unbroken level which joins the seward with a wide frontage and rises gently eastward to pinnacle pass behind the pass we again caught sight of the snowy summit of mount cook beyond the level before us rose the vertical wall belonging to the cook system that forms the northern rampart of pinnacle pass this wall is composed of distinct horizontal strata of black and gray rock and surmounted by the sharp slender pinnacles to which the coal owes its name this bastion hid from our view the upper portion of the seward it stretches so far to the west that the valley is barely three miles wide at this point nevertheless the glacier does not form an ice fall here there being no sudden drop in the level of its bed but flows in a steep incline until it passes the mouth of the pinnacle valley to the upper spur of the hitchcock range there is a deep calm in these luminous afternoons the glacier is alive with a murmur of running water in the crevasses and the sharp repercussion of stones falling from the seracs you can hear the stir of hidden vitality the process of slow continuous change although nothing is visible to the eyes but the great frozen mass betraying no sign of the giant force with which these millions of tons of ice press slowly forward the whole glacier is covered with snow only at the edges seracs soiled with detritus form a darker line indicative of marginal moraine these lines were much more distinct a month later on our way back from mount st elias the whole Hitchcock chain stretches in a wide crescent flanking the Seward, and we can trace the route followed during the previous days along the base of the cliffs. The farther side, the glacier is bounded by the Samovar Hills, a low chain of rounded, stumpy heights covered with snow fields and broken by low ridges dividing vales filled by small glaciers. A crag of black rock, apparently separated from the main chain by a level tract of ice, juts into the seward exactly facing the north bastion of pinnacle pass and helps to narrow the valley at this point it also masks a considerable glacier running up to the dome pass behind the southern extremity of the samovar chain walling in the terminal cascade of the seward we perceive the outlines of other crests of the same group little parallel ridges projecting towards the malaspina a large moraine produced by the fusion of the marginal moraines of Seward and Agassiz starts from these bastions and trails down into the Malaspina, like a colossal ribbon trending westwards as far as the eye can reach, and dividing the eastern from the middle lobe of the glacier. This moraine also is now coated with snow. Behind the extremity of the Samovar, we discern the mouth of the Agassiz Glacier with its terminal cascade, and still farther back, the Shea Hills, slightly veiled in mist. The Malaspina, usually obscured by low banks of fog, is distinctly visible this evening in all its vast extent to the far horizon, where it ends in a pale blue line that resembles, but is not, the sea. Behind the Samovar chain, there to the west, towers the symmetrical pyramid of Mount St. Elias. How much closer have we approached it since the day we first beheld it, half shrouded in mist from the deck of the Bertha? Here the proportions of the landscape are on so vast a scale that our peak seems to have dwindled for all its importance, and we hesitate to believe it can be as much as 18,000 feet in height. At the feet of the northern and southern extremities of the mountain, which we now see in profile, rise the peaks of Mount Huxley and Mount Newton, while exactly facing us is the short, steep, southeast ridge that joins the south bastion of the Newton Valley the north wall of this same valley consists of a lengthy chain extending eastwards from mount newton first surmounted by a string of unnamed summits and then by the three great peaks of mounts bering malaspina and augusta footnote his royal highness gave the name of bering to a broad snow summit due west of mount malaspina and of somewhat inferior height viewed from the seward the top has the appearance of a long ridge running up at the eastern end to a peak that is connected with mount malaspina by a wide coal of ice russell mentions a peak called jeanette between mounts newton and malaspina but i was unable to obtain exact indications as to its locality End footnote. the last of these unites the head of the samovar range mount augusta almost fourteen thousand feet is undoubtedly the most important peak of this group 
and the only one of sufficient majesty to compete with mount st elias it is a bald precipitous peak seamed with deep icy couloirs crested with terrific ridges and with overhanging glaciers which apparently cling to sheer walls of rock this face of the mountain appears to be quite inaccessible our guides look at it reflectively and confess that it would be hard to find a path up it unswept by avalanches of stones and ice beyond mount augusta the chain suddenly takes another direction bends to the northeast and dipping down considerably forms the corwin cliffs which flank the seward glacier to the west ever-changing mists drift lazily along the glaciers gather upon the summits vanish behind the peaks and again return to shroud them the next moment the sky is mottled with broken shapeless clouds tinged with rose color here and there while in the west the great blurred yellow sun sinking into the mist is perhaps the best part of the picture throughout the vast expanse before us bare rocks and ice are all that meet the eye not a trace of life not a patch of verdure to enliven the desolate majesty of the scene the southern spur of the shea hills and blossom island are the only spots in this mountain waste where trees are to be found on the southern slopes of the hitchcock hills thickets of dwarf shrubs are the only growth nevertheless at a short distance from the camp against the south bastion of the pinnacle close to the spires and turrets of the ice-fall we discovered a little stretch of soil where the snow had just melted already clad with a thick mantle of dark blue lupins mingled with violets anemones saxifrages and moss we noticed a few black flies among the flowers and some pretty little gray birds of the size of sparrows were flying about overhead a very oasis of color and fragrance in the midst of the lifeless waste of ice on the ninth of july we crossed the snout of pinnacle glacier it is from two and one half to three miles in width almost flat and covered with a thick bed of snow seamed in little parallel grooves with long reddish stripes formed by masses of the microscopic weed saffarella nivalis that is common to glaciers in all parts of the world the seward seracs cling so closely to the north buttress of the pinnacle that we cannot skirt round its base fortunately a small snow saddle was found close to its final spur to which we were able to climb by a convenient bank of snow on the rock ridge near the camp we discovered a scrap of cloth evidently torn from a tent and a small pile of stones these were the only traces of mankind encountered during the whole of our ascent and were left by russell in eighteen ninety when he camped here for several days after crossing pinnacle pass accordingly we named this neck of snow russell's camp the ridge just above it juts out in a sharp point which mr russell christened point glorious to mark his admiration of the view it afforded over the seward basin and the encircling mountains on the slope behind point glorious there is a great level amphitheatre bounded to the south by the pinnacle cliffs to the north and east by long slopes of snow rising to the flanks of the mount owen chain in the distance behind mount owen we discern another gigantic snow peak mount irving resembling mount cook whose northern flanks drop down towards the upper basin of the seward this upper basin seems bounded to the north by a girdle of mountains mostly covered with snow and probably joining mount logan to the west looking down on the seward glacier beneath us we note that its crevasses are as regularly disposed as if planned by some colossal design immediately below the upper cascade at the outlet of the original basin the glacier forms a wide gently sloped expanse cut by numerous crevasses about a mile above point glorious the slope becomes steeper while the glacier deviates from its formerly southeasterly course and making a slight bend flows straight towards the south the upper portion has only marginal crevasses which run as usual obliquely from the lateral banks towards the centre of the glacier against the direction of the current and branch off from the sides at an angle of about forty degrees the cracks proceeding from either margin of the glacier meet in the centre lower down thus forming crevasses in the shape of an inverted letter v across the entire width of the ice with the apex in the centre and pointing upwards the extremities at the sides and turning downwards these crevasses occur at regular intervals about fifty feet apart but their shape changes before long owing to the greater velocity of the current in the middle of the glacier the vertex of the v flows down faster than the ends and the original angle of fifty to sixty degrees becomes more and more obtuse until every crevasse runs in a straight line all the way across 
as the descent continues the angle is gradually reversed first the crevasses become crescent shaped with the cavity turned upwards then again take the form of a v enclosing an angle of about thirty degrees with the apex downwards meanwhile the cracks grow wider and wider at the center of the glacier and the layers of ice dividing one from another are broken up by the constant pressure into short crevasses running in a perpendicular direction to the main ones and parallel with the glacier's axis thus at last the whole mass is split up into gigantic cubes most of which are completely isolated by fissures on every side below the point where pinnacle glacier runs into the seward the crevasses are so numerous and so intricately interlaced that no fixed order of arrangement can be traced nothing but irregular blocks of every size heaped up at random and in this state the glacier continues down to its terminal cascade the aspect of the seward was somewhat different in eighteen ninety when mr russell first saw and described it at that time the transversal arrangement of the crevasses was maintained down to the lower portion of the glacier and the surface became smoother for some distance before reaching the final cascade possibly all the ice was more thickly covered with snow that year even the glacier's rate of descent must have decreased since eighteen ninety although russell's attempts to measure it at that time failed to give conformable results he maintains that the rate of speed in the center of the glacier must be twenty feet daily at least mr russell and his fellow explorer mr kerr both relate how seracs frequently crash down with such force as to shake the ice under their feet and they add that almost incessant reports and rumblings were produced by the rolling and shattering of the fallen blocks nothing of the kind was observed by ourselves during the days we spent on and about the seward the glacier was always perfectly quiet only now and then a solitary stone would come down or a fragment of serac would drop into a crevasse with a dull thud seated on the rocky spur near the camp by russell's stone cairn we gazed with emotion upon the splendid spectacle before us as usual the evening light softens all the details the faint haze clinging to the mountains lends a peculiar softness to their harsh ridges and to the dark shadows in the hollows the glaciers of hitchcock of seward and of the distant malaspina are a warm creamy white the faintest trace of shadow just barely marks their broad undulations our caravan track runs like a furrow across the pinnacle glacier the only break in its great level surface delicate mists read the highest peaks the sun has set slowly behind mount st elias and its two crests north and south grow faintly as if they were phosphorescent one last ray gilds the summit of mount augusta whose darkly shadowed slopes look black and sullen in vivid contrast to the splendor around frost has arrested all movement no stone falls there is no sound of water in the crevasses of the seward a dead calm prevails an utter silence a penetrating and serene sense of peace the following day tenth of july we crossed the seward to find a route down to the glacier we had to coast again for a while round the edge of the spur on which we had camped dragging the sledge over the snow slope at its base the weather was cloudy and oppressive the snow in a very bad state the guides found it as much as they could do to manage a single sledge while we assisted in pushing it over the steeper parts of the way and supporting it with our shoulders to keep it from rolling downhill after conquering a second spur covered with broken ice by dint of carrying all the baggage on our backs we again reloaded the sledge and finally struck out across the seward in a westerly direction the glacier is about three miles wide at this point but we were obliged to take so tortuous a route in order to avoid the crevasses that the distance was nearly doubled in spite of the preliminary exploration by his royal highness which had reduced these inevitable deviations to a minimum we kept a course parallel with the huge crevasses along the strips of ice scarcely wider than the sledge and sometimes across square blocks connected by snow bridges which were fortunately solid enough a party of two roped together were in the van carefully testing and sounding with the ice axe every bridge over which the heavily laden sledge and its team of five men had to pass the transversal crevasses measured from thirty to fifty feet in width and had a peculiarity that was quite new to us all their walls were not of ice but of granulated snow arranged in strata ten to fifteen feet thick separated one from the other by dark layers of dust and fine detritus 
in the deeper fissures we could count from eighteen to twenty of these snow strata but in none as far down as we could see was there any of the green ice peculiar to glaciers every one of these strata must be the result of a fall of snow while the intermediate dark layers represent periods of fine weather as we drew nearer to the middle of the valley the whole expanse of the amphitheatre north of the pinnacle cliffs with mount cook in the background unfolded itself to our eyes so many tributary glaciers pour down into the seward from all sides that one scarcely understands how so enormous a volume of ice can possibly squeeze through the gorge between the pinnacle cliffs and samovar hills the wall of mount augusta towered above us but its base was hidden by a low sandstone buttress separating the augusta glacier from the cascade glacier the peak appears to be a regular cone of snow the summit of which is lost in the clouds on reaching the mouth of the valley coming down from the dome pass we see beyond the latter and above the samovar ridge the whole course of another great vale closed on its western side by a wall of ice terminating in a coal at the foot of the north ridge of mount st elias this is the newton valley and the remainder of our route lies mapped out before us then gradually as we draw closer to the samovar hills mount st elias and newton valley begin to sink behind them and finally vanish altogether on reaching the point where the glacier flowing down from the dome pass unites with the seward we call a brief halt for lunch after this the guides go back to fetch the second sledge while his royal highness and the rest of us dragging the one we have with us pushed on a mile or so farther up the dome pass valley and pitch camp at about three thousand three hundred fifty feet above the sea towards evening rain begins to fall and continues the whole of the next day the guides employ the time in bringing up the remainder of the baggage from russell camp discarding at the base of pinnacle cliffs one of the two sledges we had retained thus there is now one sledge on the malaspina another on the snow slopes of the hitchcocks and a third on the seward in this way the porters are spared the labor of carrying them on their backs across ice falls and rocks the glacier by which we have mounted from the seward to the dome pass is not steep and the few wide crevasses are spanned by solid snow bridges at the beginning of the ascent we have on the right the cascade glacier which falls precipitously down from the southeast face of mount augusta through a deep gully farther on our course lies between sheer walls of the samovar hills composed of rocks so homogeneous in structure that in spite of continual avalanches of stones no couloirs are formed the little side gullies opening here and there are filled with snow higher up near the pass the incline becomes somewhat steeper and we have to skirt round a few yawning crevasses the dome pass three thousand eight hundred feet is more than three hundred feet above our last camp two glaciers flow down from it one eastward into the seward the other westward into the agassiz the pass is flanked on either side by two symmetrical smoothly curved domes that to the southwest crowned by a perfectly hemispherical ice cap the other to the northeast with a rocky top bordered by a snow cornice soon to be melted by the sun the cloudy weather soon to change to fog and rain prevents us from obtaining any view to the west of the coal in the direction of the agassiz glacier on the day when we encamped on the dome pass we were joined by ingram and the five americans who had descended to the moraine from independence camp meeting on their way the other five who were journeying back from pinnacle camp in the space of one week these hardy americans had done more than forty miles on the malaspina glacier going and returning and over twenty miles in addition by the difficult route along the base of the hitchcock hills and across the seward carrying baggage of about six hundred pounds weight including their own provisions and equipment together with eight days rations for our own party it was remarkable to see how rapidly the men became accustomed to carry on their backs or drag upon sledges increasingly heavy weights the forty-five to fifty pounds per head that at first was considered a heavy burden on almost level paths became the ordinary load for every porter even on difficult tracks and steep inclines as for the guides each of them was now equal to carrying as much as eighty pounds weight for a moderate distance the valley branching westward from the dome pass is longer than that to the east and is still walled in by the samovar hills the cliffs are of the same character as before the glacier is only slightly crevassed and terminates at the bottom of a drop luckily not steep enough to form an ice fall we descended easily 
letting the sledge slide down on a wide ridge of ice between two deep furrows and halt thirteenth july on the eastern ridge of the agassiz glacier at the foot of the coal we have descended about four hundred eighty five feet so are now a little lower than at the corresponding camp on the seward about three thousand five hundred sixty six feet above the sea the agassiz glacier its broken surface bristling with jagged seracs skirts the base of the north buttress of the dome pass winding towards mount augusta and the malaspina behind there must be a great basin collecting the snows from the west flank of mount augusta from the malaspina and bering bounded by the samovar chain on the east and on the west by a ridge running down from the bearing and dividing the upper basin of the agassiz from the lower part of the newton footnote mr russell gives a somewhat different account of the topography of this region in his opinion the head of the samovar chain instead of joining on to mount augusta is connected with mount malaspina whence glaciers run down into seward cascade glacier from our own observations on the spot and from careful studies from the photos we brought back the arrangement of the mountains would seem to accord with the description i have given above that is to say the samovar chain would form a buttress of mount augusta supposing this name to be applied to the highest and most imposing summit of the group and all the glaciers on the southern walls of mount malaspina would flow into the upper basin of the agassiz the buttress coming down from mount bering and bordering this basin to the west is the same that during the whole of our march up the newton valley hid from us the western flanks of malaspina and augusta and is clearly seen in all the photographs of the region to the east of newton glacier which were taken in newton valley on the russell coal and on the ridge of mount st elias we have retained the name of cascade for the great glacier flowing from the southeast flank of mount augusta situated between the head of the samovar chain and a short buttress that divides it from the augusta glacier it falls into the glacier that descends to the east of the dome pass just before the latter is merged in the seward End footnote. our camp stands facing the great cascade of seracs with which the newton hurls itself down into the agassiz and at their point of junction the two glaciers are of about equal volume on the north buttress of the dome pass rising steeply at a little distance from us a few patches of green are still seen six hundred feet higher up the limit of vegetation on the mountain slopes facing south must be therefore at about the level of four thousand feet above the sea from the camp we can hear the note of partridges among scanty grass tufts as well as the whistle of an occasional marmot the spurs on the north of the malaspina glacier own a richer fauna that might be expected on the shea hills a good many bears wolves foxes mountain goats partridges and a shrew mouse have been found a track well beaten by quadrupeds runs northeast from the base of the hills and across the malaspina glacier for seven or eight miles towards the samovar chain russell even a fish was once found in a glacier torrent that pours into the Cayetani lake the history of these zoological specimens would repay study how and when did they come here and from where imprisoned in a narrow zone surrounded by glaciers on every side in a region where the earth is frost-bound for at least seven months of the year their existence seems almost miraculous easterly and southeasterly winds were now blowing persistently accompanied by rain mist and heavy cloud banks which hung motionless about a thousand feet overhead during several days the sun only appeared at distant intervals for a short time emitting a pale colorless light that the reflection from the snow rendered fatiguing and bewildering infinite precautions had to be taken to keep the interior of our tents tolerably dry but by this time we were almost damp proof the temperature remained quite bearable being nearly always a little above freezing point and two hours of misty sunshine sufficed to dry our belongings the expectation of what was before us and of the probable hardships to be faced made us indifferent to petty inconveniences mindful of russell's advice sela had adopted the plan of lowering a pail down a crevasse and obtaining water in this fashion it was a happy idea and led to much saving of fuel considerable heat is required to melt snow or ice and as half a gallon of petroleum was the daily allowance for making early coffee tea at other meals and soup for all ten of us it was best to be thrifty accordingly we always tried to camp near a tarn and sometimes patiently collected water from the drippings of a convenient serac during the warm part of the day 
we crossed the agassiz on july fifteenth reascending it obliquely towards the western extremity of the newton ice fall the surface of the glacier is very unequal and on the left half of it to the east every depression is filled by a small pool here and there we came upon torrents as previously on the malaspina we got the sledge over these by bridging them with our ice axes the water of these lakes is clear as crystal of dark cobalt blue in the centre where it is the deepest and shading off to a fainter tint near the edge where snow bridges occur across the tarns the colour of the water is reflected on the snow in extremely delicate tones we encountered many wide crevasses and sometimes strange seracs formed arches and viaducts over the blue water often resembling the work of man at the end of our march the tents were pitched on the western side of the glacier at three thousand seven hundred forty feet above the sea beside a small pool canopied by a great smoothly curved overhanging serac resting on a pillar of ice we were now at the foot of a buttress which comes straight down from st elias and after forming the south wall of the newton valley glacier bends to the southeast at the latter's terminal cascade and becomes the boundary of the agassiz valley from the camp we had only the view of the newton terminal cascade which is loftier and wider than any we had seen before and with the flank of the newton augusta chain covered with huge precipitous glaciers making most imposing of backgrounds his royal highness had already explored a track to the newton up a narrow wedge of snow between the western brink of the cascade and the rock cliff walling it in having passed the last point where the sledge can be used all the loads must henceforth be carried on our backs we leave everything behind except clothes actually in wear thus limiting our baggage to the barest necessities of life mr russell had adopted the same course and practically at the same point in eighteen ninety one accordingly the present camp at the foot of the newton glacier retained for us the name he had formerly given it of sledge camp End of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Ascent of Mount Saint Elias, Alaska, by Filippo de Filippi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Newton Glacier. On July sixteenth, we struck our tents at Sledge Camp and set out to climb the Newton Glacier, dividing our party into several caravans, each of which started as soon as the loads were packed. We had spent one night only in this camp, and had worked very hard to get everything in readiness for the start. We were impatient to make our way up this last valley, from the top of which we expected to obtain a complete view of Mount St. Elias from base to summit. The Agassiz Glacier pours down from its basin in a very broken state, and its surface becomes still more chaotic as it flows past the terminal cascade of the Newton the two glaciers do not fuse at once in a single mass at their point of junction for some distance the newton seracs stand out from the surface of the agassiz in the shape of huge blocks of hard snow scattered between the crevasses or half buried in them now stretching across them like a bridge or again posed on the very brink often at so sharp an angle that one expects them to fall at any moment to reach the foot of the ice fall at the western end we have to walk for a while over this rugged tangle of the agassiz threading labyrinths of ice blocks and cautiously crossing snow bridges over numerous crevasses often half filled with water we gain the newton plateau in the same way that we had mounted the terminal ice fall of the seward namely by a tongue of snow and ice wedged between the rocks and seracs this gully however is double the height of that on the seward about six hundred feet and is split halfway up by three or four wide crevasses with edges of live ice placed almost vertically one above the other to cross these with our loads was an unpleasant bit of work but neither difficult nor dangerous the snow in the gully was studded with stones and boulders fallen from the perpendicular rock wall one thousand feet in height which bounds it on the left and is furrowed with innumerable vertical grooves surmounted at the top by a glacier of which the edge is visible on reaching the top of this couloir, we turned to the right towards the center of the Newton Glacier. The upper valley was filled with mist, and we could see nothing in front of us except another huge fall of seracs, extending across the whole width of the glacier and apparently barricading the valley. In little more than half an hour, we had traversed the plateau and cast off our loads almost at the foot of the second ice fall, 
14,485 feet above the sea. The leading characteristics of all the great glaciers of this region, namely their division into terraces connected by ice falls, is more obvious in the Newton than in any of the others. Here the foot of the terminal ice fall is at 3,740 feet above the sea, while the basin from which it flows is at 8,661 feet. The difference of level is owing almost entirely to the three tremendous drops, between which the glacier forms three plateaus. The lowest of these, just above the terminal cascade, is 745 feet higher than the Agassiz. The second terrace is 1,875 feet above the first, while the topmost is at a level of 2,201 feet above the second. Thus the ice falls increase in height as the valley rises. The lowest, however, has the most precipitous drop, and the ice is so broken that it might perhaps be impossible to climb it in the center. The second is less steep, and subdivided by a short stretch of comparatively level, though still broken ice. Footnote. Owing to this division, Russell considers that there are two cascades between the lower and middle terrace, and consequently that the Newton glaciers form four cascades. End footnote. The highest of the three is steeper and shorter than the middle one. The surface of the intermediate terraces is undulating and full of crevasses, but the uppermost of these is the widest and steepest. In fact, the two lower plateaus are almost level, and at certain points their slope is actually reversed. The glacier runs through a deep valley, the head of which is closed by a steep ice wall rising to the coal between Mount St. Elias and Mount Newton. On either side it is bounded by two buttresses of Mount St. Elias, with a medium height of about 10,000 feet. Of these, the one to the north is the more picturesque. To the blunt, flattened summit of Mount Newton succeeds a long series of slender pinnacles and dizzy ice peaks, reaching heights of 12,000 to 13,000 feet, and connected by sharp ridges, variously twisted and curved, falling at every angle on all sides, and edged with huge cornices of snow. The chain extends as far as Mount Bering, keeping the same height throughout its length. A short ridge juts out from the latter summit, and barring the base of the valley, compels the Newton Glacier, running from west to east, to change its direction during the last part of its course towards the Agassiz, so that its terminal cascade faces due south. The southern buttress of the valley, starting from the eastern crest of Mount St. Elias, forms two fine peaks, one of ice, the other of rock, then running down to the mouth of the vale, makes a turn to the southwest, and forms the western wall of the Agassiz Glacier. This mountain barrier separates the Newton and Agassiz from the Libby Glacier, which pours down into the Malaspina from the southeast flank of St. Elias. Both sides of the valley throughout its length are precipitous and deeply covered with snow, even where the cliffs are vertical or overhanging, the frequent snowfalls leave them sprinkled with white patches. Numerous glaciers piled into seracs cling to the steep rocks, as though suspended over the valley, and some end suddenly in a vertical white wall at the edge of the precipice. Of the many peaks crowning the valley, not one seems accessible from it. Throughout this vast range of mountains, one looks in vain for some point of vantage whence a reasonably secure route to the top may be descried. The sole exception is the short extent of cliffs that bars the head of the valley and leads to the base of the northern ridge of Mount St. Elias, although at too great a distance for us to decide as to its safety from avalanches. The Newton Glacier is about eight miles in length. It took us thirteen days to reach the upper end. We encamped six times on the way, and our average march was a little over a mile and a half. We had to contend almost constantly with persistent and dense snowfalls which lasted entire days, enveloping us in a blinding cloud which made our surroundings strangely vague. It was heavy walking through the powdery snow, in which we often sank to our hips, while we had to grope our way patiently among the great blocks of ice, over snow bridges, often insecure, and amid the incessant roar of avalanches and stonefalls, which thundered down from morning till night on the margins of the glacier. The Newton was no less inhospitable to us than it had been to our predecessor, Russell, for we had only three fine days out of the thirteen. It is hard to say whether these interminable snowfalls are owing to the general climatic conditions of the region, or to local characteristics related with the direction of the valley, 
its altitude, etc. Mr. Russell maintains that there is more bad weather on the summits than on the frozen plateaus at the base of the chains. Mr. Topham, on the other hand, asserts that there is often a whole day of rain on the seashore when the sky is perfectly clear over the peak of Mount St. Elias. We ourselves observed that the sky always cleared first round the summits, and we found less fresh snow on the coal and the crest of Mount St. Elias than down in the valley. We also frequently noticed that heavy fogs entirely cover the levels of the Malaspina Glacier and its banks, when all the high valleys were in sunshine under a clear sky, while a comparison of the meteorological observations taken by Mr. Hendrickson, the missionary at Yakutat, with those taken simultaneously by ourselves on the mountain, shows that there is more mist and cloud at low than at high levels. In spite of persistent bad weather, our days on the Newton Glacier were neither monotonous nor wearisome. The scenery revealed such wealth of color and form that every day, in all sorts of weather, some novelty was seen, some endless succession of unexpected views. The glacier is usually blue, and of deeper blue in mist than in sunshine, not greenish as on alpine ice fields. This coloring pervades the air, and is caught and reflected by the mist, until everything is bathed in a transparent azure. The effect is so constant and so marked, although in varying degrees of intensity, that this might appropriately be named the Blue Valley. Probably the tint is owed to the enormous quantity of snow that covers the ice everywhere, even in the deepest crevasses. During our first evening on the Newton, we saw a strange and beautiful spectacle. About 6.30 p.m., the dense fogs which had masked the valley all day lifted a little, clearing away from the glacier and its precipitous rock walls, and all the head of the valley appeared of such deep indigo tint that it was impossible to distinguish which was ice, sky, or rock. Little by little this color spread, growing gradually fainter and fainter, and tinged with blue, one after another, every ice-fallen serac of the Newton, and the mountains on either hand, with their glaciers, until everything was bathed in an azure haze. The portage of all our belongings, from the Agassiz up to the Newton, was only completed on the following day, 17th July. An icy cold rain, mixed with sleet, was pouring down. The guides had returned to sledge camp to fetch the baggage left behind there the previous day. His Royal Highness and Lieutenant Cogney had gone to fetch a few loads, which had been brought up to the top of the icefall, and deposited on the snow. Two hours later, on their return to camp, great excitement was caused by the news they had sighted four men climbing the Agassiz Glacier in the direction of the last camp, where our guide still remained. Evidently the strangers must be a portion of Mr. Bryant's caravan. More than once we had felt surprise at finding no trace of the expedition that was supposed to be in advance of us, and had divined what was really the fact that it had ascended the Agassiz instead of the Seward Glacier, following the route taken by Mr. Russell in 1891. At about six o'clock p.m., during a downpour of rain, our guides appeared at last with a letter from Mr. Bryant. The progress of his caravan had been much delayed by the illness of one of the porters, and the consequent loss of his services and those of a comrade detailed to look after him. After climbing the Agassiz to within a mile or two of the Newton Icefall, Mr. Bryant had decided to abandon the ascent. Having described two tents left at the foot of the fall, he had gone up there to inform His Royal Highness or some member of his party that he withdrew from the attempt on Mount St. Elias, and wished him every success. After giving this letter to our men and taking a short rest, Mr. Bryant started down the glacier with his party. We had missed, by a few hours, our one chance of meeting the only other men besides ourselves on the vast icy desert. The lower plateau of the Newton was the last place where we had rain. Higher up it was always snow. Accordingly, the limit of rainfalls in the St. Elias region must be assigned to the altitude of 4,400 to 4,500 feet. The remaining portion of the plateau to be crossed before reaching the second icefall is seamed with huge furrows, and has several little tarns. Before long, the glacier slopes upward more steeply, and beyond some wide crevasses, we come to the seracs of this second cascade. Whether from special atmospheric conditions, or from the greater extent of snowfield, these optical illusions, which are common to all glaciers, were manifested on a most unusual scale. We found ourselves climbing in and out of troughs of varying depths between rugged ice waves, almost without visual perception of them. 
in fact we only realized their existence by periodically losing sight of the party ahead or when on turning to look back we found our view of the glacier was shut out by some incline we had descended unawares the first half of the ice fall is easy to climb in some parts of it the seracs lie in rows divided by wide furrows which form a direct and easy path between snow walls rising to about thirty-five feet but the numerous crevasses compelled us to perform more gymnastic exercises than were desirable with our heavy loads at last however we emerged from one of these icy corridors on to the comparatively flat stretch of ice that divides the second cascade in two parts it is seen by numerous torrents flowing between high banks of snow and scattered with round masses of ice among which lurk limpid pools of blue water his royal highness decided to encamp on the margin of one of these lakelets in a hollow sheltered by snow slopes our march had taken two hours and a half a drizzle of sleet went on the whole of eighteenth july but the nineteenth being a splendid day we took advantage of it to carry up our baggage as far as the lake in the evening ingram and five porters appeared with fresh supplies so his royal highness detained them to give us their assistance in moving our camp farther on excited by the view of mount st elias now apparently very near and anxious about the uncertain weather we decided to lighten our loads by leaving the iron bedsteads behind we started all together the next morning under a clouded sky and in oppressively sultry weather we were soon among the seracs and our route became very picturesque but unluckily the very details of the scene proved so many hindrances to our progress we were always either clambering up or scrambling down or squeezing through chilly ice passages in the depths of narrow crevasses where there was barely room for our loads under dripping snow cornices in the faint glimmering light we could just discern cavernous vaults and closing blue pools of half-frozen water beyond these passages the view was bounded on all sides by thousands of white-crested seracs forming so tangled a labyrinth that it seemed impossible to find a way through it before long the fog closed about us more densely and a shout from the front warned us that it was useless to try to thread all these intricacies in a blinding mist and we were thus obliged to halt halfway up the icefall on a scanty level of a serac barely affording room for our tents the americans soon started off on the return journey while after a hasty meal we sought refuge under the hospitable canvas to escape from the unspeakable melancholy of this waste of ice shrouded in a cold gray wet mist for three whole days we were detained in this camp in the most obstinately bad weather it is possible to conceive the resolutely hostile mountain was meeting its invaders in a manner worthy of its fame snow began to fall heavily on the night of our arrival and on leaving our tents early the next morning twenty first july we found that the drifts had completely buried stoves utensils instruments and numerous miscellaneous objects left out the previous evening after a long patient search we succeeded in recovering all our belongings and carefully gathered them together to avoid losses which might entail serious inconvenience the appearance of our camp was now entirely changed the sides of the tents had caved in under the weight of the snow the very pegs were capped with big white heaps and even the ropes were covered with a thick layer of frost notwithstanding the waterproof qualities claimed for our canvas roofs the water was dripping through inside and we had to clear off the snow and tighten the ropes to try and put a stop to this very inconvenient leakage armed with axes and cooking utensils we set to work to dig trenches round the tents and get rid of the accumulated snow but it was falling so fast and so thickly that almost incessant labor was needed to prevent everything from being buried in a very short time there was a bank three feet high round the tents through the faintly rose-tinted mist one could discern on all sides the vague outlines of piled seracs bowed down as it were by their heavy load while around the camp the ice sloped steeply downwards to invisible depths steadily ceaselessly the noiseless white flakes fell from time to time the roar of an avalanche broke the oppressive silence a flight of stray birds doomed perhaps to perish of exhaustion on the ice fluttered through the mist and for a moment turned our thoughts to green woodlands and the stir of life fortunately bad weather in alaska is usually calm weather snow and rain are seldom accompanied by storms of wind we never saw either in the horizon or about the peaks the dark rounded thunderclouds which mean storms 
nor even a single flash of lightning footnote mr russell had a different experience at the end of august eighteen ninety one near the coast he was assailed by such violent hurricanes that he was driven to seek refuge in the forest all progress being impossible on the open moraine End footnote. all night and throughout the following day the snowfall continued only towards evening on the twenty third of july had we a few hours respite the thick fog curtain lifted gradually here and there first the near seracs emerged then peaks appeared for a moment soon to be hidden again behind drifting mists while now and then blue sky showed between the clouds there were continual fleeting glimpses of mountain crests lighted by an increasingly clear and brilliant radiance a succession of pictures appearing and disappearing as the mess floated this way and that until at last the whole valley lay revealed the layers of mist dividing seracs cliffs and crests into a series of terraces one above the other added to the grandeur of the scene delicate mist wreaths clung to the higher rocks torn into fringes and driven hither and thither by the breeze all around us were ridges of ice and the infinitely various and grotesque humps formed by the seracs laden with fresh snow the fleecy burden softens every curve and rounds every angle and edge of the fissures so that these alaskan seracs have a very different aspect from those of our alps which are real polyhedrons of ice hard and angular in form with smooth surfaces of cleavage soon the whole valley wakes to life in the sunshine and avalanches thunder on all sides enormous masses of stones ice and snow hurtle down from the lofty cliffs with prolonged rumblings with explosions and sharp volleys as of musketry repeated by multitudinous echoes the snow avalanches are the most beautiful of all their descent lasts whole minutes as they slide down giddy slopes leaping from cliff to cliff in dazzling white cascades with a dull continuous roar testifying to the enormous weight and velocity of the moving mass the entire aspect of the mountain walls is sensibly changed glittering ice needles and tangled cross lines of fracture break the uniform whiteness of the huge mass of snow innumerable furrows appear traced on every slope hitherto absolutely smooth and even the sun sinks slowly until it touches the peak of mount st elias then after seemingly lingering a while slowly sets shedding a dazzling light over the whole valley the air is clear as crystal peaks of rock and ice slender ridges fringed with snow cornices furrowed cliffs worn by the incessant fall of stones and by great avalanches of ice all stand out every detail defined with extraordinary clearness the temperature is sunk below zero and silence reigns once more in its frozen immobility the valley is a symbol of eternal duration serene and unchangeable at nightfall the mists settled down again and the peaks precipices and ice falls were enveloped in a shroud of increasing thickness fresh masses of vapor rose from below spreading in every direction choking every opening of the glacier every hollow of its flanks until by nine o'clock p m we were again imprisoned in the damp chill of the gray fog we had not been inactive during these days on the twenty first the guides went down to sledge camp and brought up fresh supplies on the twenty second in spite of the bad weather his royal highness pushed forward at the head of a caravan and found a track to the second plateau and on the twenty third the first loads of stores were transported thither during a short interval of sunshine on the morning of july twenty fourth two caravans set out in a heavy snowstorm to carry up a good part of the camp material and were back by eleven o'clock two hours later we started all together with the final loads the snow was still falling thickly and the refraction of the white mist was blinding it was impossible to realize the inclination of the slopes we walked like somnambulists mistaking shallow depressions for bottomless gulfs and scraping elbows and packs against walls of snow close beside us which we thought to be flat climbing seracs or marching along their edges we appeared to one another as shadowy giants on giddy heights and impossible slopes plunging apparently into space at every step one curious phenomenon caused by refraction was that while we could fairly distinguish the outlines of seracs about one hundred fifty feet distant we could see nothing that was close to us 
and the illusion was so complete that the leading guide occasionally sounded with his axe to ascertain if his next step would fall on snow or into empty space thus clambering over some blocks and skirting others scarcely conscious of the way we reached the second plateau the deep track marked out in the early morning was already snowed over but the guide showed marvelous ability in rediscovering and following up the trail the leader of the first party groped about with his feet for the beaten track beneath the snow outside that track one sank into the waist and all progress was impossible while even on it the snow lay more than knee-deep we were divided into three parties leading by turns for the guide in advance had to work so hard pushing his way through the snow that he could only do short spells during one of our brief halts a guide made the valley echo with a typical long-drawn mountain cry his voice had the strangest effect breaking the silence of the peaks an answering cry came from sela who had remained in the place selected in the early morning for the next camp and although we were still over forty-five minutes march from him his voice was as strong and distinct as though he were only fifty paces off soon afterwards the tents already pitched at the new camp came into sight and it seemed extraordinary that they should be visible at that distance through the mist it is impossible to judge the extent of one's field of vision in a mist unless there is some dark object on the snow to direct the eye both snow and air gave exactly the same impression of uniformly diffused white light seeing is no less hard than in the dark steering is also very difficult as we proved when we tried again to sight the tents after having turned our eyes elsewhere sometimes looking in every direction it took us a full minute to discover them although they were plainly in sight at last about five thirty we came up with sela a little gusty wind had now risen which drove the snow straight in our faces and we felt very cold hurrying on to the camp we pitched the remaining tents on firm foundations of snow formed by treading it down thoroughly before long we were all dining together under canvas we were cheerful in spite of weather for our confidence in the success of the expedition was unshaken the slightest lifting of the mist sufficed to dispel whatever doubt the inclemency of the weather and the continual fall of fresh snow might have awakened complicated wagers passed between us as to the height of mount st elias the result of our ascent and even as to the day and hour of attaining the summit we sat talking on into the evening by the faint light of our little alpine lanterns by this time there was as much as four hours of real night and the few candles packed with the provisions came into use the snow fell on the tents with a slight crackling sound to prevent it from caking we gave the canvas an occasional shake from inside as the accumulation of new fallen snow must have already effaced every sign of our track we began to feel rather anxious for our americans who would be on the newton glacier by now accordingly on the morning of the twenty fifth july his royal highness sent three guides back to meet them and put them in the right way if necessary while at the same time another party went on ahead to explore the third icefall the weather showed signs of improvement with alterations of sleet mist and sun the latter was still pale and hazy but grew stronger and brighter every day after being so long wrapped in fog we now had broken glimpses of the scenery about us we were not encamped in the middle of the glacier but near its right edge close to the southern buttress of the valley this spur projecting from the east side of mount st elias first runs up into a fine peak that is an exact copy much reduced of the great summit and then curves round clasping a considerable basin surmounted by an ice peak tipped by a daring white pinnacle that darts up into the sky like an obelisk this basin which descends to the second plateau of the newton contains a glacier which scales the walls that encircle it and covers them completely throughout their height his royal highness gave it the name of the savoy glacier the guide sent back by his royal highness to seek the porters remained absent two entire days and only returned to camp early on the twenty seventh a little ahead of the american party they had found the latter just preparing to go back after vain attempts to find their way besides provisions they brought us a welcome though unexpected packet of letters from italy which had come to yakutat by a coasting vessel and thanks to mr hendrickson had been conveyed by indians to an appointed place on the malaspina coast the weather now cleared up splendidly and our anxieties vanished early in the afternoon we struck camp and all set off leaving behind one of the whimper tents 
one stove the cooking utensils and some more articles of clothing our march was a short but very fatiguing one owing to the bad state of the snow it brought us over the foot of the third ice fall to the real seracs where the steepest part of the ascent begins on the previous day a party had gone without loads to beat a track through the snow taking two hours to cover two hundred fifty feet of road and had been followed by a second party with part of the baggage nevertheless we found it hard and unpleasant work to struggle along in deep uneven ruts which often gave way under our weight the next camp was pitched at seven thousand four hundred thirty one feet on a narrow strip of snow between a wide crevasse and a sheer cliff of serac about sixty feet in height fringes of snow were continually breaking off from the narrow cornice at the upper edge of the serac and slipping down on our tent flaps with a rustling as of silk our camp was now reduced to three tents one for the guides one for our party of four and a small mummery tent occupied by his royal highness the following day twenty eighth of july we carried up everything in two journeys to the highest plateau of the newton glacier at the top of the valley by skirting to the right round the serac overhanging the camp we managed to climb the mass and going on to its farthest edge found a deep crevasse nearly one hundred feet wide yawning at our feet fortunately a narrow snow ridge projected from the serac on which we stood and slanted down across the great fissure to the opposite and lower edge we cautiously ventured onto this slender causeway taking care to place our feet exactly in the centre since both sides were precipitous and covered with loose snow that broke away at the slightest touch the passage effected we made our way over masses of ice connected by shaky bridges of almost loose snow most of which were either broken or incomplete all of us broke through more than once but by careful use of the rope no accident occurred through the great holes with jagged margins produced by these stumbles we saw mysterious azure caverns deep below of the most marvellous blue ever created by snow with a sheen like watered silk and brilliant almost metallic reflections at last we emerged from this labyrinth of ice blocks at the head of the ice fall in the great upper basin of the newton at this point the glacier has an undulating surface and we found it so loaded with snow that the crevasses if there were any were all hidden this basin is two miles in width and about three in length and is overhung by the walls of mount st elias of the coal and of mount newton turning towards the middle of the plateau we pitched our camp within a mile of the outlet of the basin out of reach of the avalanches threatening to fall on every side we were now at eight thousand six hundred sixty one feet above sea level directly over us rose the vast pyramid of mount st elias which had a bulky flattened aspect seen thus foreshortened the almost rectilinear north northeastern ridge sloped at a moderate angle broken here and there by seracs which did not look formidable half way up and a little below three groups of black crags break the pure snow line while above these the arete rose without interruption to a huge buttress of ice beyond which was the rounded dome of the peak the wall rising to the coal was rather steep save for a triangular rock island exactly in the middle it was entirely covered with snow above and to the right of this cliff the slope was broken up into seracs but towards the left it showed smooth and looked easy of ascent although not quite free from danger of avalanches of ice and stones from the northeast flank of mount st elias on the twenty ninth of july three guides started ahead to pick out the way and cut steps up the wall of the coal his royal highness with a small party returned down to our preceding camp to bring up provisions the light mists which had floated all day about the mountain sides and peaks melted away in the cool of the evening and a cloudless night began end of chapter seven chapter eight of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Phil Schempf. The Ascent of Mount St. Elias. Called up at one o'clock a.m., July 30th, we set about preparing for the penultimate stage of the ascent. The coal between Mount Newton and St. Elias was to be climbed that day. Thence we hoped, by the long northeast ridge, to win the great peak on the following morning. So confident were we now of success that hope amounted almost to certainty. 
the supplies to be taken with us had been most carefully chosen and comprised the following articles two whimper tents ten sleeping bags rations for two and a half days one petroleum cooking stove one spirit lamp ditto meteorological instruments the smaller of sailors photographic machines gonella's small camera and a few extra flannels we started at four o'clock divided into three parties along the route marked out by the guides who had prepared a track right up to the coal on the previous day it was a bright cold morning with a perfectly clear sky the snow was firm enough in the beaten track but loose everywhere else and covered with a thin crust of ice that gave under our feet the strip of plateau extending for about two miles and a half ahead to the flank of the coal lies at the very foot of the northeast face of st elias this face is rocky at the steeper parts but showed almost everywhere a coating of ice overlapping its precipices that threatened us with formidable avalanches the condition of the snow warned us of this danger seeing that for a stretch of over one mile it was no longer loose but hardened avalanche snow which crackled under the nails of our shoes and was thickly sprinkled with serac fragments fallen from a height of over three thousand feet fortunately for us most of the accumulated fresh snow had already come down during the past three days of fine weather and the rest of it had had time to harden a little but what chiefly served to keep the ice safely bound to the precipitous rocks was the intense cold of the early morning after about an hour's march the slope of the glacier gradually began to increase and we soon reached the foot of the cliff where the real ascent begins the wall rises in a series of somewhat steep slopes separated by great transversal crevasses and varying from four hundred to six hundred feet in height we zigzagged obliquely up these snow slopes the surface of which was pretty good for long stretches where the guides had found it necessary to cut steps on the previous day the first crevasse immediately beneath the isolated rock that projects from the middle of the wall cost us some trouble and nearly half an hour's labor the first two caravans crossed it easily enough by a snow bridge but this broke down when attempted by Sela, the leader of the third rope after searching vainly for some solid foothold on the snow vault the third party finally managed to reach the other side by leaping boldly across the gap in the bridge but the last guide unluckily dropped his jacket as he jumped and had to be let down to a good depth in the fissure to recover it keeping to the left of the rocks we then mounted to the second crevasse which cuts straight across the steep incline in such a way that its upper edge overlaps the lower one like a roof leaving an interval of about seven feet at a short distance however along the lower side we discovered a point where the edges drew a little closer together by mounting on a guide's shoulders we managed to get safely across and our loads were hauled up after us another snow slope a last and easily negotiated crevasse and then about ten o'clock a m we landed on the top of the coal our tents were pitched a little beneath the crest on the east side facing the newton glacier twelve thousand two hundred ninety seven feet above the sea and three thousand six hundred thirty six feet higher than our previous camp his royal highness named the coal after i c russell who was the first to conquer it in eighteen ninety one as soon as we reached the coal we turned eager glances to the new region revealed to us towards the northwest at our feet we beheld a very extensive level glacier covered with snow and with no signs of crevasses but its eastern and western boundaries were hidden from us by the mountains at either side beyond the portion fronting us lay an interminable stretch of snow and ice an infinite series of low mountain chains bristling with numberless jagged sharp pointed and precipitous peaks where rocks and ice fields were closely intermingled towards the horizon we had a confused view of some very high ranges we realized that from the summit we should see the whole of this region more distinctly mapped out the view to the north was blocked by mount newton which now took the shape of a sharp pointed snow cone just to its left and farther back we discerned the pinnacled rock forming the western extremity of the logan chain from mount newton an irregular ridge runs down to the coal edged to the north by a bulky snow cornice and cut by deep indentations forming the heads of the gullies of stones and ice which score the mountainside towards newton glacier the great ridge of mount st elias is of wholly dissimilar structure for being so wide it resembles a slope and cannot easily be identified with the even straight crest seen from below 
viewed from the coal it appears to be broken by projections of varying steepness amongst which three distinct clusters of rocks rise above the snow while the wide rounded summit seems to soar upwards at a short distance from the last group of crags and apparently very little higher whereas from the valley below these rocks seem to stand about midway between the coal and the summit of the mountain beneath the newton and st elias ridges the mountain sides become precipitous masses of snow ice and rock set loose by the first rays of the morning sun thunder and hurtle down into the valley with a roar which reaches us distinctly raising clouds of pulverized ice in their descent more than three thousand feet below us the spacious newton valley descends to the east at this distance the ice cascades with their piled seracs seem mere tracks of rugged wrinkled glacier between the smooth level plateaus we identified all the peaks around us and in the depth beneath the white flat stretch of the malaspina glacier bounded by its black lines of forest and marginal moraine beyond and more than sixty-two miles off lies the blue expanse of yakutat bay the afternoon hours pass rapidly and almost unheeded and the pure cold evening is an omen of splendid weather for the morrow northwards all is cold shade under a steel blue sky but the rest of the horizon is orange red little by little mount augusta crimsons like a fiery volcano the thermometer is at eighteen degrees fahrenheit and a chill northwest wind drives us to our tents lying down closely packed in these narrow shelters we try to get some rest to fit us for the last and most serious effort but most of us are too excited by the thought of the morrow's task to be able to sleep at midnight we all turn out and swallow a bowl of hot coffee before packing the loads these consist of one day's rations a small spirit stove a mercurial barometer two aneroids a hygrometer spirit and mercurial thermometer and photographic apparatus the night is perfectly clear and still venus shines serenely over the summit of mount newton the temperature stands at eighteen degrees fahrenheit we are roped in three separate parties his royal highness lieutenant cogni and the two guides pedagax and maquinaz are on the first rope gonela with crew and bota on the second sela and myself with pelissier on the third we are too excited to talk we feel that we are on the very point of realizing the hope which has sustained us through prolonged days of toil and through the painful anxiety which during the last stages kept us questioning the barometer or the direction of the wind every few minutes the crest of the ridge where it reaches the coal forms an ice cliff which we skirt on the right the powdery surface snow is very unequally distributed here and there leaving uncovered the harder layer beneath in which steps have to be cut by the first guide pedagax and machinaz go on in front each taking the lead for half an hour in turn and we all mount rapidly at a steady pace on reaching the top of the cliff we cross to the east flank of the ridge running down to newton valley where the snow is firmer being more exposed to the sun the surface is uneven and ribbed reminding us of winter snow slopes in the alps about an hour's climb we come to the first rocks which are formed of black splinters of diorite round which we soon make our way through the snow a little higher up while skirting a fissured hump of ice blasts of frozen north wind drive the powdery snow against our faces far above us the summit is gilded by the first rays of the sun and gradually the great golden disk rises to the right of mount newton as we climb higher this summit rapidly sinks and before long we see its peak beneath us while behind it and more than twenty miles off rises the south flank of the logan chain towards five o'clock a m we reach the last crags and speedily surmounted them footnote these crags about fourteen thousand five hundred feet above the sea form the highest point attained by russell in eighteen ninety one in making the ascent one does not approach the intermediate rock group seen from below but passes it at some distance to the left End footnote. our ascent was favored by completely calm weather and an ideal temperature unusual in the high mountains neither inconveniently cold nor oppressively hot at six thirty his royal highness calls a short halt we breakfast and were off again in half an hour soon the aneroids proved that we had reached the altitude of mont blanc about fifteen thousand seven hundred feet 
and some of our party began to feel the diminished pressure in the shape of palpitation and difficult breathing which although too slight to impede progress yet sufficed to suggest that some of us might be prevented from reaching the summit at eight o'clock cogni arranged his instruments and took meteorological observations we were now at an altitude of over sixteen thousand five hundred feet and the temperature was sixteen to seventeen degrees fahrenheit there was an extraordinarily fine view to the east the peak of mount augusta although now beneath our level preserved its daring grandeur of outline but the logan chain to the north was the most majestic of all on our right stretched the vast precipitous north crest of st elias all rocky save the upper portion which was covered with snow about midway it is broken by a towering crag at whose feet a small glacier descends from the ridge around us there was nothing but dazzling snow its whiteness just softened by faint opalescent tinges of color the observations being duly registered we resumed our way up the tiring monotonous slope less than sixteen hundred feet now separate us from the summit but they will cost us more labor than the four thousand two hundred already won almost all of us are suffering more or less from the rarefaction of the air some being attacked by headache others by serious difficulty of breathing and general exhaustion his royal highness slackens the pace of his caravan and sometimes calls a halt to wait for those who have fallen in the rear he is determined to keep us all together knowing the sense of discouragement felt by any one left behind by the rest of the party the ascent is very monotonous on the whole and perfectly easy leading either over the great rounded hump of the crest or along its eastern flank luckily there is only a thin stratum of loose snow so that one barely sinks into it ankle deep while now and again we strike a belt of hard snow in which the leading guide has to cut steps with a few strokes of his axe before long we all experience those alterations of hope and disappointment which are typical symptoms of over fatigue every slope ahead seems as though it must be the last every ice pinnacle is mistaken for the great gendarme near the top of the crest which we had discerned from below even the guides make strange blunders regarding the extent of the slope still to be won our rate of progress is now of the slowest we climb for ten minutes then rest for five or six one or two of us lie down panting on the snow some sit or crouch while others take the rest standing and lean on their ice axes his royal highness sela and two of the guides are the only persons showing no signs of distress gonela suffers from headache cogni myself and vota have to fight against the drowsiness which comes over us at every halt the two remaining guides have slight symptoms of mountain sickness our legs seem heavy as lead every step requires a distinct effort of the will and we get on by dint of certain devices familiar to all who have made a sense when tired out leaning both hands on top of the knees or planting the ice axe in the snow ahead and dragging the body up to it while at every step we pause for breath still we manage to climb somehow we are spurred on by excitement and our nerves are strung to the highest pitch at last after untold disappointments a little after eleven o'clock a sharp ice pinnacle soared above us and to the right of it and somewhat higher the ample curve of the snow dome for some minutes past no one had spoken a word suddenly we all exclaimed the summit only an ice slope about a hundred and fifty feet high still had to be surmounted it was steep and in our exhausted condition we had to attack it in a slanting direction resting for breath every few steps on reaching the top of this incline we again came to a halt before us rose gently towards the west a slope which in the dazzling light appeared to be of vast extent we had actually passed from the crest to the eastern limit of the terminal dome and scarcely realized that we were so near to the summit the leading caravan started ahead the two others lagged about a hundred and fifty feet behind suddenly we saw the leading guides pedagax and maquinaz move aside to make way for the prince they were within a few paces of the top his royal highness stepped forward and was the first to plant his foot on the summit we hastened breathlessly to join in his triumph hurrah every trace of fatigue disappeared in the joy of success this moment was the reward of our thirty-eight days of labor and hardship it was the thirty-first of july a quarter to twelve a m a few minutes later 
his royal highness hoisted our little tricolor flag on an ice axe and we nine gathered round him to join in his hearty shout for italy and the king then all pressed the hand of the prince who had so skilfully led the expedition and had maintained our courage and strength to the last by the force of his inspiring example our excitement was of short duration once our object was attained we experienced the inevitable reaction after so many months devoted to the pursuit of one idea nevertheless it was needful to pull ourselves together and set to work taking observations it was the most favorable hour for them at midday mr hendrickson at yakutat always registered the indications given by the meteorological instruments we had left in his charge therefore it was most important that simultaneous observations should be noted on the summit of st elias the fortin barometer marked a pressure of fifteen inches two lines with the due corrections and rectifications it indicated an altitude of eighteen thousand ninety feet which very nearly agreed with the angular calculation made by mr russell in eighteen ninety one fixing the height at eighteen thousand one hundred feet all preceding calculations had proved discordant and untrustworthy only one gave an approximately correct result namely that made by the italian navigator malaspina in 1792 fixing the altitude of mount st elias at 17847 feet footnote in chapter 4 i have already given the principal observations on the altitude of mount st elias taken by explorers of that region i now add the most recent made in 1892-93 by j e mcgrath of the u s coast survey kindly communicated to us by professor j c russell this fixes the height of mount st elias at eighteen thousand twenty four feet End footnote. we had risen five thousand seven hundred ninety three feet from the coal to the summit the ascent had occupied ten hours and a half but we must deduct from this the thirty minutes spent over lunch and another half hour devoted to meteorological observations during the first five hours we had climbed three thousand four hundred feet at an average rate of six hundred eighty feet per hour and twenty four hundred feet in the last four hours and a half at an average rate of about six hundred feet an hour the summit of mount st elias consists of a spacious plateau stretching with a slight inclination from southeast to northwest the highest point stands north and forms a raised platform about forty square yards in extent the temperature in the sun stood at ten degrees fahrenheit there was no wind but a light breeze sufficed to chill us we found some shelter a few yards from the top and without leaving the terminal dome here we sat down to take some refreshment trying to overcome the repugnance to food induced by fatigue and mountain sickness beneath us on every side lay an indescribable panorama glittering in the intense midday light only the malaspina glacier and the sea were covered by a low-hanging curtain of fog in every other direction the horizon was perfectly clear the enormous extent of snow fields glaciers and mountains revealed to our sight surpassed all imagination those majestic peaks which two days before towered above us while we were painfully struggling through the snows of newton glacier now lay at our feet we traced along the valleys the long course we had followed while memory recalled difficulties and obstacles now lost in the distance often had we turned longing glances from the depths towards this small ledge outlined against the sky as if imploring encouragement from the lofty summit the peak of mount augusta still imposing although nearly four thousand feet below us now assumed the form of a huge pyramid turning a rocky face southwards but covered on the north side with ice that spreads up to the terminal cupola beyond the seward glacier soars mount cook and to the left of this another and more remote snow summit that must be either mount hubbard or mount irving but which of the two is hard to decide from the sea of mist shrouding the malaspina glacier the higher peaks of the samovar and hitchcock chains thrust up like isolated rocks lastly in the far distance to the southeast we distinguish the summit of mount fairweather about twenty miles away to the north and running parallel with the newton augusta range we see the vast chain of mount logan the sole competitor disputing the supremacy of mount st elias footnote mr russell who first discovered and gave a name to this mountain in eighteen ninety assigned it a height of nineteen thousand five hundred feet j e mcgrath gave it that of nineteen thousand five hundred thirty nine feet 
as far back as eighteen thirty eight topham had already judged that the highest point of the mountain system would be found north of st elias having observed that the chief bulk of the guyot and malaspina glaciers came down from the region situated north and northeast of that peak from the summit of st elias we failed to prove the superior height of mount logan at so great a distance observation with the prismatic compass gave only negative results later on however during the return voyage off the fairweather coast we noticed that the logan peak disappeared from the horizon while the whole terminal cone of st elias was still clearly visible russell had already made the same observation in eighteen ninety one End footnote. the lengthy crest constituting its summit rises gradually from west to east in an almost uninterrupted arete without depressions or deep coals broken only by a few rocky pinnacles and ice domes and reaching its greatest height in a snow peak at the eastern extremity after this point the crest makes a sudden dip running on in a series of lesser heights which after bounding the north side of seward glacier turn in a wide curve towards mount cook and are then blocked from view by mount augusta likewise to the west the crest falls rapidly and ends in a series of short spurs among the lower hills the southern face of the chain which is in full view from base to summit is about ten thousand feet high and extremely wild and picturesque throughout the whole extent it is composed of precipitous crags intersected by piled glaciers having the aspect of avalanches suddenly checked in their career going down the very steep incline and frozen fast to the rocks short low spurs start from the base of the great wall and project into the seward glacier while the numerous ice fields filling the intervening hollows cover the foot of the chain and run up it in wedges here and there to a considerable height the space lying between mount logan and the newton augusta chain forms the basin from which the seward glacier takes its origin and its size is duly proportioned to the great ice stream issuing from it from the western extremity of mount logan starts a ridge stretching farther south than the others apparently running into the newton augusta chain thus closing the seward basin on the west and separating it from another huge glacier that spreads to the feet of russell coal and of the north and northwest flanks of st elias this glacier of even greater extent than the seward forms a vast snow level showing no fissures on its surface we could trace its course for a long distance westward without being able to determine how and where it comes to an end the ridge which appears to divide it from the seward is certainly very low and seems to run uninterruptedly between the two glaciers but it cannot be traced very clearly from the summit of st elias as to the new glacier now discovered the absence of crevasses and the difficulty of distinguishing the real trend of smooth slopes of snow from a lofty post made it impossible to form any decided opinion as to the direction of this new current of ice whether it finally issued to the west or the north its course seemed to us to lie at about the same level as the second plateau of the newton i e at from six thousand four hundred to six thousand five hundred feet his royal highness gave it the name of columbus glacier the whole northwest region to the left of mount logan is an unexplored waste of glaciers and mountains a vast zone bristling with sharp peaks and crags rugged and precipitous to the south snow covered to the north and surrounded by vast snow fields free from crevasses and connected with each other by the snowy coals of the mountain chains the medium altitude of the snow fields is about seven thousand feet and that of the mountains from nine thousand to ten thousand feet no words can express the desolation of this immeasurable waste of ice which russell has compared with the ice sheet that covers greenland no smallest trace of vegetation can be discerned on it no running water no lake it might be a tract of primitive chaos untouched by the harmonizing forces of nature surveying this strange scene we realize for the first time that we are close to the limits of the mysterious polar world such is the region forming the northwest boundary of the columbus glacier numerous tributaries pour into the latter from the lower hills and the most considerable of these affluents running into the columbus on the immediate left of mount logan was named by his royal highness after quintino sela the illustrious pioneer of italian alpinism on the far horizon somewhere between fifty and one hundred miles off a broad summit towered up behind the western corner of mount logan which was ascertained by the compass to be at three hundred and twenty eight degrees 
his royal highness named this peak lucania in remembrance of the ship that had brought us to america west of this new peak at about the same distance and due north of st elias we descried another mountain at three hundred and twenty six degrees which we believe to be identical with the peak christened mount bear by russell in eighteen ninety one finally to the northwest some two hundred miles off a conical peak soared up at three hundred eleven degrees apparently of even greater height than the other two this was christened the bona after a racing yacht then belonging to his royal highness these three peaks really seem to rival mount st elias in height and must approach eighteen thousand feet in height none of them showed any signs of volcanic activity while we scanned the wide prospect endeavoring to fix in our memory every detail of the wondrous scene multitudinous thoughts and feelings crowded upon us the labyrinth of dark lines the pure white plains the chaos of rock and ice blended in our minds with familiar scenes of marvellous beauty in our own alpine world but sheer physical weariness soon unfits the mind for contemplation of so much supernatural grandeur we feel vaguely crushed by the immensity a desolating sense of isolation comes to us from those infinite wastes of ice and from the solemn oppressive silence of nature once the first excitement worn off we are dazed by the radiance of the sunlight striking through the cold air we suffer from distress caused by the altitude and before long our only desire is to hasten down the peak as fast as we can by one o'clock p m we had gathered up our few possessions arranged the different caravans and begun the descent in the same order observed during the climb we had spent an hour and a half on the summit long glissades bore us quickly down the slopes we had so laboriously toiled up and the few crevasses being mostly filled with snow were easily crossed a little wind blowing in sudden gusts swept the face of the mountain and assailed us with volleys of ice dust as we drew near to the coal the snow was in worse condition and we had to plow through it knee-deep for long intervals nevertheless we got on fast slipping falling regaining our feet plastered with snow from head to foot but eager to reach camp to escape from all that blinding white glare into the comforting shade of our tents between four and five o'clock p m we overtook on the coal his royal highness's caravan which had descended the great snow slope in two hours and a half we had only a little broken sleep that night and awoke early on the first of august in a very battered aching and stiffened condition the same evening we camped again on the upper newton plateau end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the Ascent of Mount Saint Elias, Alaska, by Filippo de Filippi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Return from Mount Saint Elias to Yakutat. On the second of August, the morning after our ascent of the peak, we began the long return journey without even a day's rest. In fact, our downward course was no less hastened by the wish to reach home than our ascent had been spurred by the ambition of winning the summit of Mount St. Elias. But the nature of our task was totally different. Now every detail of the route was thoroughly familiar, whereas during the ascent every step demanded an alertness of mind and eye that kept us on the strain, in looking out for obstacles ahead, and devising ways to overcome them before they were reached everything had been carefully arranged beforehand to avoid delay in the descent as we had no reason to fear unexpected obstacles our equipment was now reduced to the barest necessities and we were free from anxiety with regard to supplies his royal highness with wise forethought had made the porters deposit stores of provisions at certain points along the route carefully chosen so as to correspond with the length of each day's march naturally the stages were twice or even three times as long as those accomplished on the ascent so that on the way down we only made nine camps instead of twenty-one but the halting places selected were usually on the site of our former encampments on the second of august therefore we left the upper basin and went down to the third ice fall of the newton the snow was so bad even on the track that we sank in knee-deep at every few steps as all carried heavy loads the march was both slow and laborious the ice bridges were insecure and some of them broken down so that fresh passages had to be found across the crevasses 
presently too the fine weather of the previous days began to change for the worse great banks of violet-hued clouds obscured the eastern sky the augusta chain was suffused with a pale livid light as one summit after another disappeared while mount augusta itself was swathed in thick clouds until gradually the whole prospect was blotted out mount st elias was the last peak to vanish we camped on the second plateau of the newton near the mouth of the savoy glacier where on the way up we had left one of the whimper tents two feet deep in the snow but during the past five days of fine weather the surface of the glacier had melted to such an extent that the site of this tent being sheltered from the rays of the sun now emerged like a small terrace above the surrounding ice we passed the whole of the next day third august in this camp waiting for the american porters and rearranging the packs about eleven o'clock a distant shout was heard across the misty level standing outside the tents we watched with strange emotion the approach of shadowy forms struggling slowly up through the heavily falling snow at a hundred paces from us their leader ingram halted shouting out did you reach the top yes all of you all of us their loud hurrahs echoed through the valley and we again felt the exultation of that moment of victory as though it had been scarcely realized before ingram had only five men with him the rest had gone back to yakutat to resume their work as sailors on board the aggie with the help of these porters we were able to carry down the whole of the baggage and so had not to retrace our steps and fetch it by installments that evening the weather cleared again and became really fine the valley slumbered in shadow while the summits above us glistened softly in the moonlight on the fourth of august after crossing the second newton plateau we descended the long ice fall leading to the lower level and proceeded as far as the little lake among the seracs where we had camped on the way up the peaks were now wreathed with swirling mists that assumed a thousand different shapes as they drove hither and thither in the wind mount st elias towered sullenly over the huge cloud banks hanging about its flanks still heavier mists clung round the seracs pierced here and there by rays of sunlight reflected in countless iridescent rays from the masses of ice while avalanches thundered unceasingly down the lofty rock walls the scattered detachments of our party moving far ahead slowly and noiselessly over steep seracs or crossing treacherous snow bridges bore a strange resemblance to men groping their way and hiding behind boulders to escape lurking foes one day's march from the lake camp took us over the rest of the newton glacier and down to the edge of the agassiz where we pitched our tents saluted as we emerged from the great valley by a final salvo from its avalanches two eyes still dazzled by the immaculate purity of the newton glacier the agassiz appeared yellow and dirty we found notable changes in this glacier the seracs were less prominent the hollows less deep the whole surface was shrunken and leveled on the sixth of august we resumed the tedious labor of portage by sledge our baggage was so much reduced that two sledges sufficed to carry it a march of seven hours took us across the agassiz glacier and up to the dome pass in spite of having to maneuver the sledges over many transversal crevasses which had been concealed under firm snow on the ascent and finally we went down from dome pass to make camp on the west side of the seward glacier on the seventh and eighth of august we crossed the seward and descended the valley by the track we had followed on the ascent that is to say by pinnacle glacier and skirting the base of the hitchcock chain the weather was now changeable slight showers of rain alternating with mists and sunshine but by this time we had become indifferent to moisture and no longer took pains to keep our tents dry or make ourselves comfortable we noticed a marked change in the appearance of the mountains and glaciers the wintry shroud that enveloped all the slopes a month earlier had now vanished away the snow fields had melted and the imposing ice falls of the hitchcocks were reduced to small glaciers flowing down from modest heights the mountain spurs jutting out into the malaspina were now black and apparently much lower the lofty peaks which encircled the seward glacier stood out more grandly and were more impressive in contrast with this dark foreground wherever the melting snow had laid the earth bare a luxuriant growth of flowering plants had sprung up knee-high with incredible rapidity rich in color and fragrance 
Mr. Russell's experience was repeated for us, since we too found many different species all blooming at once. Here were summer lupins side by side with spring violets and with autumnal asters and gentians. The warm season is so short in this region that the plants have no time to flower in due succession. Even the seward was considerably altered. The drop in the glacier, north of the entrance to Dome Pass, which on our ascent was only visible for a brief extent on the flank of the north bastion of Pinnacle Glacier, being cleared of the heavy layer of snow that had masked its outline, was now seen to be a really great ice fall, spreading across the whole length of the seward. The surface snow ceases immediately below the junction of the seward with the Pinnacle Glacier accordingly the limit of perpetual snow in the mount st elias region would lie about three thousand feet above the level of the sea footnote according to mr russell first expedition eighteen ninety the snow limit would be rather lower down at the terminal cascade of the seward i e at about two thousand and odd feet it may be that the snow line is now retreating a phenomenon possibly connected with the gradual shrinking of the glaciers in this region of which russell found proof perhaps the same explanation would apply to the difference of the glacier's appearance and rate of movement as noted by russell in eighteen ninety from our observations of the same in eighteen ninety seven to which allusion has been made at page one hundred eleven End footnote beneath this limit only irregular patches are found of old yellowish snow on the seracs which display their bare, greenish ice at all sides. Hundreds of blue lakelets are now to be seen among the labyrinth of ice blocks. At the edges of the glacier, the two dark lines formed by the detritus-soiled seracs, which act as marginal moraines, are much more marked than before. The only spot where we were now compelled to unload the sledges and carry the baggage on our backs was the steep descent from the Pinnacle to the Hitchcock Glacier on all the other slopes which we had so painfully climbed bearing heavy packs the guides managed with remarkable skill and strength to get the sledges down without removing the baggage now checking their pace with ropes now executing brilliant glissades while propping up and supporting their cumbersome loads thereby exciting the earnest admiration of the americans our old track along the strip of snow at the foot of the hitchcock hills had now caved in to below the level of the seward on the evening of the 8th of August, we camped in a little cleft of the Hitchcock Hills, near the extremity of the chain. Footnote. The same hollow, to which Ganela and Sela had climbed the previous month, when seeking the most practicable route for the conveyance of our baggage from the Malaspina up to the Seward Glacier. End footnote. Our tents were pitched on blocks of old snow, surrounded by a network of channels which uniting at the outlet to the depression formed a torrent running into the malaspina through a deep gully in the flank of the hitchcock looking across the narrow coal we saw as if through a window the immense malaspina about six hundred twenty feet below us a huge white expanse with a silvery glitter and glaucous reflections early next morning we carried our baggage down to the malaspina and descending the hitchcock gully found ourselves in the dry bed of the small lake that formerly washed its base this basin was full of mud and stones and studded with big lumps of dirty ice which had previously floated on the surface and had been deposited at the bottom as the lake emptied hence we mounted to the malaspina moraine more than half a mile in width which had been covered with snow at the beginning of july this brought us to the bare glacier where we cast off our loads and repacked them on the sledges. At first we found the ice cut by numerous crevasses, only a few feet wide, and with a rough, uneven surface bristling with icicles. Presently the crevasses grew fewer, the ice became smoother, furrowed by innumerable rivulets, and with scattered holes of varying size and depth, filled with water or slush. The thin crust of ice covering these depressions often gave way and plunged us knee-deep and more in the freezing water some too were so broad that it was impossible to avoid them and we had to wade through the water for a considerable distance when packing the sledges we had taken care to place uppermost all articles that would be most hurt by a wetting but it was hard to keep anything dry at about two miles distance from the moraine we found a fair depth of snow on the glacier but it was not continuous being often interrupted by wide belts of naked ice 
now and then we came to wide round holes more than three hundred feet in diameter the sides of which converged in the form of a wide-mouthed funnel at the depth of about twenty to thirty feet the ice at the bottom of these entonnoirs was of the same character as that on the surface of the glacier and was without cracks or crevices it may be that these deep hollows in the surface are owed to the falling in of the roofs of lower caverns at a greater depth once filled with water only an occasional small stone was found on the glacier the weather was splendid the air fresh and breezy the chains were uncovered and particularly distinct from mount st elias to the heights of disenchantment bay the south ridge of mount st elias stood out clearly merging into the long chain of the shea hills which as they approached the malaspina glacier assumed a series of strange shapes which we were long unable to comprehend for their outlines underwent changes before our eyes assuming the forms of spires belfries minarets and architectural outlines of fantastic cathedrals all of which slowly appeared and disappeared to be succeeded by buildings of lesser height severely rectilinear this proved to be the mirage known as the silent city an optical illusion to which this wide ice surface is prone in common with the burning sands of the desert footnote mr russell also beheld these phantom cities at twilight on the sea among the icebergs at the head of yakutat bay the same phenomenon has been often observed in glacier bay at the front of the muir glacier and in the wonders of alaska by badlam san francisco 1891 the author gives a full account of it at page 130 possibly certain marvelous tales reported by prospectors exploring the interior of alaska in search of gold may have been founded on mirages of this kind End footnote. the marvelous spectacle continued throughout the whole afternoon in the uniform whiteness stretching around us the eye was continually deceived apparently we could see to a great distance indeed to the very horizon but if one of our party walked a few hundred feet ahead he would disappear out of sight behind the neighboring slope that actually limited our vision towards evening we camped in the center of the glacier abundance of water was easily obtained by digging a small well in the ice night fell at nine thirty p m on the line of intense whiteness bounding the vast plain of ice at the horizon a great yellow moon shed irregular splashes of light through the deep indigo clouds massed in the sky at this latitude the full moon does not mount to the zenith as with us but describes a low arc in the southern heaven and speedily disappears to the southwest on the following morning tenth of august at seven thirty under a sullen sky we resumed our journey over ice and snow and across extensive belts of slush during the previous day we had managed to keep our proper course by occasionally discovering some signs of our former sledge track but now all indications failed and his royal highness steered the caravan by the compass as on the ascent soon the air began to thicken and for about two hours we were wrapped in a slight fog that gave signs of increasing luckily a few gusts of wind then rose and drove it away so that progress became easier after three or four hours march we noticed that the snow was diminishing and that the belts of naked ice were becoming wider and more frequent a sign that we were approaching the brink of the plateau at last towards one o'clock p m on climbing a frozen ridge we suddenly came in view of the marginal moraine and the bay far out at sea in the sound formed by manby point we clearly distinguished the white sails of the yacht aggie that was waiting for us off the coast his royal highness's calculations had been so accurate that aided as we had been on the whole by favorable conditions we were able after accomplishing the ascent to meet the vessel at the very date he had fixed between the tenth and eleventh of august we felt as joyful and excited as mariners on sighting land after a long voyage and not in the least discouraged by the fact that several miles had to be traversed before reaching the moraine the tract of glacier before us was completely bare and sloped gently towards our goal in wide undulations we hurried over it almost at a run now pushing the sledges now holding them back they slid along the hard surface with the utmost ease passing over ridges and mounds of ice leaping cracks and crevasses with such tremendous jolts and jars that every moment we expected to see them shattered to pieces 
the guides were as merry as boys and flew down steep slopes clinging to the sledges this part of the glacier was of the same character as the upper end at the base of the mountains the surface was seamed by countless little torrents of clear water murmuring along beds of transparent ice and ending their course in crevasses or in glacier mills these mills moulins are bottomless wells with marvellous blue walls of changing shades of colour furrowed and hollowed by streams which dash furiously down them into invisible depths resounding with the roar of hidden waters now and then we come to an empty water tunnel piercing the glacier obliquely and more than one is large enough for a man to pass through the glacier is either level with its surface stained by a thin layer of mud and bristling with sharp needles and blades of ice or undulating and covered with a crust-like white coral composed of minute frost flowers cut and jagged in every direction by the effects of the thaw the appearance of the moraine was so entirely altered that none of us could have recognized the spot whence we had started on the ascent without the help of the porters the latter having frequently returned there for supplies had observed the gradual change on the first of july the moraine terminated in a straight line at the edge of the snow which covered the whole glacier at that date as the snow melted long tongues of moraine were displayed from six hundred to one thousand feet wide projecting at a sharp angle from the edge of the marginal moraine and running into the glacier for a mile or so from east to west divided one from the other by tracks of bare ice a mile or two in width russell names these formations peniform moraines and they represent portions of median moraines about four o'clock we arrived at the first of these strips it ran level with the glaciers and was composed of irregularly mixed boulders and stones of varying size with bare ice between we did not dream of unloading the sledges for no obstacles were now allowed to check our course in a few minutes a sort of track was made across the moraine by shoveling aside the bigger blocks for some distance ahead and we got the sledges along by dint of all tugging together then we pushed on in frantic haste leaping crevasses and wading all the rivulets and streams in the way never losing time to look out the easiest passage never once turning back the porter's sledge was capsized but we righted it on its runners in a flash and sped down all the slopes without pausing barely halting now and then to draw breath before a hard bit the sledges were half smashed the loads disordered and all awry but if things tumbled out they were hastily pitched in again without stopping the vehicles a second tongue of moraine was soon reached and traversed then another and we rapidly neared the site of our third camp at the top of the marginal moraine we passed it without stopping and continued our course along a tongue of ice ending in a steep descent towards the nook between the last peniform strip and the hem of the marginal moraine the sledges were borne down the slope by their own impetus rapidly at first still held back by the men but soon to be let go at a headlong speed and scarcely steered until they were finally brought to a stop by crashing into the big boulders at the edge of the main frontal moraine it was lucky their work was done for they were utterly wrecked by this time it was six o'clock p m and we had been on the march for more than ten hours we were worn out but unspeakably glad to be off the ice the camp was pitched in moraine mud and stones at the base of some enormous rocks and close to two sledges empty tins and split flour sacks relics of the last camp of the bryant expedition after forty days in the snow we slept for the first time on stones and ice in ten days we had come down the whole of the glacier zone that we had taken thirty to ascend on the following morning eleventh of august we went down to the shore retaining only our instruments personal equipment and a few other things we left all the rest of the baggage behind at the top of the moraine we turned round to give an affectionate and even regretful farewell to our tents they had become very weather-stained leaky and tattered but nevertheless showed sturdy fronts planted down there in the bottom of the gully they had been our home and safe stronghold in the frozen waste among dense fogs heavy rains and interminable falls of snow and the humble little erections mere atoms among giant groups of seracs or labyrinthine crevasses had nevertheless proved stronger than the elements good friendly and serviceable shelters to the very last the moraine was smoother now and less tiring but after so much marching over soft snowfields 
our feet were unused to treading sharp shifting stones and we were all suffering more or less but two hours of this painful progress brought us to the border of the forest and we found the tent we had left behind there in perfect preservation with all its contents intact we now followed the bank of the osar river by the track we had taken in the ascent only the stream was swollen to thrice its former volume much of the way lay through the forest where we reveled in the greenery joyfully inhaling the perfume of myriads of flowers or the balsamic odors of resinous trees and caressed at every step by the fronds of gigantic ferns waving about us on all sides it was a real feast for the senses a thick carpet of soft elastic moss was pleasant to our feet after the scratches and bruises inflicted by the stony moraine the strawberry beds were loaded with large juicy fruit the foliage and clustered berries of the mountain ash were beginning to turn red and the dwarf poplars were covered with great fluffy tassels full of ripe seeds for the early autumn was at hand going at an easy pace we reached the shore about midday at the very spot where our first camp had stood the eggy was under sail tacking off the coast after signalling her with a few shots she drew near and sent her boats ashore we immediately began to get our things ready to send on board but before we had been an hour on the beach we were driven wild by the mosquitoes which were more numerous more voracious and more tormenting than in june they swarmed about us in dense clouds got into our noses mouths eyes and ears crawled up our sleeves and down our collars before long our faces were like masks all swollen and blood-stained by the innumerable stings and the vain slaps and scratchings by which we sought protection or cure by evening half our belongings had been sent on board the eggy meanwhile the surf slight enough at first had grown rather violent and just as gonella was pushing off a big breaker turned the boat bottom up but luckily no one was hurt his next attempt was perfectly successful then came my turn and sailors and we got off all right at the cost of a good ducking from the spray his royal highness cogni the guides and six porters remained on the shore where they passed a sleepless and most wretched night incessantly tortured by their insect foes early next morning the transport of baggage was resumed and before long everything was shipped his royal highness was the last to leave the shore at eight o'clock a m our companions came on board so disfigured by venomous bites as to be totally unrecognizable we set sail at once crossed the bay in four hours and touched at port mulgrave facing the village of yakutat mr bryant and the rev mr hendrickson were the first to come on board and to congratulate his royal highness on the success of his expedition we spent a wet afternoon in harbor surrounded by canoes full of inquisitive indians on the following morning thirteenth of august the weather was superb and the grand mountain chains were all glittering in the brilliant sunlight as we glided with spread sails from the bay we had first entered fifty-three days before end of chapter nine chapter ten of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf back to europe from yakutat to london our work was done the long return journey amid the comforts of civilized life proved a welcome rest after our experience on the ice the passage from yakutat to sitka lasted four days but although we were wedged tight as herrings on the little yacht the wonderful charm of the scenery made the time seem short favored by splendid weather we lived almost entirely on deck many of us slept there preferring the fresh night breezes to the close air below decks as we steered southwards the peaks of the mount st elias group sank gradually lower on the horizon while the crests of the fairweather chain slipped past us in slow procession at last the far northern horizon was only broken by the cloud-like white peak of mount st elias on the fifteenth of august at one hundred eighty miles distance its summit was still visible above the horizon then this too disappeared in the fading glow of a glorious sunset night fell a silver moon rose and later on the heavens were illuminated by the fantastic beams of the aurora borealis first of all a great white glare suffused the northern sky 
like an aerial reflection of all the splendors of the boundless snowy waste we had left it lay on the horizon in a broad luminous band shaped in the segment of an arc and fading off softly towards the zenith while bounded at its lower limit by a straight line that stood out most distinctly against a background of intensely dark sky long rays of pallid light now single now clustered darted slowly from the upper edge of the zone while the lower rim was continually changing in form presently the luminous bow seemed to dissolve and split into fragments revealing broad areas of brighter light here and there interspersed with patches of darkness these changes were slowly produced by means of a strange flickering of the luminous zone which meanwhile grew paler and paler until the whole dazzling vision disappeared the next day we sighted the cone of the edgecombe volcano that dominates the mouth of the sitka basin and on the morning of the seventeenth august our vessel cast anchor in port three days later we bade farewell to our valiant american porters who were shipped home on the yacht while we embarked on the city of topeka the same steamer on which we had sailed from seattle in june once more we passed through the still channels of the alexander archipelago between the densely wooded shores where white glaciers glittered here and there against a green background of massed pines once more we felt the soft melancholy charm of this northern world once more passed the shores of columbia threaded the tortuous straits between vancouver island and the continent and entered puget sound the waters of the archipelago so still and deserted on our june voyage were now crowded by little steamers loaded with passengers horses and goods all bound for the north a whole population was emigrating rushing towards the gold regions of the yukon and klondike scarcely more than a month had elapsed since the news had reached america of the discovery of wonderfully rich gold deposits in the yukon basin and already in every part of the world alaska was the leading theme in newspapers and magazines that mysterious almost unknown land had suddenly become the center of all interest and was being invaded by frantic hordes hypnotized by the mirage of fabulous wealth and hastening to seek it undismayed at the defeat of others or at the sight of victims who had fallen by the way the rush showed no signs of slackening although the season was too advanced to allow any hope of completing the long journey before the terrible arctic winter set in all the routes particularly the passes at the end of lynn canal were already blocked with emigrants whose progress was checked by the impossibility of transporting their outfits over the frozen passes the more prudent remained at juneau others came back thither in despair after vain attempts to reach the yukon that year the aspect of juneau was totally transformed and the quiet regular life of the little northern town completely changed when we arrived there at eleven p m twenty first august we found the quay thronged with people and piled with goods the streets were brilliantly lighted and swarming with noisy excited men panting with wild hopes and anxieties all the shops were still open while the variety and abundance of their wares showed that juno had become a center of supplies for the mining world landing at seattle on the twenty sixth of august we found the same feverish activity everywhere all business and trade of every class were solely devoted to the alaskan gold mines steamship and mining agencies had cropped up on all sides large stores had been opened stocked with fur coats gauntlets boots weapons tin provisions axes hatches picks and spades together with all the miscellaneous tools and utensils required by adventurers in a wilderness where none of the necessaries of life can be procured on the morning of the twenty seventh we bade farewell to the pacific ocean and started from seattle by rail we chose the canadian route in preference to retracing our steps via san francisco and across the states our present way ran due north from seattle to british columbia through the thick forest covering the greater part of washington state but there the timber is being destroyed even faster and over a wider area than in the woodlands south of seattle we traversed broad tracts set with thousands of charred trunks with as many more lying prostrate slowly decaying and tangled over by the luxuriant undergrowth of bushes and berries that springs to life in the sunlit spaces between the wrecked trees in parts where the forest was fired some time ago the trunks have shed their charred outer bark 
and whole hillsides are covered with ghostly white stems on all sides columns of smoke rise from new clearings and every narrow dale is filled with a thick whitish vapor by night one sees red flames and flashes fading off into faintest rose color against the darkness above in british columbia the process of colonization seemed much further advanced instead of miserable log huts half buried in brush at the roots of charred trees we found neat little cottages of planed and even varnished boards with spacious verandas the land is planted with belts of forest between vast pastures where herds are grazing quietly and colts gallop about beyond the columbia river you come to the foothills of the rockies mounting through wild little valleys which sometimes contract into wilder gorges after crossing the chain by a pass over five thousand feet high the line runs for many hours among picturesque crags some shaped like towers others soaring to sharp dizzy peaks cleft by deep narrow chimneys and among ridges set with spikes and points of every shape and size from which some small glaciers flow down on issuing from the mountains the line traverses the great prairie which has a thin carpet of greenish yellow grass and in spite of its dry sterile aspect possesses a melancholy charm of its own the train takes a whole day to cross the waste the few stations on this part of the line consist of a small wooden house with perhaps a cowboy or two galloping round it or a few redskins seated in a ring and immovable as statues these indians have thin sharp faces and long straight hair twisted at the back of the neck they are wrapped from head to foot in large blankets adorned with stripes and tags of gay colored stuff the turf gradually becomes greener and thicker and more cattle are scattered over it we have reached the edge of the desert we soon behold wide cornfields and finally reach winnipeg the commercial center of this vast district east of winnipeg lies the lake region clothed with low forests of conifers and birches meager trees with scanty foliage on this poor soil where smooth round rocks crop up at small intervals about the surface among the trees and rocks are countless lakelets filling every natural hollow of the undulating land the whole district still shows characteristic traces of the agency of that great continent of ice which spread over canada during the glacial period at fort william the line touches the northern shore of lake superior and runs along it for a considerable distance the expanse of water is so vast that the whole opposite shore is not in sight the banks are low and entirely covered with dwarf scrub and the whole is devoid of variety and incident at north bay on the first of september we left the montreal train and turned south on our way to the united states our party divided at toronto his royal highness with lieutenant cogney went straight to new york while gonella sela and myself crossed lake ontario to snatch a few hours at niagara we left on the following day after a hurried visit to the falls thus acquitting ourselves of a debt owed by all the travelers to the states and reached new york the same evening at eleven a m on september the fourth we sailed from america in the lucania six days afterwards we were in st george's channel and put into liverpool at ten o'clock p m our party broke up in london on the eleventh of september after four months of comradeship rendered intimate by sharing the same hardships conquering the same obstacles and rejoicing together on the attainment of a common goal end of chapter ten end of the ascent of mount st elias alaska by filippo de filippi translated by linda white Mazzini Villari